All right, don't forget, guys, May the 6th, Bloke in a Bar 2024 jerseys are dropping. There is a limited supply. It's actually more limited than last year. Limited supply, May 6th, 6 p.m., the Bloke jerseys are dropping. Uh, that is not this next Monday, but the Monday after, so two weeks away. Plus, we've got other things dropping during that week, which you are going to absolutely love, as in, sorry, on the same night. The same night at 6 p.m., we've got other stuff dropping that you're going to love. It's going to be a huge drop. So if you've been looking for, looking for a bloke drop, bloke drop to get on, this is a drop to get on. Trust me, got some really, really cool stuff that you are absolutely going to love. We will reveal the jersey closer to the date, but it is May 6, 6 p.m. Be there or be square. Just a bloke in a bar. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Bloke in a Bar. And uh, what a weekend of rugby league. The great Root, he's back. How little, you going, brother? Little spell last week, mate. Yeah? Yeah, I'm back with a pep in my step. I'd love to say I miss you, but... <laughs> Feelings mutual, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> what a fucking great Monday. Yeah. Timmy? Uh, record numbers last week, wasn't it, Campy? That's what, what I'm hearing. Record low. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, how yeah, good, Hammy. The great Hammy, how you going, brother? Up and about. Uh, you think of great debuts over the journey. Luke Brooks, uh, 2013. Charlie Staines, four tries. John Atkins, four tries. Bloke in a bar multi, 26 bucks. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. And the great Hammy, he came to me, he said, I want to do something. So everyone listening, we had a bloke in a bar multi, specifically made for the bloke in a bar community. Hammy came to me, he said, I want to do a vibe. I want to, I'm all about vibe this week. Mm. And he said, what about Lomax Fish? And I said, mate, I'm on that vibe too, baby. Let's yep. do it. Yep. So we put it up and it got up. And we did not disappoint. It did not disappoint. Now, is that the second debut multi that I've had that's got up? I think it is. Because remember the cricket one? I do. I remember it well. Uh, and nearly sent sports bit bust. Yeah. Yep. Um, so one ply, for that. one ply toilet paper back at the office for the week there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the bloke in a bar multi got up. It's a debut. We, what we're going to do is each week we're going to have a bloke in a bar multi up. Uh, also, you've obviously got the feed. You can follow us on the feed. Uh, get around us, guys. Get around us. We're nearly at 10K. We're just over 9K. We're nearly at 10K. Make sure to hit, go to more. You press feed. You type in Denon. Give us a follow. And actually... Uh, one of me, so I bet that the Storm would win yep. the winning margin of 6 to 10. That got up. Look, was I robbed on a few other punts? Yes, I was. <laughs> but get around me, guys. Get around me. Obviously, the bloke in a bar got up. You've got to give us a follow. Uh, and let's just have a bit of fun with it. Let's have a bit of fun with it. Uh, like, <laughs> let's get straight into it, shall we? Face the music brought to you by Sportsbet. As I said, don't forget, guys. It takes literally two seconds. It's the best way to show support to the platform is you go to more in the Sportsbet app. You go to the feed, you type in Denon, you give us a follow. It takes two seconds. You can copy my bets. You can see the little caption I write on it. Uh, and, yeah, it's a bit of fun. And also, we're going to have some really cool things lined up later in the year. Hammy, let's Absolutely. do it, baby. I'm be Before we do it, I've got breaking news. Uh, my byline's actually technically on this yarn, so it could be coming from me. <laughs> Daily Telegraph. Ponga, minimum two weeks, meeting with specialist for could be season ending. Oh. Oh. No. We'll be sidelined for at least two months. With fears his season may be over yeah. after suffering a foot injury. Two so, months. so minimum two months or minimum two weeks? Minimum two, two months. months. Yeah, you, said, yeah, you said two weeks. Oh, sorry. Two so months. minimum two months. Yeah. That sucks. That sucks so much. Uh, <laughs> Reese Walsh, please stay hot and stay in form, baby. Shit. Anyway, let's do it. <laughs> What a sound note to uh, kick off Face the Music with, but uh, get well soon, KP. <coughs> Goodness me. Uh, all right, <clears throat> here we go. Let's do it. Round six results. Thursday, Chooks, 12, defeated by Storm, 18 in the Cooper Cronk Cup. Uh, Timmy had the Chooks, the rest of us had the Storm in that one. We didn't bother with the line because it was so small. It was about half a point. Um, so we all get a point. Timmy gets none. So, But if I put on the feed the winning margin, do I get an extra point? Six to ten? That was on the feed, separate. Oh, Face the music, what? feed, two separate things. I think they're both brought to you by Sportsbet, though. Two great uh, brand integrations brought to you by Sportsbet, but <laughs> separate entities uh, for the purpose of this. That's outrageous. Great, great uh, bet, though, from you. $5.60, I believe. $5.50. Well. $5.50. Yeah. Specificity pays, people. So well done. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, all right, Friday night, um, Dragons 30 defeat the Warriors 12. Everyone had the Warriors and the Warriors covering. Um, yeah. And that also cost you another multi, I think, on the feed, didn't it? The yes, it did actually. Done. So I had a multi of um, basically any time try scorers and then teams winning, three of them. It all got up except for that one game. Yep. I would have saved your foals here. 
Oh, please give me a break. <laughs> Literally the worst punter in the human fucking race's history <laughs> over here. Uh, talking please, about knowing how to show punt. of all time, thank you. <laughs> talking about knowing how to punt. Oh my god. Tell us about next how you got thing, close again. Next next thing you can tell us is a ballerina, the big fella. Good Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. Dan Garou. Orange Guru, the list is growing dead end at the moment. Look, they all want to come with the top dog. I understand it. I get it. When you're the big dog, they take shots at you. But I'm just—that's my life. I'm used to it by now. Yep. Not, <laughs> not easy. Not easy. <laughs> I mean, I did only get one out of five right on the weekend. But let's not talk about that. That's not where we won't talk about that too much. Uh, <laughs> all right. So the next game, Eels, 16, defeated by the Dolphins. Undermanned Dolphins. Everyone was out. 44. Three of us like the Eels head to head, uh, and the Dolphins with the five and a half start. Denon, though, you were very bold. You took the fish head to head. Uh, you get the extra point there um, as they were the underdog. So good tipping from you. That's great tipping. Can you translate that to Dolphin for our uh, red clip? I wouldn't uh, be a Dolphin fan, sorry. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't got the clip up. I got burned last week because it kept playing to the next YouTube video, remember? Uh, well, just for our Dolphin <coughs> listeners so yep. they know what you actually said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more, more Dolphin sound effects coming later in the show. I'll, I'll make sure I get it up. Uh, all right, Super Saturday. Um, Shane Elford Cup kicked us off. Uh, Panthers 22 defeat the Tigers 6. Uh, Tigers refereed out of it. We all saw it. We'll, we'll get to that game a little bit later. Uh, Matty had Penrith winning, um, but he had the Tigers with the plus 13 and a half. Timmy and Denon, you both had the, uh, the Panthers covering the minus 13 and a half. Um, and I had the Tigers, so two points for you guys, one point. Very strong it. start needed from it. me. I needed that, tell you what. Oh. Yeah. Then, what about this game? Titans 30, defeated by Manly 34. I put on a tipping clinic when I said Manly <laughs> would win, but the Titans uh, with the with the start, plus nine and a half. The rest of you had Manly winning and covering, which I didn't do. So, what a game. What a nail-biter. Um, well played and two points to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then the Broncos. Um uh, 34 defeat the Raiders 10 in the Tom Leroy Lars Cup up there at Suncorp Stadium. We all took the Broncos head to head and the Raiders with a plus seven and a half start, um, including Timmy, who tipped against his own team again. What a coward. Uh, <laughs> Milk never got close, so one point for each of us there. Then we're on to Sunday. The Dogs 36 defeat the Knights 12 in the Todd Polglaze Cup. Uh, Kempi had the Knights 1 to 12. Timmy had the Knights 13 plus. Goodness me, oh, Timmy. Goodness uh, me. And Matty and myself, we both took the Dogs. Um, again, we didn't bother with lines. We both took them 1 to 12, so we didn't get the point there, but we just get the, the one point for having the dogs. Uh, which takes us to um, the Sharkies 44 defeating the Cowboys 10 in the Val Holmes Cup. Um, everyone had the Sharks and the Sharks covering, except me. I had the Sharks and I had the Cowboys with the plus three and a half. So I only get one point. Everyone else got two points. How did we finish this week? Very close. You could have thrown a blanket over the face of music contestants this week. Kempi, top of the ladder with nine points. Well done, mate. I've been on a run, haven't I? Big weekend. I've been you. on a run. I, what is this, three in a row that I've been at top, the tippity top? It is. It is. Well there done. There you go. Thanks for coming. Three, Pete. Some of us get rugby league, some of us don't. <laughs> three, Pete, for you. Matty, not bad with eight points. Uh, and then we've got another nail biter at the bottom here. Timmy and myself, both with seven. <laughs> so, look, we could rock off. Or should I just should I finally just face the music? I think you need to face the music. And, yeah. I think you need to face the music. All right, so it's today, well I'll, high time. I'll be dancing to uh, Weird Al Yankovic's <laughs> "White and Nerdy." We've all been waiting for it for quite a while. Um, I've got it queued up here. Do you want me here or do you want me over? Uh, this one, this one. Okay. We uh, we went out on Saturday night. Hammy went home early, I think, to prepare for his dance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the, the the punters have been anticipating this for a very long time. So you've got to deliver here. <laughs> Do you want me to press play? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is it volume up, everything? Yeah, it's all up. All right, it's am all I, up. Am I in shot? Yes, mate. Here right, we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Oh, it was worth the wait. Oh, very good, It was Adam. worth the wait. It was worth oh, no. the wait. There he is, Hammy. <laughs> So you oh. face the music. Oh, see, that's a good ref. That's a ref that understands mm. the game that he's refing. He understands the game he's refing. He knows when to. He just gets it. He's in the vibe. He's in the flow. Oh, took a couple of uh, Musashi victims on the way there. <laughs> uh, I'll fix them up before the Musashi segment. Well, there you have it, eh? So uh, Hammy does his. It's a. It's a uh, historic face the music. Where were you when? <laughs> Round seven, twenty twenty four. <laughs> Last week, there's two big moments when Fisher Harris signed with the Warriors and when Hammy faced the music. That's, yep. the, mo that's the big moments. Big week in rugby league. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was Face the Music brought to you by Sportsbet. Stay tuned, though. We've got to get to our tipping later on in the show. Um, 
Now it is time, or, or as always, a massive thank you to our sports best partners. And as I said, it takes you two seconds. <coughs> Give us a follow on the feed. Um, we've got to beat this Dan Orange bloke. Like, seriously, <laughs> it's actually, actually ridiculous. They get, look, the AFL community is getting around him, which is understandably. They're getting around him. So NRL, we need to, we need to dominate this guy. Let's get into it. Team of the week. Brought to you by Bloke Beer, the best beer in all the land. Make sure to get to your local. Got a couple of messages on the weekend. A few blokes trying the midi, saying it was the be- most beautiful lager they'd ever tasted. So thanks for the messages. Appreciate it, guys. Get to your local. Grab a case. It's the beer of rugby league. We had a couple of blokes in the uh, CBA Centre of Excellence, which I invited you to on the weekend. Door yeah. was wide open. No show, as per. <laughs> Look, I was too busy watching rugby league to win the tipping comp. That some of us actually fucking watch the game. Others watch it with their mates. It's that simple. Would have been nice to have you. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know what? The invite was very, A, unenthusiastic. <laughs> B, didn't seem like you wanted me there. <laughs> C, covering your own ass so that I didn't get angry at you that you didn't invite me. That's what it felt like. No phone call. Very blasé. Oh, by the way. So, for example, by the way, all the boys are getting together. So it wasn't, I'm not part of the boys. It's by the way the boys are getting together. If you want to join us, you can. That You may as well have sent me a message saying, never come to the CBA ever in your life, you piece of shit. You may as well sent that. I wanted to, I chose not to. <laughs> Did you just get a text? Just a text. Guru was out the front of my window like, love actually. He had a, the, the pieces of paper and he, he did a big performance, about two and a half minutes. There um, you go. Yeah. Point made. Point made. The vibe was right. I understood. I understand what I'm not wanted. I understand what I'm not wanted. So it's all right. It's okay. I, I got a smoke signal from Guru all the way to Cronulla. <laughs> m- m- must have missed you, Campy Bazaar. Timmy, we're on in You're, the sky. Mate, when the Morse code goes up in the air with the smoke signals and that, when it says Timmy, I'm going to look away because it's for someone else. I don't know it's Timmy you. Unbelievable stuff. Unbelievable stuff. Anyway, let's get to the team of the week. Um, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't watch rugby league together and you'd be better at tipping. How about that? You think oh, come that? on. That's a low blow. <laughs> <laughs> they, like, they even got together to try to overthrow me as the tip master and they couldn't do it. That's what I'm talking about. They come at you. They come at you fast and hard, but also under, you know, under undercover, we had Dan Gorridge over too. Great <laughs> what a bloke as well! I gotta yeah, say, good, but funny. Dan Orange. He, yeah. was great. he actually had nine from nine in AFL tips on the weekend as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow! I'll tell you what, it'd be the ones closest to you. Be the ones closest to you. Team of the week brought to you by Bloke Beer. Let's get to it. I had uh, Fuller slash Walsh. We discussed it. We went Reese Walsh at fullback. At number two, we had Kiraz at three. Lomax at four, Cobo. But a special mention to Alamotti. I thought he was outstanding for Penrith Very Panthers. Um, at five, Bostock. Now, this, the halves for us was honestly an absolute nightmare. <laughs> like, seriously. It nearly took us fi- like 40 minutes to get the halves in. So, initially, a lot of us had Hunt or Katoa or even Hughes at seven, but we landed on Hunt. Then we moved Katoa to six, but... At the same time, Hines came out last night and killed it. Also, we know Hines can play six. On top of all of that, what are New South Wales oh. looking for right now? They are looking for a six. The plot thickens. It, it thickens. <laughs> it thickens. So we decided to put Hines at six because he played so well. And also, we've seen him play that kind of role before. Seven, Benny Hunt. Eight, Jensen from the Broncos. Incredible game. Nine, Marnie. 10, Adam Fenor Blake. 11, Bloor. 12, Olakowatu. At 13, Plath. Uh, at 14, Hughes. 15, Fisher Harris. 16, Paseca. And 17, Katoa. Uh, boys, anyone seeing out for you using that team of the week? Yeah, you mentioned Nico Hines there, mate, and we'll talk about him soon. But, uh, you know, obviously in attack he was great, but 31 tackles, he only missed two. Yeah. His, his defense has improved out of sight, Nico. It feels like in the offseason, if there's one thing, he, two things he worked on kicking game and defense. Yeah. I feel like the attack we've seen before, we know he can attack. The questions about rounding out his game go back to round one against the, the Warriors out there. He was outstanding in defense. Uh, anyone seen that for you, Timmy? It was Isaiah Katoa, mate, and you mentioned there how much we struggled to nail our halves. And initially, I had Benny Hunt at seven. I uh, got a bit sneaky and shifted Isaiah Katoa to six. I just thought he was superb. And. The weekend of rugby league reminded me of how lucky we are to have this game because, you know, it was a, a tight contest, 50-50, flip a coin on Friday, uh, sorry, Thursday night. You went into the Friday games. 
two enormous upsets, or certainly the Dragons one, and then the Dolphins, not an enormous upset, but an upset, certainly going into the game as underdogs, and, you know, say what you will about the salary cap, but to be seven rounds into the season and just having lopsided results to those sides as the underdogs, uh, I follow my EPL, a bit of soccer there, and you look at it, Man City's probably going to win another title, chasing them, Arsenal, Liverpool, same shit every year. I love it. I know you're comparing apples and oranges, but... To go into just about every game of the weekend in the NRL and going, either side could win this. Mm. We're very lucky to have it. Yeah. Well, you look at the Bulldogs as well. Yeah. You know, who would have thought they'd absolutely tear the Knights up? And, and this sort of stuff, it normally happens the first couple of rounds where teams are fit and firing. There's no major injuries. Uh, you know, defences are quite tough. They're all ready to go. But to be seven rounds into the comp and still getting these big upsets... It's just the best. Yeah, I totally agree. Anyone seen that for you, mate? Uh, for, in a losing side for me, Adam Finnell with Blake, I thought was very good. 255 metres, 108 post contact, 23 tackles, none missed. Uh, would have loved to try from him for uh, my one of my bets on give me something, but uh, he was great. I thought he was really good. And a special uh, <laughs> shout out to Jeremy Marshall King as well. Couldn't crack our start in the team this week, but he was discussed at length before the show as well. Yeah, it was between him and Marnie uh, who got that nine uh, jersey. Marnie just pipping him. Uh, but Marshall King was outstanding. Yeah, I've got to second that with Katoa. So he's currently sitting on equal points with Hines on the Dally M, and he's barely being spoken about. Now, to be fair, since round two, we've been speaking about him and how good he looks. But what I loved about his game on the weekend is even after the game was won and, you know, very easy for a young half to go, look what I just did. You know, I'm in Darwin. I've put the eels to the sword. Yes, they're missing... Um, you know, they're obviously missing Moses. But outside of that, like, that's a, a good, solid side. To the literally dying minute, he was looking for points. And I love that ruthless nature of, like, no, no, I'm not, not just happy with, a you know, a 20-point win or whatever. I want to score as many points. As long as I'm on this field, we're going to try and score points. And I love that from Katoa. Just to add some context to that as well, he's leading Dali M, so Isaiah Katoa, and he's, um, he didn't play round one, and he's had a bye. Mm. So I don't think he's leading... Um, he is currently Lomax is currently <laughs> leading, Lomax. but he's he's like I'll get it up real quick. So you got Lomax, uh, Tommy Tur Turbo, uh, Ponga, <laughs> and then Katoa. Katoa, yeah, and he's only played he's only played five games of football, hasn't he? A buy, and he wasn't selected in round one. Yeah, yeah. and Incredible. we're talking about wow. a, a team that yeah, you know isn't a world beating team. Could you imagine with Jerome Luai leaving? Could you imagine if it was we were preparing for him and Cleary to be the halves at Penrith? Yeah, that's a great point because we have to remember he was in the Penrith system. He was the guy at the Penrith oh. Juniors. Yeah. So Lomax is on 19 and he's on 16. So so basically yeah. a game away. So if yeah. he had a play, he'd probably be on top because he, yeah. he can get six points. Yeah. So he would have at least got three, you'd, you'd have to assume. Um, and just for the listeners, so that this is the Dallium leaderboard. Lomax 19. I could have, mate, I picked this from a mile away. I said all off season. Round seven, Lomax will be leading the Dally M's. You heard me say that. Was it on air? I think it might have been off air, actually. Did you hear you me say that? a lot of shit, mate. <laughs> but yeah, Lomax hasn't had a buy yet and has played every single game. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm joking, guys. I didn't say Lomax. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know with the internet. Some people take it seriously. Uh, kick out at 18 points. Tom Trevojevic at 18. Kalen Ponga at 17. But, I mean, you could pretty much rule him out now, unfortunately. Uh, Dylan Edwards at 17, Isaiah Katoa 16, Hines 16, Cherry Evans at 15. So he's actually got more points than Cherry Evans, which is mm -hmm. crazy. Uh, uh, Paddy Carrigan, um, sorry, Patrick Carriganitis uh, at 14, and Ben Hunt at 13. I don't know if you can rule KP out just yet. Is he out for Minimum eight two, two months. Oh, yeah. It was 16 so games so last you'd be year. What? You'd mm. be. Yeah, yeah, fair. It's a fair point. It's a fair point. Um, It'd be incredible if he managed to do it again, but yeah, wow, facing at least two months. Anyway, uh, so that that is team of the week, guys. Uh, brought to you by Bloke Beer. Make sure to grab a case of, of Bloke Beer. It is the beer of rugby league, uh, and you know we're we're up. We're as tiny, tiny beer up against these huge billion dollar corporations. So maybe support the little guy, baby. Support the little guy. Uh, shout out, shout out quickly though to Max Psychoplath. Uh, unbelievable <laughs> uh, player. So he was outstanding. You do the plath. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, now it's time to announce our hungriest player. This bloke was absolutely phenomenal. And I think it's kind of getting lost in the noise of the weekend with all the upsets and everything that happened. The Dragons put premiership threats 
the Warriors to the absolute sword led by Benny Hunt. And as I said, with all these performances happening and all this crazy stuff happening over the weekend, I feel like it's not even getting talked about. Like Benny Hunt was electric on the weekend and he did it against... The Warriors didn't play like badly. I, I didn't think they played poorly at all. I, I felt that obviously they didn't take their opportunities. But the Dragons look like world beaters on the weekend and it's all on the back of Benny Hunt. So Benny Hunt is our hungriest player. Use code HUNT, that's H-U-N-T, for free delivery this week. That's right. Use code HUNT for free delivery on Menulog. Download the app, use it. Basically, if you download the app and you listen to Bloke in a Bar, each week you're going to get discounts. So you may as well use Menulog uh, because you're getting discounts each week. Thoughts on Benny Hunt's performances, guys? Yeah, very impressive, especially when you consider like Sean Johnson scored that try. He, he waltzed over pretty much untouched early and I thought, my God, this could get ugly for the Dragons. And then Ben Hunt, just with a 10 out of 10 performance, he's... <laughs> It's it's crazy when, when you look at the St. George of the Wild Dragons and the storyline of, you know, that Ben Hunt didn't want to be there. Now he's absolutely flying. <coughs> Lomax now doesn't want to be there and isn't going to be there next year, and he's the form player of the competition. Once again, the coach, he just loves to – he just lives in chaos. He loves it. Yeah. He loves it. Flano – and again, love him or hate Flano, at least he's having a dig. Yeah. Like, however it's happening, it sometimes looks a bit unorthodox or whatever, but he's making moves. Like, things are actually happening at the club. Um, it's funny, actually, I spoke to Ben Hunt on the captain's run, and I kind of said that to him. I said, um, I said, no disrespect, but the last few years, it's kind of looked like there's not really much energy, anything really happening. And he said, no, we actually made it a point in the games where any little win we have, celebrate it, mm -hmm. get after it. And, and so you can see on the field. Timmy, thoughts? I'd mesmerise me. My, my, one of my favourite games of the weekend, just because, you know, it's been a tough... 18 months, you know, since the start of last season to talk about, to get excited around the Dragons when we do our analysis each week. And, you know, even pre-season going through there, just going, oh, you know, the Dragons, not the most exciting roster. There are a few movements and there was a few little things coming in and out. Like Lewis signing, who didn't even play on the weekend. And, and like, I'll be honest, I thought the Warriors were going to come out and win this one pretty convincingly. Uh, it was such a joy to see the Dragons come out and dish out this sort of performance because, as Guru touched on, 15 minutes into that game, they were they were running right, the Warriors through the middle, and I thought, oh, this could get nasty. Couldn't have been further from it. The performance they put on, led by the man, Benny Hunt, mm. who, like, his value to this Dragons team, and, and we often talk about the most important players, two teams in the competition, it's pretty damn hard to go past Ben Hunt out of the whole of the NRL. And mm. there were some great uh, performances in this from the Dragons, but it was all Benny Hunt. Like, he's yeah. playing incredible footy. He, like, so he had a try, three try assists, and 624 kick metres. Mm. So, like, he's given you what you get out of a really good structured seven with that great kicking game. Plus, he's given you basically a ball running 5-8. And I have to say as well, I think Kyle Flanagan has played his role perfectly. Yep. Second fiddle... What, whatever you need me to do, I'm going to make me tackles. And Benny Hunt, you let me know where you want me to go. I think he's, that's what he, Benny Hunt probably needs, is a guy that is just willing to... Because, like, uh, funnily enough, you know, past halves combos with Ben Hunt, have you know, they've had more natural ability than Kyle Flanagan. And that's no knock on Kyle Flanagan. Like, he's played more NRL games than me. He's far more successful. But he he's a, a structured seven that's going to mm. get you around the park. And... He's not even playing seven, but what he is playing is his role perfectly. I'll tell you what, going into this week, it's obviously the Anzac Day clash. The Dragons are at two dollars sixty against the Roosters. That's juicy. Juicy. That's juicy as it gets. I might actually give us a follow on the feed. Might I might get real juicy there? Get real cheeky. They're all cheeky bets there. No, all cheeky, all cheeky. How good is it that eight weeks? Into I don't know the what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> How good is it that eight weeks into the competition, we're going in that Anzac Day game going. Dragons are mad overs here, like they can win this one against the Roosters, who started yeah. the season we had tipped, you know, Premiership heavyweights. Brilliant. Absolutely. How many thoughts on the great ben, ben Benjamin Hunt? Great, great performance. Uh, a lot of the chat going into this game and uh, the last couple of weeks is that the Warriors potentially are the, the second best team in the comp after the Panthers, and we'll go, you know, <coughs> go close to, to winning the whole thing. But um, what a result! Thirty to twelve, absolutely hammered him. So he'll be fired up. The Mad Dragon. Oh yeah. He'll be very excited with that result. Very excited going into Anzac Day. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Benny Hunt outstanding and, uh, and deserves to be our hungriest player. There you go. Use code Hunt for free delivery. Uh, now let's get into it. Round seven review. Start the clock, Matty. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
I haven't seen a finger gun in a while. Well, I'm just trying to pick the energy up, boys. Come on. <laughs> Come with me. Come with me. No, I'm joking. Is the energy not been there? No, it's been there. I just said that. I don't know what I'm saying today, all right? <laughs> I'm just saying shit. I was, uh, I was at a wedding once, Kempi, and <laughs> the bride and groom came out, and the best man who I knew wouldn't have been a huge fan of walking in and dancing and everything. When they walked in, the, um, the bridal table was about five metres away. Mm. I could tell on his face that he thought it was only going to be a five metre walk, so he opened with finger guns. Oh, shit. Little did he know that <laughs> instead of going the five metres, they went about 60 metres around the long way. Oh, no. I've never respected a guy more. He held finger guns for about <laughs> two and a half minutes. It was the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it went from the worst thing ever to the best thing ever. Yeah. Unreal. <laughs> Nothing but respect. Um, yeah. Okay, let's get into it, shall we? <laughs> Storm defeat the Roosters. 18-12. Um, refing obviously wasn't great, but it wasn't great for both sides, in my opinion. Uh, I was actually quite surprised. Spoke about this on Packer Up, boys, but I was actually quite surprised at the amount of people, especially Roosters fans, saying they were robbed. Um, to me, I think both teams had some really poor calls against them. Uh, I also think that... You know, if you if you look at the two tries, I think Roosters fans are most upset about. Like, okay, technically, if you went to the rule book and said, you know, did he lay hands on him, whatever. But then it's like, okay, is that what we really want, though? You know, I'm sure weeks before, you know, you know, the last few rounds, when you know calls haven't been black and white, you've been like, that's good. We need to let the game flow. And then all of a sudden, when that call kind of goes against you, you're like, no, no, it should be black and white. It's like, come on. The rules are never black and white. You know, that's that that would be the worst game of rugby league ever if we were going black and white. Every, oh, yeah. It has to have context. Um, so, yeah, I was a bit surprised. So I'm happy to be wrong, though. Like, maybe I'm looking at it incorrectly. But I did think both teams got some tough calls. I'm not – the Roosters got tough calls. The Storm got tough calls. And I think the Storm were definitely the better side. And I think the Roosters, you know, definitely failed to put that game away when Munster was sent 10 in the bin. Uh, let's talk about the Roosters first because I think there's probably more to talk about with the Roosters and the Storm because, once again, the Storm just do what the Storm do. But don't get me, don't worry, Storm fans. We will talk about the Storm. <laughs> Roosters. Um, again, I spoke about this on Packer Up, boys, but this spine issue, it will not go away. It will not go away. Uh, they looked totally different to last week. They looked, especially in the second... I thought in the first half, they looked similar to last week. In the second half, they just started going side to side. And and this and the worst thing is is their side to side ball playing, it's it's not even high quality compared to other teams. Like when you compare their set plays on the edge to say a Warriors, like the Warriors are substantially better at those set plays. Um, and I just think that Teddy had a really good first half. I think in his second half he was he just you know he's such a competitor and we love that about him. But I think sometimes he tries too hard, which is like the double edged sword. You know, you don't want to sit here and say, don't try so hard because that's what makes him literally one of the greatest fullbacks of all time. But at the same time, sometimes you have to ask yourself, is this what the team needs right now? Uh, I think that they need to make it extremely clear, the hierarchy of the spine. Now, I'm not on the field, so I don't know the answer to this, but it seems like sometimes that they don't know whose team it is. Is it Tedesco's team, the captain at the back? Is it Kiri's team? Is it Cheese's? Obviously, it's mostly not Cheese's, but... You know, cheese is such a uh, key ingredient to that spine. When he wants to run, he's even unsure of himself when he needs to run. So I just think they need to sit down and say it is 100% Kiri side or it's 100% Sam Walker side when he comes back and go from there. Because at the moment, this has been going on for, what do you reckon, two, three years now? Yeah, well, yeah, like, like I agree with what you're saying, but it's almost a boring conversation because we were saying this two and a half years ago. We were saying it two and a half years like ago. Just nothing's been sorted there and yeah I, I agree with everything you said before too mate I think that if one team had a reason to complain about the refs it was the Melbourne Storm mm. I mean by the letter of the law you know obviously Nelson and Sofa Solomona had a hand on it but I looked at that and went hold on there was six roosters on Katawa how the fuck did he get the ball down there was a lot of roosters three, three roosters and two, I think two of them were forwards like and also that's not what got him over the try line 100% like. there was bodies everywhere that tackle should have been made yeah, um, yeah it's a bit hard to work out what's going on at the roosters at the moment mate do you think yeah I would, as Guru said, we have a similar conversation every week, just going, like, what, what is the go-to attacking structure for the Roosters? Do they like to power through the middle? Do they use the ball early and back their firepower on the edges? It just, I don't know. We still don't know what it is. And you look at their attack from the weekend, and, you know, they've had some decent enough performances this week. We actually mentioned that, like, Kiri or Sam Walker playing by themselves uh, had looked better. And you mentioned this weekend... Home game against the Melbourne Storm, a massive game for them. They had one line break in it. Their two tries came off kicks. Mm. 
pretty bloody ordinary. And it's like, you know, it's a six point score line, but it's to see that in such a, a massive game they had to get up for. They weren't full strength. They were missing a couple in like Dom Young on the wing, Sam Walker, but like Connor Watson who, I mean, who'd been decent at five eight. You know, they have injuries, but it's still a damn good football side. Mm. They've got to be doing better than that. And like, when they started to get back into the game, I feel like the whole game plan was just get the ball to Manu. Mm. Like yeah. there was just well, in the second half when he decided yeah. yeah. Oh, look, what I find so surprising uh, with the situation is it seems like their game plan is obvious. It is through the middle. Like it's power game through like when Cheese was getting out and Teddy was also getting out and tipping onto Radley, they looked unstoppable. Well, they, it was last week against the Knights. It's yeah. exactly what you said seven days ago about how good they looked. Mm. And it just looked like they went to a different attacking structure with, I suppose, Teddy back in the team. Not saying it's Teddy's fault, but things just change. Like a half leaves or a fullback leaves and just the whole attacking structure has a different dynamic. Yeah, I, I do think that... Now, maybe maybe Kiri was playing, you know, calling those players each edge. So mm. then that is absolutely Kiri's fault. But I feel like it does seem like with Teddy being the captain and also the biggest, like when Cooper Cronk came into that side, it was extremely clear that Cooper Cronk is the big dog. And I think with Teddy at the back also being captain, when he calls something, you've got to give it. He, he, when it comes to hierarchy, everything, usually you've got to give it to him. And I think Teddy probably needs to go, if, if this is the case, again, guys, if it is Kiri doing this, then it's obviously Kiri's fault. But if mm. Teddy is over-calling things or directing the team around the park, it's like, in defence, that's his job. He should direct the team around the park in defence, get them in spots. He didn't attack. Like, that's not his job. Like, he shouldn't be no saying, way. we need this, we need that. It should be Kiri saying, mate, this is where we're getting to. I don't know. What, what do you reckon, Hammy? Yeah, uh, I mean, the Storm, I, uh, credit to them, though. Like, they, they hung on there when they, they lost um, <coughs> Munster to the bin. Uh, as well, so I mean they they done pretty good to to hang on there, but yeah, I don't know. They do look a little bit uh, disorganised. The Chooks can't quite um, get it together. I don't really know. I don't know how you. What is what is the solution here? Do you when when Walker's back, does is does he just become the big dog or? Well, I don't think. I think that I I personally think that if it is Teddy that's making all these calls about I want this play over here, I want that play over there, that probably needs to stop. If that is the case, again, I got I don't know. I could be. Could be Kiri calling that. If Kiri's calling that, then it's Kiri's fault. And you know, you need to sit down and go, well, maybe Kiri isn't the one to lead the team. Maybe it's Sam Walker's the one to lead the team. I guess the I guess the question is, is last week Kiri looked like a player that did want to play through the middle, that did want to play high tempo footy on the advantage line. Does Kron still do anything with the Roosters? Yeah, he's their attack coach. That stunned me, hey? yeah. Like that you know, we can't work out what the DNA in their attack is, what their shapes are. I was like, with Cooper Cronk there, Cronk. Mm. you think he'd be all over it, wouldn't you? Yeah, but it's one thing that I've always thought with Cooper Cronk, like, for the way that he, like, no one's ever been able to emulate the way that Cronk plays. Mm. No one's been able to get to that level of just, like, he just, he was just methodical in everything that he did. And I've said it for a while, like, I look at comparing him to Sam Walker, they're complete polar opposites. Like, when I, when I look back at how Cronk used to play his yeah. footy, it actually doesn't shock me that these guys, that he's not all that much help to them. See, I don't think it's the, the, <clears throat> direction of like the game plan i genuinely think it's purely they don't know who is the one leading the team around the park um and that that's either kiri needs to step up and be dominant and make the right calls or it's teddy needs to just take a little bit of a step back and allow kiri to do that or sam walker to do that i think that makes it so difficult is that kiri looks great without walker walker looks great without kiri and they both look better with sandon smith mm. How do you, what do you do? Well, Sandon's back either this week or next. <laughs> Far out, Robert's got some decisions to make. I will say, like, the, put it this way. In short, I think the biggest issue at the Roosters is, is there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Like, in regards 100%. to, it's just got such a good side that they are trying so hard. Whereas I feel like when you looked at the game last week, it was a very clear game plan. Joey's not the best ball player. Outside backs. We want you just fucking absolutely – our first three head-ups are all you. Joey through the middle, um, Radley through the middle, Cheese through the middle. And, like, they looked really good. And then this week, they did that for the first half. So they absolutely can do it with Teddy, and there's, they're definitely better when they do do it with Teddy. It's just weird in the second half. They just started well, going like this, you, side to side. You look at, um, you know, chatting about the most dominant halves in the competition. We go, all right, if DC is the form half of the competition, he has a 5'8 who plays second fiddle to him and knows he's rolling Luke Brooks. Nico Hines, another one. Sharkies, Trindle, uh, a bit more of a role in attack, but plays second fiddle. 
Uh, Storm with Jerome Hughes and Munster, they're a little bit of a different one and a very unique combination because they do have stars and they make it work, to be yeah. fair, the Storm. Um, but in the Storms, like, that's true, they do make it work. But they have a clear blueprint <laughs> mm. of Smithy, Munster, Cronk, Slater. Yeah. So they've just gone, this is what you do, yeah. you know, to the... Yeah. Um, and then the last one there, the Warriors, Sean Johnson, and whether it's Tamari Martin, whether it's Luke Metcalf, Sean Johnson runs the show, pulls the strings, then he has a great support player and a second fill in a 5'8". Whereas the Roosters, we don't know who that is. We don't know who the, the out-and-out organiser is, the main man, and there's got to be something to well, that, doesn't there? For example, like, you know, Teddy kicking on the second tackle, I think, and then also, like, there's a they got a scrum... Just before half time, it's coming out of their own end. So granted, maybe they didn't want to spin it, and he just he took a one off hit off off the scrum. And I just, when I look at those situations, I'm like Teddy, let the outside backs. If you if it's just going to be one off the scrum, give them the ball to just get them in the game, and and you you do the. Uh, I want Teddy doing just purely cream in the crop stuff. I don't like yes every now and then get in there and do the hard yards because he loves that stuff. But he's literally top three fullbacks of all time in my opinion. And he's at the stage of his career where I'm like, mate, let the outside backs, let yeah. Joey come in and do that. I just want you on beautiful that, set plays through the middle. That Penrith formula of you look at Tupu, Manu, Suali'i in your back line, who all should and generally do run for 150 towards 200 metres a game. Mm. Just go and whack, 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 let them go. Do the hard yeah. yards. And like I know Dylan Edwards, obviously, he does a lot of, um, a lot of the you know, meterage and tackle, all that kind of stuff. But... The difference is Cleary is 100%. Like, there is not even a single question that Cleary is the main man there. You know what I thought in this game on the weekend? If you ever look at Daniel Tupu, right? Kick return meters, he had 11. Sue Lee had six. Teddy had 78. I'm pretty sure the Melbourne Storm just kicked it to him every time, knowing we know he'll return. Wow. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And then they went, you know, and then we can just umbrella and beat the shit out of Tupu and Sue Lee. And they ran for, you know, Tupu ran for 142 meters. They kept Sue Lee to 90. Yeah. Jeez. And so I, just I think they kicked to Teddy on purpose, going, we know you'll return that ball and we're okay with that. Tie yeah. out the fullback, why yep. not? Get yeah. the ball away from these other two that have been causing havoc the last few weeks. Yeah. From you, Roo. And Thank like you. Last week, um, surprise, so you, you, what, you did watch a bit of footy on the weekend? Watch the occasional <laughs> bit of footy. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's a great point. It's a great point. You know, I, yeah, Teddy, Teddy a few years ago, I probably wouldn't kick to him because you're yep. like, stuff that. Teddy now, a little bit older... I'd rather him running at me than Suwali'i right now. What do you got there, Matty? I was just going to point out, um, it's pretty interesting that in the last five years, including this year, the Roosters' most impressive season was probably 2021 purely because they were so decimated and they made the second week of finals. And that kind of supports your evidence that Kiri was out that year, Sam Walker gets Rookie of the Year, and that's their best season. Since then, every time they're together, you know, they don't, they don't perform together. It's, yeah, it's interesting that that is the best season they've had. And, you know, as you just said, too many cooks in the kitchen. I completely agree. Thank God Victor Radley has worked out. Just go forward. Well, yeah. Could you imagine if he was still trying when, to ballpark? What, what was his, um, his dip in form? His dip in form was they, he was trying to also be a cook in the kitchen. Yep. And he was unsure of what's going on and it looked all unstructured. Now he's gone, you know what? I don't need to do that. I just need to run hard and then bit a bit of ball playing here or there. Because Victor Radley, let's talk about some positive now. Actually, just before we get into some positives. I personally believe Trent uh, Robinson's in, under a bit of pressure. Yeah. I think if you're a Roosters fan, I think the question has to be asked. He has, what he has achieved is incredible at the Roosters. Three premierships, a thousand minor premierships, all that. Um, but the, the questions have to begin to be asked. With the current roster he's had, or the roster he's had for the last five years, and although they have made finals and you know limped in and all that kind of stuff, I do believe now, does that mean he's gone this year i'm not sure i don't know but i do think questions need to begin to be asked about trent robinson yeah he looks like a guy under pressure to me and i was going to mention it to you guys pre-show but i thought i'd save it roosters obviously in the premierships business always wouldn't be surprised if plotus goes out and makes a big splash any coaches on the market you, you think he could target you well, i'm not free okay but could you imagine if the roosters go after wayne next year oh actually no i don't think they ever will I know there's history there. The history of the That was 20 years ago now. Yeah. I, I I reckon it could be one of the more interesting storylines in rugby league. I'd lo as a content creator? I'd fuck uh, it. <laughs> It'll be all time. The best ever. Uh, but, okay, in regards to how under pressure is Robertson, do you think? Jason Amici could come straight in. <laughs> <laughs> That's low. That's low stuff. That's really low stuff from you, Timmy. 
Lowbrow. Timmy Turkey Slap. There he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mate, I think he's under serious pressure. You know, we've said the last few weeks and on the weekend was no different. The the way that he's talking in press conferences, I just it's making less and less sense to me. Mm. It really is. Like you had the Dom Young situation the other day, which was mind boggling, and then yeah, to walk away from that game the other day and sort of pinpoint the refs, that, that really knocked me for six. I was genuinely surprised because yeah. Robbo's, you know, usually really good. Years. Like yep. honestly, the last few years, he's probably been the best at going, you know, we had other ways to win that. And don't get me wrong, in the press conference, he did say he didn't pin it all on the refs. He did go through the fact that they, you know, missed opportunities and they should have played better. So let's not pretend that it was just about that. But he did make a point of pointing out those two two calls. Yeah, and hopefully, you know, like if you ever look through their missed tackles, the only player that didn't miss multiple tackles was Daniel Tupu. Mm. And he probably, what, made you know, five or something, six? Well, the vast majority of guys made two or three tackles, missed two or three tackles. It's, you know, along with the, you know, you, you mentioned the kick on second tackle. Like, with 25 minutes to go against the Melbourne Storm when you're playing at home and Cam Munster gets sent to the Simbi, and if you don't win that from there, that's on you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what do you reckon? He looks rattled for the first time, or sounds rattled, I should say, f- for the first time, I think, ever, with Trent Robbo. Cool, calm, collected, always composed. He just... Yeah, he looks a bit rattled. And under pressure, absolutely. They haven't, what, hasn't been a premiership since since 2019. Each and every year, sure, there's been a few injuries here and there, but they've had unbelievable squads. Even if there's been a few injuries this year, the New South Cup squad's just as good as bloody half the squads in the NRL. Mm. So there's no excuses. And I think for, for the teams that he's had underneath him for five years, history of results and premierships, they can only get you so far where you, before you go, we need better than this. And, like... Since 2019, have they even made a prelim? They made one. Actually, no, they haven't no, made any. They haven't no, made, a, yeah, they've yeah, made they haven't a prelim. Made, it's yeah, like yeah. there's been week one, week two finals exits, mm. even last year. And I know Robbo does this and gets his sides to peak really well back into the season, but they had to win a lot in a row and have done a few times to even make the A. Mm. So, yeah, I, I think if the Roosters, let's say they finish week one, even to probably to a less degree, week two of finals, and they don't have a ton of injuries and, and excuses, I think he should be under heaps of pressure to retain that job. You have a look over the next few weeks. Roosters have got Anzac Day this week against the Dragons. Won't be easy. They then go Broncos, Warriors, Sharks. It's a big few weeks coming and up. And then? The Raiders. Oh, the Mighty Milk. <laughs> Stop very They should, they should have recovered from their Broncos lost by then, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> that, like, that, that's a tough month coming up. That's oh, a brutal month. And they're currently sitting 11th, I think. Yeah, 11th. Yeah. And yeah. only one of those games is at home. Jeez. Um, yeah, so I, I do think that questions need to begin to be asked. Do I think that he should be on the chopping block like right now? No, absolutely not. I think that, put it this way, if they miss the eight, there's a real genuine question of should should he be the coach of the Roosters? Mm. Um but uh, Guru, that's classic Roosters fans not calling this weekend a home game. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even look at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I mean that's the thing. I, like results matter; Re- they really do. He's got an incredible resume. What he's achieved has been amazing. But he's got to find a way to turn around. I think it all lies in um, getting that spine, understanding who is the guy running, and and if it put it this way, if it has been Kiru that. If Trent Robinson has been walking in every single day and saying, Kiri, you're the main mm. man, and Teddy has been allowing Kiri to run the team, then you have to ask yourself, you know, is Kiri the man for the job? Um, you know, is Sam Walker? Is, you know, so some, I think some tough decisions have to be made over the next few weeks for the Roosters. Um, some good positives, though. I thought Collins was phenomenal. Mm. Lindsay Collins was outstanding. Uh, the play that he did at the 15-minute mark where he's chasing a line break and he knocks the ball down and they get the ball back. But not only that, he then is, he leads the kick chase after that play. And then 15 minutes later, Nas comes on the field, his first run, Lindsay Collins shoots out of line and jams him. So in a space of like 20 minutes, every, you know, 1% play that you could make, he's made it. Everything, if you could sit there and go, this is what I want my front runner to do in a perfect world. He did every single one. He ticked every single box in a 20 minute period. How good was that? As soon as Nas came on, Lindsay was shot out of a cannon. Yeah. Like that's old school. That's dominating the other big player. Like that's what Lindsay Collins all is about. That's why he's one of the first pick for Queensland every single year. It was year. Origin Lindsay, wasn't it? Where like not necessarily like padding the stat sheet, but just those big effort plays. Mm. Even the last one where Coates scores, he gets over there late 
because uh, Hargreaves is on him and he, he's sitting there on his knees and he's cut like blood pouring blood down everywhere. his face. Yeah. And it's just like, mate, he is such a, a good player to watch. Also, I think Radley has been phenomenal. Yeah, I think yeah. Radley is having, you know, close to the best season he's had in what do you reckon four four years, That's three by years? Far and away the best season he's had in since they went back to back. Yeah, pretty much. He, I think he's been absolutely outstanding on the uh, on the middle rotation to really May again. Yeah, mate. So I got a few numbers around just from the results with him because one minute we play big minutes, the next week he won't. So on the weekend. Played 30 minutes, they get done, 18-12, and a pretty disappointing loss to the Storm. Week before, plays 50 minutes, an upset win over the Knights, 22-20. Week before that, played 20 minutes against the Dogs. I know a lot of shit went on there, but they've done 30-26 to 26 and was really disappointing just the way that whole game panned out for them, blown off the park early. While he was on the field, I know it's only 20 minutes, but they were actually up 12-6, and they scored the set that he went off in that game. Round four, played 55 minutes. They lost to the Panthers 22-16. Great result against Penrith. Week before that, 52 minutes. They won 48-6 over the Bunnies. The only probably outlier to these numbers, round two, he played 57 minutes, got done 21-14 to Manly, but Manly, well, Manly, have, Manly have had some big scouts this season already. Uh, and then round one over in Vegas, he played 54 minutes straight. They won 20-10 to 10 against the Broncos. That whole situation, like, very strange. I don't, he just re-signed. Is there, oh, I don't know if you guys spoke about it on um, Packer Up Boys the other day, but I'd love to know if Terrell May knew that Fisher Harris was going. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, then that money would free up. Yeah, interesting. I mean, he sat here with you and said, I want to play with my brother. Mm. But, I mean, does Penrith want him though? You know, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the May situation at the Roosters... Um, it's not a situation, but it is just perplexing that Why he's only he getting... Why 30 minutes? And also, there? Cheese got brought off for 30 minutes. Cheese only played 55. Mm. I feel like in a game like that, where it's close, it's against a storm, you're playing him at least 65, 70, surely. Well, you sit there and you look and go, all right, they have one line break all game, really struggle to sort of threaten their storm line. You've got this tackle busting, offloading, creates a second phase And when he was on, Manu, he was doing that. Teddy. He always does. Yeah. Why would he play 30 minutes? Yeah, with May, sorry. Are you talking about May? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's but also with cheese, he played fifty five. Cheese, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, wouldn't you play him longer? Even like, Radley has been terrific. Mm. He's gone eighty minutes in the middle at the moment. Like, I, I'm not sure when he came on and off and whatnot, but and I'm not sure where their interchange interchange are at at this point. But if I had Terrell Mason on my bench as soon as Munster got binned, on, Mate, I'd be trying straight to get him through the middle. Many, maybe mm. he's got footage that we don't see. Maybe there's parts of Terrell's game that, like, you know. Trent Robinson is a big um, advocate of that he doesn't do well. Yeah. Like maybe it's line speed. I don't know. Well, like, it's, it's Trent Robinson, one of the smartest things in the NRL. There'd yeah. be something behind There'd it. There'd be something that'd have to be. God knows what it is. Very, yeah. <clears throat> anyway. Um, but, yeah, some positives. Collins outstanding. Radley outstanding. Um, I also think Sue Elite, he's been flying under the radar with some of the plays he's made. That tap back for Joey Manu yeah. was unbelievable. Like, if you go and watch the sleight of hand, that didn't just – you know, a lot of the time they – Players go up and they bat it back and it just kind of like hits their hand awkwardly and sometimes it lands in the center's hand. If you go back and watch closely, he like intentionally like moves his hands like that perfectly to where he's – it's just a great play. I think uh, Sully's been fine. Hey, right? He's going to be forced back to center. Uh, yeah. Young back this week. Yeah. Such a good threat on the wing and just uh, – they could probably kick to him a little bit more, I reckon. I agree. Probably underutilize him a little bit. Well, look, bit. Xavier Coates on the other side. Mm. We'll get into it, shall we? Storm. Um – Mate, outstanding. And what I, what excites me the most about the storm is there's a, you can see a base of a found, like a foundation of a game plan that they're probably at about six out of ten at the moment. By the time finals roll around, with everyone back, with Nas firing, with they didn't even have Kamakamitha on the weekend, so their starting front row wasn't even in the, in the game, uh, and they're at about a six or seven out of ten when they hit ten out of ten. Around fi- if they hit 10 out of 10 around finals time, they're a premiership heavyweight. I-, I love the way they're playing. They've shown all the grit in the world. They've got so much more room for improvement. But, I mean, Munster is, you know, you can tell he's injured. He's nowhere near his best at the moment. And Hughes has been incredible. Uh, Pappy can, he's only, you know, what, he's in his sixth, sixth or seventh game back this year. There is so much room for growth. Bloor has exploded. Chan came on and killed it. For a forward pack going into this year, we're sitting there going, oh, a lot of questions around it. If everyone in that forward pack keeps going in the direction they're going in, it'll go from one of the most questionable top-tier forward packs to one of the scariest forward packs. 
uh, especially if Cummy Kamitha can play, keep playing the way he is. I think the Storm being outstanding to start of the year, as in they haven't been playing as well as they can, but outstanding to get wins even when they're not playing as well as they can. They're just such a typical Melbourne, uh, you know, Craig Bellamy, Melbourne side that they're just not going to beat themselves. Mm. If you're going to get two points against them, you're going to ha- you're going to have to beat them. Sean Bloor, mate, he looks like the forward that they've been waiting for. Mm. He, you know. What's that, his second game as a starter? Third game as a starter, I think it is. Very early days. He'll, he'll only get better as we go. If, if his body holds together, he's in for a huge season. Mate, and, and what I'm loving about his game is that we're, we're just seeing the tough stuff at the moment. We're not seeing – like, he's not just a battler forward. He's a forward that can break tackles, have line breaks, score tries, offloads, big plays, big, big plays, and also – He's a leader as well, and he's so young still. Uh, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg with him. Mate, the pass that he threw, he came off his left foot and he came back to the middle and, and he hit Joe Chan. Like, there's, there's not many halves in the comp that would have hit that pass. Yeah, he's, he's scary how good he can be if, if his body can hold up. That's if his, his body holds question. up, yeah, yeah. He, he's going to be such a good player. Yeah. Um, and, mate, the form of Coates. Oh. I don't know about you guys, but he's constantly a guy that at the start of the year when I'm thinking about my origin size, I go, yeah, maybe Coates, maybe. Like, you couldn't possibly consider leaving him out. He's a lock-in now. Yeah. Yeah. An absolute lock-in. Iceman. He's won three. He's had three match-winning plays in the first seven rounds of the NRL. We can't have a specific market on it, but I I can see him doing that in an origin game this year as well. Just He's done, done it too often this season. Yeah, and, and as you said, Kimby, I mean, for me, realistically, Grant, Munster, Pappy... I couldn't give their season so far probably more than a 7 out of 10. Even some of those guys are 6 out of 10. Once they start to play some footy, they're going to be so hard to stop. Hey, like, you know, they've just been solid. Like, Munster's yeah. just got through his work. Uh, Grant has been – he's had I think he had one really good game out, so that he's just been solid. Pappy, been solid. It's really been the huge show down yeah. at Storm. And the way that, you know, this competition works, if they're peaking at the right end of the season, they'll get two home games in Melbourne. Good luck. Oh, yeah, good luck going down there. With their, them all fit – with that spine together for a full season, like it's 2022 was the last time they played together before this current yep. you know, batch of playing together. They're, I just love the way they play. I, what about yourself, Timmy? What do you reckon? Yeah, it's, it's a great point you make around the, the big guns haven't stepped up yet and they're, what, they're second on the table. So they've got the second best defensive record in the NRL uh, behind the Penrith Panthers. And I had some, some stats last week around Harry Grant being the big one who's been okay, but he hasn't scored a try this year. He's had one try assist. He's had one try contribution. He's had only one line break and two line break assists. Like, scratching the surface if we know what Harry Grant is going to do. You mentioned Cam Munster, got that groin concern, just come back from injury. Pappenhausen's been solid. Again, got to remember, he's coming back from lengthy injury laps as well. So... They are building so nicely and they don't – like we've had question marks in the past around their middles and, you know, are they good enough to, to compete with the best in the game? They don't necessarily have to – because they've got so much stripe power and points in them on the flanks and in their spine, they don't necessarily need to dominate teams through the middle in the best games. They only need to match them, yeah. which they're doing. You add in Bloor, Katoa, who are both killing it, they're, they're very well placed. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, you, obviously you need them to make decent metres – but you just need that those middle front rows to be good defenders, really. Mm. Like because when you've got guys like Bloor, Katoa, you've got outside backs like Coates, um, Pappy through the middle, the meters will come. You got Meany who gets through a bunch of work. What we spoke about Bloor. What's crazy is we're speaking about Bloor. We haven't even spoken about Katoa. And I know like he had those two errors, which obviously keeps him out of the team of the week. But if you get rid of those two errors, like. This guy is absolutely killing it on the edge. Like a constant nightmare for defence. On the weekend, he had a try, a try assist, 13 runs, 105 metres, 41 post contact, five tackle breaks, 40 tackles, only one miss. And then you go to the other edge, 31 tackles for Bloor, zero misses. So on both edges, they had about 71 tackles. Not about, they had 71 tackles. Out of the 71 tackles on the edge at four in defender, one miss. Yeah. Like that is unbelievable. Yeah, and the Melbourne Storm at the moment, they've played uh, six games now. They've only conceded 98 points. And in no shock to anyone, the top four teams at the moment, they've conceded the least amount of points yeah, in the competition. So they're so they're bit like, And the two records that are the most similar, the Melbourne Storm and the Penrith Panthers. What's insane is like, no, this is a, a game they won against the Roosters. Roosters renowned forward pack that's crazy. <coughs> this is what Nass had. He had nine runs for 70 metres and one tackle break. Like... So a guy that 
last year their whole forward pack was literally based on however this guy's plays is how we play as a team to basically just cherry on top mm. like basically just the cherry on top it is just such incredible stuff and i tell you what when it comes to yarn obviously outside of me hoping the broncos win but if they win in bellamy's last year if it is his last year i mean that's great yarn. Oh. that's just like he may as well just go thanks for coming see you Destined. later boys Destined for it. Yeah. I mean, if there's one coach who deserves a premiership yeah. in his last year, yeah, probably be the great bellyache. And then go and coach the Roosters next year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, could you imagine? The, <laughs> the two players for me, Kempi and this one, were just huge effort area for, for his first try. Put up the big crossfield bomb, follows it up. I can't remember if it was caught or tapped back, but he's just flying on. Had no right to be doing that. Mm. Scored a ripping try off it. Uh, and probably not far off the play here, the game, but... Three minutes to go, Pappenhausen getting yeah. out of goal, skinning to elite you one-on-one, had no right to do it. Should have been held in goal there. Roosters were attacking, two and a half on the clock to level the game up. Got out, game over. Game over. Gets out, and guess who takes the scoot the next hit? Hit up. King. So you've got a front <laughs> rower tracking so hard, he's in the corner, and he's the first one there, and he takes a scoot out of his own end. And uh, we did a bit of footage on it um, on Packer Up Boys. If you trail him for that next set, he is done. Like lactic acid build up, like he's done. Mm. He kick chases, he takes a hit up, he does his job, and he's just making his leg work, like just getting through it. And like that's what typifies a storm. It really is. When Josh King was in Newcastle, um, I got I got a mate that grew up the same age group. He missed the Harold Matts, the SG ball. Just all those sides. Mate, he could barely make the new side. Yep. Goes down to Newcastle, uh, goes down to the storm, and like he's probably one of the him and Meany. Probably, obviously, you've got Munster and that that are the first picked. But I tell you what, there would be no second guessing of should I pick me and should I pick King. Yeah. Whereas I feel like at a lot of the clubs, they would go, oh, he's not the big flashy centre that has a big fend and a flick pass and footwork and all that kind of stuff. Even though Mini's footwork's pretty good, and so they'd almost get overlooked. King, oh, he's not the biggest front rower, um, but that's what makes the Storm great. He had six years at Newcastle. He played seventy-eight games. This is his third year, so like. Basically two years and a few games, and he's played 57 for Storm. There you go. There you go. And also, the six years at Newey was when they were like, you know, tough times. Tough times. Two who else I want to give her up to. I thought Remus Smith defended Joey Manu really well. When Joey Manu started to cause havoc, it was, it was because Connor Watson was uh, turning him under and whatnot. There was a few times where Joey Manu got early ball to take on Remus Smith. I thought he handled him very well. Yeah, and which is good because in the trials his defence was a little bit off, but Remus is known for his defence. Yep. So when he's bringing that, I think Meany's been frigging outstanding at yep. centre as well. Um, anyway, that is uh, Storm versus Roosters. Uh, hopefully the Roosters can turn it around because it's just, I want another horse in the race. You know what I mean? If there's one team that has the roster to go against Penrith, to go against Storm, to go against um, the Broncos, it's the Roosters. So hopefully they can... Uh, it, it feels weird to say because, like, it was only a few weeks ago where I'm going, yeah, the Roosters, they're looking yeah. pretty good. And then now I'm like, oh, shit, like, could we be – like, And you just don't want to see talent like they've got wasted there. I want to see these mate. guys playing good footy. It, it should be an, such an entertaining game every single week instead of a frustrating one. And they could come out and put on a 10 out of 10 performance on the end. That day and go, yeah. yeah, there it is. But it feels like we've been saying this for th- three yeah. years. Yeah. All right, now it's time for the great Dwayne Bennett that looks like he's on cloud nine after the big win on the weekend. How you going, brother? Oh, mate, what's the matter, Parramatta? I'll tell you what the matter is, the Dolphins. <laughs> oh. we, we were in form on the weekend. Hey, that was, that was a good score. Great game. Mate, what question have you got from the fans this weekend, mate? Mate, this question comes from a young Hayden. Uh, he's a Manly supporter. Uh, and he asks, what halfback is in form in the NRL this season? So the, who is the informed halfback this season in the NRL at the moment? So the question is, who, who is the most informed half of the season so far? I mean, isn't it funny that it comes from a Manly supporter? <laughs> I wonder whether he wants us to say the great DCE is the most informed. Look, look in my opinion, I think DCE has got to be up there. I think Sean Johnson's also been outstanding. Uh, I think that's obvious for everyone to see. Uh, but in regards to inform sevens, but then you add on, you know, all the other stuff that goes with it. Right now, as we speak, Katoa is on equal points with Nico Hines in the Dally M's. We're talking about a 20-year-old at a club in its second year of NRL, goes up to Darwin and puts an absolute clinic on the eels uh, with 
you know, five or six of their starting, or at least their at least four or five of their seventeen starting seven, like out of their starting seventeen, out of the Dolphins side. I know that the Eels were missing Mitchell Moses and maybe one or two others, but for me, the obvious answers are your DCEs. Uh, you know, obviously Hines was that great on the weekend. Your SJs, but I think the the really exciting answer that you know we, we Joey always talks about how all the halfbacks are so old and we don't have any new halves coming that are ready to take on a team and lead them. I think Katoa has been <laughs> unbelievably good this year. Yeah, in a competition missing, you know, three of your top eight halfbacks in Cleary, <laughs> Moses, Adam Reynolds at the moment. Mate, I think Isaiah Katoa over the last few weeks has been tremendous. I think SJ is a very good shout as well. I think that in games the Warriors have lost, he's been pretty good in all of them. Oh, mate. Pretty good. It, it, it's crazy. He's playing almost career best form, even in their losses. Even in their losses. What about yourself, uh, Timmy? What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, in terms of probably expectation versus delivery, Katal's a great one. But if we're going straight numbers, form, what's happening? I think it's Daly Cherry Evans for me. Just head of Jerome Hughes, who's been terrific, and you mentioned SJ also great as well. But Daly Cherry Evans is just. You know, your job as a number seven is game management. And with every game he plays, his wisdom as a number seven and his experience shines through. This year, she scored three tries, three try assists. You add in there with Garrick out a little bit. He's kicked nine from ten goals. He has ten forced dropouts. I think he's been unreal. Man, you're playing good footy, so it's DCE for me. Yeah, I love your Hughes shout. I think Hughes, when you talk about, you know, kicking games, his kicking game has just improved out of sight since last year. And, you know, because he's down in Melbourne, and also I think it's because he does play a little bit differently as a half. You don't see, I'll put it this way. When I watch Hughes play seven, I don't see him as an orthodox seven. It's an unorthodox seven. I think Hughes has been absolutely outstanding this year. Hammy? He was my show as well. Jerome Hughes uh, flying under the radar down there in Melbourne. I think he's been very, very impressive. Storm equal top of the ladder as well. So that speaks for itself. Cherry Evans, though, has been very impressive as well, I reckon. Like a fine wine. Benjamin Button down there, um, you're getting better with age. Uh, particularly that game against Penrith. Um, just mm. just so impressive the way that he, he ran the show and controlled it. Uh, but either of those two. We've got some great halves. Those two are the standouts. And then, yeah, Katoa are the one to watch as well, as yeah. you guys said. Pure stats. I'd probably just pip DCE over Hughes. But it'd be number one, DCE. Hughes, two. SJ, three. But most exciting for me, Katoa. What about yourself, mate? Dwayne, who you got? Mate. I'm not being biased, but I was saying Katoa from the start. He's getting bigger and better with every game. Katoa is a grower. <laughs> That's what I, I love him. Katoa is a grower. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Get that on a shirt. Katoa the grower. <laughs> Mate, look, how do we become a Finlander? Also, I'm getting whispers. There's a bit of an announcement today with the Finlanders. Mate, we have a good announcement. Look, and, and look. I mean, who wouldn't want to become an official Finlander? You even get your own digital passport and a budget direct Dolphins NRL phone fin, which pretty much fits like, well, a fin. It fits like a fin. <laughs> there are five all-inclusive packages to give away to see the Dolphins play Manly on Thursday the 9th of May in Brisbane at Lang Park Stadium itself. It's going to be a banger, mate. Wow. It's going to be huge. So a uh, budget direct VIP package competition. Uh, and basically, it's a VIP Let package. So it includes everything. Everything, Dwayne. It, and when we say everything, we mean everything. All righty. So the prize is they're giving Finlanders a chance to visit Finland itself. There are five all-inclusive packages to give away to see the Dolphins play Manly on Thursday, the 9th of May in Brisbane at Langpart Stadium. Uh, so what does the prize include? It's a VIP package, so it includes everything. Travel to and from Brisbane from anywhere in Australia. A double pass to the Budget Direct corporate suite to watch the game. At no a night's accommodation and $250 spending money. So everyone head to finland.com.au to get your digital Finland passport and enter the ultimate Dolphins NRL and Budget Direct VIP package competition. T's and C's apply and good luck. Uh, how do people enter? Mate, it's as easy as dolphins gliding through the waves. Just sign up to become an official Finlander at finland.com.au. Download your passport onto your smartphone or dumb phone, whatever your phone you got, and then click the link to to the competition entry page, which is located in the back of the pass under pass details. Under pass details. There he is, the great Dwayne Bennett. Thanks for joining us again, mate. Appreciate it. 
Alrighty, now it is on to the Dragons defeating the Warriors 30 to 12. Our LDV T60 power play of the week is Zach Lomax for his two great plays on either side of halftime. He absolutely nailed a two point field goal just before the siren. He then he came out and scored a great try to start the second half. The LDV T60 has 160 kilowatts of grunt, which makes it one of the most powerful utes in its class. Auto from 38990 drive away for ABN holders, seven year or 200,000 kilometre warranty, whichever occurs first. At that price, why go second hand when you can have a brand new LDV? And actually, one of the, the listeners actually messaged me. He said, I brought my brand new LDV, sent me the pictures and everything. I was stoked for him. How good, how good. Uh, so I appreciate it, brother, and I uh, hope you enjoy your brand new LDV, and I hope you enjoy that grunt, mate. I hope you can handle the grunt. <laughs> can you handle the grunt? I don't know. Time will tell. Time will tell. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, Zachy Lomax, let's get straight into it. Dragons defeat Warriors. Zachy Lomax with another incredible performance. Ironically, gets moved to centre and says, hey, that doesn't matter. I'm still going to keep playing. Could you imagine if you went there and had a Barry Crocker? <laughs> oh, God. Lano would have been sitting in the press conference, uh, like the box going like this the whole game. <laughs> I was right. But he went back to he went back to centre. He absolutely killed it. Uh, all jokes aside about predicting his form, but, you know, usually when you hear some of the greats of our game, rapper young kid they're usually on the money outside of obviously attitude like is their attitude fully dedicated blah 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 and you know Lomax has had good years before but now that he seems to be fully committed to you know just ripping and tearing each game and just getting as many touches as possible all the raps that we heard Brad Fittler we heard you know Joe, all the boys that had wrapped Lomax up they're absolutely right because his ability to impact a game and make not only he can do the big stuff, he can do the, the tough stuff, he can do stuff that no one else can do. Like the most, him at his best ripping and tearing is arguably one of the most well-rounded outside backs in the game. I remember talking to Jamie Sowd about two years ago about him when he was like, you know, assistant coach and helping out with the Dragons. And I remember Sow, he said something along the lines of, mate, I played alongside Mark Gaznier and trained with him every day for a couple of years. And Gaz would just do shit that no one else could. And, and he said, mate, some, sometimes you watch Lomax at training and you would think he's better than Gaz, the stuff that he's able to do. Uh, and now we're finally starting to see some of it come together. Like, I, I, I remember when I was a kid and used to sit there and watch Friday Night Footy and whatnot and like, it felt like at the end of every set, you just kick the ball in the air and there'd be an aerial contest. And it's sort of gone out of the game a little bit. Mm. Watching the Dragons now, it's just hold the ball till fourth, kick it into his postcode, and he'll come down with it. Yeah. He's doing it every single time. It's unbelievable. And, you know, we said earlier, he's he's, he's leading the Dally M's. There's been a number of occasions where he's come down with kicks and needed an offload or whatever. And I think his teammates have let him down in certain moments. Like, he could have had even more points. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, he... He's a, it's almost like whenever he wants to impact the game, just give him a good enough play to allow him to, mm. and he'll do it. Like, he'll nail it. Well, what about when he, when he went up and caught that one on the weekend? He came down, he's about two metres out. He probably could have scored himself, but he just sort of went, oh, here you go, Kyle, you put this down. Yeah. He's, uh, he's just had all the time in the world. The, the thing with Lomax now is, though, is, mate, you've set the standard now. Yeah. Like, you, there's no going back. There's no, <clears throat> there's no, oh, this wasn't working, that wasn't working, because... It's not just the big players that are working for him. He's doing all the tough stuff as well. So it's that double-edged sword of like, when you go to the Eels and if things aren't going your way, there's no longer allowed to kind of, like for example, the last couple of years, we could all sit there and go, ah, the Dragons, not the best place to be at the moment. Development, not that good. Some of the younger players haven't come through as well as we would have hoped due to the system not being that great at the moment. Where it's like, mate, you're in a team that a lot of people tip for wooden spoon and you're leading the Dally M's. So, like, the standard has been set. If you're fit enough to cross that white line, you don't necessarily have to have these crazy plays, but at the very least, we want, you know, 20 to 25 runs from you and 150 to 200 metres. And could you imagine how many people, journos, would have been sitting out there before this game thinking, okay, Lomax has got his contract and he's playing centre. If he goes shit here at centre... I'm going to write straight away. So you're a winger dickhead. Yeah. Listen to your coach. And, or, well, you got your contract. Now you're not playing to that standard. And Lomax comes out and absolutely kills it. Yeah. And look, we've said it since it all happened. But I think that, you know, anyone that has bought the narrative that he's just a sooky player, that's like, I want to play center and that's why I'm out of here. It's like, that makes no sense. Does that look like a sooky player to you? Mm. Like, no, it doesn't. Now, does it mean that his attitude has been perfect for the last five years? No, not, not necessarily. When has any young player been perfect for the last five years? Um, 
But the yeah, the narrative that he is just he, he wants out because he's not playing center. I think that has got to be cleared up by now because if that was the case, he wouldn't be ripping and tearing the way he is. Um, I think it is a mutual situation where the Dragons have looked at it and said, we've got an outside back on 750K right now as a club. That is not where we should be putting our money. And then Lomax has said, well, you know, I've been at this club for five years now. It hasn't seemed to work out. Maybe I need a fresh start. What do you think about Lomax at the moment, Timmy? Yeah. And look, if there is internal shit going on, he's not happy there and he wants out and doesn't want to be there, well, it's a credit to him for coming out and giving his absolute all every time he plays. Because he's been... He hasn't... He hasn't missed a beat the entire season for them. Effort errors have been outstanding. Have we seen a better player contesting high balls? Because, like... Maybe Folau. Maybe Folau. Mm. But even the way Lomax... Like, Folau did a lot of his on the wing and just jumping high. and He was near untouchable. Lomax is doing it... Like, even in previous years, he was doing it from centre. Yeah. And just chasing them and jumping over the top of them. It's not like that crossfield kick yeah. on the corner post sort of thing. I like – he's done his whole career, but he's starting to do it every single week. As Guru said, it's just the game plan. Get through your set, kick to him, he'll jump over and score. Yeah, yeah. And that's the difference for me. From, and, you know, it's a small sample size of seven weeks. But with Israel Folau, and mistake me if I'm wrong, but I remember the vast majority of Israel Folau in the air was kicked to the winger. Right in the corner. Yeah, just spec- yeah. Lomax is tracking yeah. through people. And you see, like, teams are obviously talking about it every single week. When the ball goes up, get it the fuck in the way of Lomax. And he just makes it work and gets there every single time. Even it's, their shit kicks, he gets there. Well, the best thing is, is, like, if he can continue this form up of the catching and that, because blockers have been pretty much a race from the – not a race, but, like, nowhere near what they used to be. Like, you, you could honestly barely get a freaking catch on the ball a couple of years mm-hmm. ago. And it's honestly, it could be one of the best weapons yeah. in the game yeah. because at the very least, you're going to rattle the fullback. And even like you're on the wing, you see Falau, and yeah, it's quite different, but it's a crossfield kick. They're kicking it into your mitts coming across to meet the ball. Mm. Lomax chasing those kicks. Like it's going away from him. It's going into the fullback's mitts and he's jumping over the top of them. Like there are no favours there. Yeah, yeah. with like, the flight. Yeah. yeah. And like there's been plays over the last few weeks. Like he's playing right wing. He's catching bum- bombs on the left tram. Line. Catching bombs on the left. Catching tram line. bombs. <laughs> Jesus. He, he is That's an all <laughs> What footy are you watching on the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Lomax with a double X. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Lomax has been outstanding, and uh, I tell you what, if you're an Eels fan, you're sitting there going, "Oh yeah, oh yeah." Like we have been, you know, starving for an outside back, and this guy playing like this and doing it consistently. And again, the beautiful thing is. A lot of his stuff, it's hard work stuff. It's not just he's, you know, taking a run and it's a mad flick pass. He has that in his game, but it's the – so what's he – he had 20 – how many runs do you have on the weekend? 21 runs on the weekend, which I think is on the lower end. Mm. Um, you know, so great stuff uh, by Lomax. Uh, this game was just great for me for the Dragons um, overall. Obviously, that's our power play brought to you by LDV260 uh, Lomax's plays. What I loved about this from the Dragons was, A, their patience and their confidence. Like, they didn't even – the Warriors come out and the Warriors are playing great footy and you're sitting there going, oh, here we go. It's going to be a clinic. And the Dragons just kept turning up for each other, just kept turning up, kept turning up. And before you knew it, momentum swings with a penalty coming out of their own end. And what was so – I don't mean this disrespectfully, but what was so surprising with every opportunity – that the Dragons got, they took. Mm. Every opportunity the Warriors got, they didn't take. And that was the difference between the two sides, at least in the first half. It was Dragons were genuinely, if that if they got half a sniff, and going, heading into the season, if you said that the Dragons would be the best to take an opportunity, you would have said, mate, that's like, if there's anything that they don't have, it's it's that attacking prowess, it's that, that big moment in game. They were incredible. Every single sniff, every single half error by the Warriors, Dragons scored they, points. They scored basically their first three cracks on the Warriors' mm. line. Yeah. yeah. Yep. After defending their ass off for the first 20 minutes. And I th- okay, this is – okay, this is – apologies, I should have brought this up earlier. This is why Lomax is having the year he's having. So he comes out in the second half. He takes the second run after the, ta- uh, so after the kick. So front row takes a hit up. He takes the second run. Uh, he takes a one-out hit up. He fights for every meter, so he keeps charging, good post contact. In that same set, he then chases a bomb to score. And that's a mixture of tough stuff and brilliant stuff. That is a mixture of basically saying, I'm going to force my way into this game. No matter, like, personally, if he doesn't take that second hit up, 
I don't know if that second play lands for him, and that, that sorry, the the kick play lands for him, and that might sound silly, but you would be amazed. Like all the advice outside backs get before running on the field is take a carry early. That always, that's always what is, and for some reason, I don't know what it is, but any time that you're not engaged in the game where you don't take a hit up early or you don't get involved, opportunities just don't seem to come your way. When you're doing what Zach Lomax is doing, which is literally forcing his way into the game with the tough stuff, the brilliance follows. And that one set is why Lomax is leading the Dally as well. Like that one set, he took the second carry off a hit up. Like when it just, Lomax didn't used to do that kind of stuff. Yep. And then the big stuff didn't, didn't really happen for him as much. To be leading it in one of a side that was tipped to be bottom four, if not bottom two by most, playing on the wing and obviously centre on the weekend. That's so crazy. Mm. In a side also with Ben Hunt, who like when the Dragons win, it's normally Ben Hunt six, Ben Hunt six. Yep. But yep. Like, and like, I don't want to be disrespectful to the Dragons, but if he's not in the side, I think like they're a good footy side, but I think they could be bottom four. If he if Lomax isn't playing the way he is. How many points are coming through here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what did he score on the weekend? Like 14 points or something? Mm -hmm. 18 like, points or something? Like something crazy. Um, and like the amount of repeat sets he forces just by getting up for the ball as well. Because mm. you can see fullbacks, they've got one eye on just where he is and where he's coming from. So uh, I reckon without him, they'd <laughs> be a very different season. Yeah. Um, yeah, so with the with the um, the Dragons, another understung hero for me, I think Little's been outstanding this year mm. for him the, the, in his minutes that he's played. Yeah, he's been great, Jacob. And he's always had ability, Little. He's always, you know, when he was coming through the grades, he was an absolute gun and just injury just held him back every single year. Mate, I think another unsung hero... Tommy Eisenhuth. Oh, Eisenhuth, yeah. Mate, do you know Tommy Eisenhuth made his debut in 2012? For the really? Panthers? Yep. Then he didn't play first grade for seven years. Lobbed in Mel at Melbourne Storm in 2019. Played 50 games across the next five years at Melbourne. I'll tell you what I thought was really interesting. Watching the Dragons last year, and they would quite often have that Saturday 3 p.m., the 5.30 game, and Shane Flanagan would always be calling it on Fox. Mm. And I remember he always used to absolutely give it to the way they were utilising Jack DeBellin, mm. that he didn't like him as a 13. He wanted him to play as a front row forward. And I listened to it all year going, sure, mate, but who do you want them to play at 13? Who mm. else can play that role on this side? And then they signed Tommy Eisenhuth during the off-season. I thought, okay, we'll see I, how Honestly, when last. they signed him, I was like, that's the last thing the Dragons need is a battler forward getting through his tough stuff. He played 57 minutes on the weekend and made 56 tackles. <laughs> Only missed one. Maniac. And he, like, even as a 13, like, I, don't, I didn't see him as a 13 either. I agree with you, mate. I don't has been outstanding for him. He, he's been in the NRL now for 12 years and he's played 60 games. Mate, he's been so good. And even, like, when we spoke about preseason, like, where's the spark in, in this Dragons pack? Where, where's that X factor? And you're like, all right, they've signed Luciano Le Lua. There, there he is. Didn't even play on the weekend. And they scored 30 points. Yeah. I'm just on his profile here for the Dragons, and um, he's 31 years old. His nickname, they call him Eisengoat, <laughs> oh. which I'm all for. Oh. <laughs> Love that. Love that from the big fella. Uh, now, Moses Suley, let's talk about him. Mate, I think he's been so friggin' good for the Dragons, and I love the fact that I feel like for a couple of years he was doing the tough stuff, he was coming out of his own end, but there was no, like, play set for him. Like, there, were, there was no, we've got this absolutely giant centre and we have no set plays for him. He's fast, he's explosive, he's strong in contact. What I love at the Dragons at the moment is he's actually getting a specific play made for him. That try that he scored where he just ran that hard unders mm. line, try stopping Moses Sully there. Like, good luck, good luck. And he, we saw in the trials, similar situation, the double drop under, him coming harder, that three or the two. I think... Um, I think Sully's been so good. So he had a try. He had 13 runs, 145 metres. So he's averaging more than 10 metres uh, per run. 39 post contact, two tackle breaks, two line breaks. Two line breaks. Uh, eight tackles, uh, only one miss. Like, when it comes to New South Wales' depth in the centres, it's pretty deep. It's pretty deep these days. For me to associate the word consistency with him is unbelievable mm. when you consider a couple of years ago. He has is, he is just improved out of sight and you can tell that he has just gone away and worked on himself so hard. Yeah, love it. Love it. Uh, another guy as well, Ravalawa. Is he the most... I don't, underrated wing is probably the wrong word, but he never... Like he's this giant winger that in his out-of-trouble sets, like what he does, he's been... He was one of their better players last year. Mm. This year he's been great. Never gets spoken about, but he's another guy that, look, 
16, so he had a try, 16 runs, 159 metres, 47 post contact, six tackle breaks, a line break. Um, I put it this way, when Sivo had his run, everyone talked about it, I, you know, and rightly so. It's great. He's a good try scorer. Ravalawa, could you check how many tries he scored last week, last year? I think it was a fair few. Yeah. No one really talks about it. And the thing about it this year where his try scoring has dried up, mate, the Dragons – so right edge dominant with Benny Hunt. Like Ravalava was on the right wing last year. The Dragons scored 55% of tries on the right last year, 27% on their left. Mm. He's obviously made the shift this year to the left wing uh, and Lomax has gone to the right, but he played Ravalawa right wing on the weekend, I believe. Yep. Again, found the stripe. Yep. So that's where there's been less tries. He's still playing good footy. Yeah, and he just never gets talked about. 21 tries from 21 games. <laughs> yeah, no one even talks about so it. So then this year... They've scored seventy one percent of their tries on the right edge, seventeen on the left. Yeah. So and even when they do go left, it's often you know playing short Sully or bringing Sully under. So not yeah. a great try scoring spot to be, but he's still playing good footy. He's still playing good footy, and I just you know I think that he he doesn't get the raps he deserves. So um, you know Benny Hunt, we've already spoken about him. That try that he scored, are you serious? Mm. Throwing blokes, <sighs> Bruce Dozer, settle down, brother. Yeah, settle down, big fella. Isn't it like that's all from the bucket. And it, it's obviously changed now. It's a different situation. But, you know, a week ago, the big conversation about the Queensland Maroon side was how do you get Ponga and Walsh in? And like, I couldn't believe that some people were suggesting sacrificing Benny Hunt. No like, seriously, way. they're not serious people. If you seriously... Well, <laughs> what are we talking about here? Yeah. Ben Hunt, Harry Grant have been like the key to our bench. Anyway, Hammy, what do you think about the Dragons, mate? Yeah, very good. And you, you've touched on a couple of guys in the back line there. Lomax, Suli... Probably having the best best years of their career so far. Would that be fair to say? Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lomax for sure. Yeah. Dude, another guy who keeps improving a little bit. Okay, a couple of missed tackles on the weekend. He's had one or two missed games here or there. But uh, Terrell Sloan. I thought he's great. Good moments as well. Um, you know, yep. he, he had a try, line break assist, a try assist. Um, he had a bad game a couple of weeks ago in the wet. But apart from that, I, I feel like he keeps improving each week as well. So bit of a credit to Flano for getting the best out of a couple of guys, you know, mm. in that back line. They seem like they're having, you know, th their best year so far. I, th I feel like Sloan has just brought his game back a little bit yep. and just simplified it. Um, I had Sloan jotted down as well, Hammy, and zero errors on the weekend. Yep, zero errors. I think it was one last week. Zero this week had a try, had a try assist. It was a, a solid game, but just composure again was so... He's learning so much every week, and yep. we've mentioned him a few times, but you've got to give credit to Shane Flanagan, who this bloke who seemed almost impossible to, to round him out as an NRL quality player week in, week out, because we know he had the flash of brilliance. He's currently doing it with Terrell Sloan. Yeah, So absolutely. if he can keep this up, far out. Yeah, no, it is really, really good stuff. I think uh, it just seems like he's just almost taken a little bit of a step back with the attacking stuff, and he's just like, you know what, I just want to get through games by... Just doing my job mm. and everything can build off that. I thought Sloan was really good on the weekend. Really good. Uh, now, on to the Warriors. Um, it's, it's such a weird one because I, I watched that game and I wasn't like, wow, Warriors are playing terribly. Uh, but I think that the, my big takeaway with the Warriors was, A, in that first 20 minutes or 15 minutes, they had quite a few opportunities that they should have iced that they didn't. Uh, if they had of, it would have been obviously a very different game. But... What I, the, the vibe I was getting is that I kind of feel like the Warriors are at where the Panthers were about four years ago, where they had a, a game plan, an A game plan, that if that didn't work, mm. they really struggled to kind of, uh, I guess, make it up on the go, or at least have a B game plan to go to and go, okay, let's try this. Uh, because, you know, the Storm were always, and again, Cameron Smith has said this, when they went into big games, they would go against an opposition and they would say, basically, our number one goal is you will not beat us with your A game plan. If you can beat us with your B or your C game plan, fair enough. And, you know, Penrith Panthers, I felt like early on, when they got put under pressure and they had to play outside of their game plan, you know, especially in that grand final, which is things weren't going their way, they, they struggled a little bit. Cleary also, I think that he's, you know, the initial years of Cleary as he was learning was really good at structure, but if you mess with it a little bit, he would, he would struggle. Obviously, he's developed now and, and learned, and he's much better at it. Uh, and I think with the, the Warriors, I, I was just kept watching that game. I go, look, being patient is all well and good, and you want to be patient, but I'm just seeing the same set over and over and over, and I, I felt like that 
the game wasn't going their way and they really needed to shift a gear a little bit and try something different, which, you know, it sounds like, well, come on, that's, you know, their game plan is what got them to where they're at. But I feel like the best teams, they obviously have a very clear number one game plan, but when the time calls for it, they're really good at changing things up. It's a fascinating point, Kempi, because you're right. And four out of five times, the Warriors game plan will work and they have no need to go away from it. But, you know, they really were rattled in this one. And it's power through the middle, power through the middle, back three, big yardage coming out of their own end on kick returns. They dominate through. They'll often win a penalty or get a six again. They get into the opposition 20 and they just lay that left post and go back to the right, don't they? Mm. And that's good enough to work most of the time. But that's all they did on the weekend. And a huge credit to the Dragons' left edge defence because not many people can stop the Warriors' right. Mm. They didn't really – like, Dallin got the late try. They didn't really look like busting him. SJ scored very early on and they just kept going there, kept going there. Tui Pilotto, who played on the left wing, he did a really good job jamming on, on mm. Dallin or Chance, whoever it might have been. Uh, and they didn't, you're right, on this occasion, they didn't have a plan B. Yeah, and I think that even, um, now look, I'm not a professional lip reader, so I could be wrong here. <laughs> but after that first try, they, ha- they had a shot on SJ and he said, we keep going that side, don't get bored of that. That's what it looked like he said, don't get bored. Mm. And they were like at this. They were going to that side like all day long, and as it's, you don't want to go away from your game plan too soon because then. But I do think that as a as a team, if they were to play this game in another twelve months, I think that as a team they have matured enough to go. Oh, hang on a sec, this is not working for us for whatever reason. Whether it's our ball playing, whether it's defense, whatever the reason is. Let's try something different. Let's attack another weak point. Whereas I felt like they didn't really have that second. Whereas you look at Cleary. Cleary nowadays, if you take one weapon away from him, he'll just start running the ball and he'll have like 170 run metres or something like that. Garrett, what are your thoughts? It's the second time in seven weeks that I've watched the Warriors in the first 15 minutes and they look so good that I go, they can't lose this. Mm. Like the same thing happened against the Sharks. That might have been round one or round two where that, that first 15 minutes they were just untouchable. I almost wonder if they sort of, when they start like that, if they just think it is going to be a little bit easy mm. to get it done because they just weren't able to turn it around. Well, I, I didn't see any complacency. I just saw a a dogged commitment to like keep going back there, keep going back there. They'll break eventually though. And which is good. It is good. I think sometimes you've got to go, okay, yeah. hang on a sec. It's just not working. Yeah, today. You don't want to be super critical, do you? Cause there's times where I go, your edge is that good. Keep going back. Yeah. It will come. So I don't want to be like, um, I don't want to contradict what I've said in the past, but mm. <coughs> there has to be a plan B. Mm. I thought another little interesting thing that I noted, you know, just have a look at the stats. Fanua Blake had 26 runs. Barnett had 14. Toy Harris at 22. That's 62 runs between their starting middle. <laughs> their edges combined for eight runs. Yeah. Ford had three. Capewell yeah. had five. Yeah, it's... it's Remarkable. Um, like their forwards, their forwards were absolutely outstanding. And you've got to look at their backs as well. Obviously, Chance had, you know, 258 metres. Um, Wittenius and Lesniak, only 103. Uh, Roger, 142, which is decent. Boys, that, they, they have to work out how to get Roger into the game more. Like, he just sits on the left edge and it's just... Like, they don't even... Off the back of what we just said about it's all about right edge, right edge and setting up the shape for that. They just go over there and they'll sort of... They might bring him under or lay one for him so they can set up there and go to the right. He gets very little opportunity out there. He gets... I haven't really seen plays set up for Roger yet. There isn't one. Yeah. They, as I said, they occasionally go across and just bring him under, which is great because you get him in that broken field play. But I just think they're wasting one of the best talents in the game. And I just think they, they need to get him engaged more. Yeah. I think, look, it's like, it's just, I don't think it's as bad a loss as, you know, some may think it is. Like they look at the Dragons, they go, oh, Dragons are, you know, but Dragons are a much better side than, um, you know, what we've given them credit for heading into the season. On top of that, the Dragons played absolutely outstanding in my opinion. And so the, what I re- like about it is the fact that they didn't get flustered. So I'm almost double speaking here. I'm saying they should have had a plan B. But I think that this, this version of the Warriors can go deep into the finals. I think the next version is... Can you react to the game and have something else set up to take advantage of, of the thing that's it's not necessarily going your way? Um, so it's like, it's not a, it's not a, like, it's obviously disappointing the loss. They were flying so high. But at the same time, like, I didn't watch that game and go, 
oh, geez, they're giving up here and he's not having a crack and they don't want to win this and they're just going, oh, you know what, this one's not working, see you later. I did feel like they had a crack for the 80 minutes. I just felt like that, you know, we have to remember, Flano's a premiership winning coach. Like, that's obviously doesn't come easy. But also, like, he's a smart coach too. Like, he knows how to take away weapons from teams. We're talking about a coach that went into a grand final against the Melbourne Storm mm. and basically that grand final loss, guess what happened? The Storm went back to the drawing board and said, we need to completely change our game plan because it's not working anymore. They completely changed the way they played. They came out obviously and won the next mm. year. They became more of an attacking threat than they were. So you have to give credit to the fact that Flano, like he is a smart coach. Mm. Like he knows how to, he's, he's a good game planner. Um, so that, that, I think that those kind of games in 12 months' time, I think the Warriors actually do find a way to win them. I think just at the moment, they're in those early stages of progression as a unit. And I think you do just need to give full credit to the Dragons. I mean, yeah. they're you know one of the sides in the, one of the few sides in the competition that has a genuine, real quality seven. They've also got the guy leading the Dalian medal. And I mean, like it always takes me by surprise, but they always have two or three games at home each year where the Dragons put on a cracking performance. Like mm. they beat the Melbourne Storm last year at home from, yeah. from memory. Like yeah. they've always just got that game in them at home. Yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't be too disappointed as Warriors fans. Like, you know, NRL is tough. Some things just, sometimes things just don't go your way. Um, I will, what I do like though was like when the game was on the line, you could see all the Warriors players reacting to it. Mm. You could see the desperation in their runs. You could see the fact that they they didn't just allow the game to go, okay, this is just one that's not working for us. And I, I like that. Like Adam Fennell Blake, he's um I think it was his second stint. You could see the desperation in his in his running. You could see the fact that he was going, I need to make a difference. You could see SJ, you know, you know, really kind of just the urgency in the way they were playing. What I, that's what I like from the Warriors. Good, good teams in the NRL, like when you have one down week, it doesn't concern me one bit. Mm, it no. is one of the most physical sports in the real world. It is a ridiculously long season. There are 27 regular season weeks before finals. Disregarding maybe Penrith, who are just a phenomenon, <coughs> Team, every team has a down week. Yeah. It is going to happen. You're not going to get up every week. If you do, you'd, like, it's just not going to happen. Mm. So... You know, if they back this up next week with another poor performance uh, on Thursday, the Anzac Day clash, all right, then there's a few alarm bells. But one bad game, it happens. Yeah. Special shout out to the Warriors too, their first year in the Harold Matthews Cup. So, you know, the 16-year-olds playing in that, they're going to be flying over this week to play at Combank Stadium in the grand final. And they beat, they beat last year's winners. Yep, the doggies. Canterbury. Now, also worth noting, there's another Laban in this side too, another back rower, another one coming Stop through. It. What? Desmond Laban. Oh, man. Desmond. They Desmond. get a double Laban That's back a, row in yeah. a couple of years. Wow. Um, I mean, Warriors fans, we just talked about, you know, obviously not good that you had the loss, but not, not too worrying. The fact that in the first year, your younger sides are winning comps. Like, the Warriors, as a club, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say it, have never been in a better position. Yeah. Not and even close. Dare I say, four years ago, they were probably in the worst position a club's ever been. Living yep. out of a suitcase with no juniors, yep. with no home. Um, you know, Phil Gould walked out of the club. Peter O'Sullivan walked out of the club. Toddy Payton didn't want to sign as a coach, even though they wanted him at the time. It's actually amazing that they're in the spot. It's, it's incredible. In, yeah. It's incredible. It's like SJ's career was about to finish. Yeah. It's, they yeah. just signed literally New Zealand captain for Sharos, yeah. which is insane. How about getting that replacement? Oh. How are they going to replace, um, you know, AFB and then Bank? <laughs> There was only genuinely two humans on this planet they could have replaced him with. Yeah. But I, I would have gone, okay, fuck, well done. It also done. keeps their um, acronym numbers high as well. Yeah. Which is a like <laughs> for like, which is exciting. Um, well, I think that's why they didn't sign Payne Haas. It's because yep. he didn't have the... <laughs> not cut from the Didn't right fit cloth. the quota. Yeah, exactly. It's ran him out <laughs> well enough. Um, okay, now let's get to the next game. Dolphins defeat the Eels 44-6. to six. You heard that right. The Dolphins, 44-6. to six. Hey, can you translate that all? Uh, e <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that's the Dolphins are our mosh bounce back. The bounce back of the week is the Dolphins after a loss to their rivals, the Broncos. They went down, they went up to Darwin and absolutely tore the Eels to shreds. Um, mosh is a place to go for smarter hair loss treatment. Most men think the only option to try and combat hair loss is to spend a thousand dollars at clinics or thousands of dollars at clinics. Many don't want to go all the way to doctors. 
uh, about it. Well, times have changed. Moss is 100% online, so there's no travelling to doctors or clinics or pharmacies. Moss deals with every bloke on a case-by-case basis. Their Aussie doctors will give you real advice as to where you are on your hair regrowth journey, prescribe you what works for over 90-plus treatment variations that are delivered straight to your door, join over 30,000 other guys in Mosh hair regrowth family and get $50 off your first treatment with code bloke in a bar all one word at checkout completely customized totally online and cheap hair regrowth solutions for $45 a month smarter hair loss treatment all starts with a quiz at guestmosh.com.au if you're on the fence guys first of all Mosh support us so support them we really do appreciate that but also okay there'll be some banter from the boys there'll be a bit of banter but they love you baby they're going to be happy that you're happy they're going to be happy that you're happy so just give her a crack if it, if it makes you feel better about yourself. Uh, give it a crack. Don't worry about the boys having a bit of banter because uh, they love you and they'd be happy that you're happy. Uh, well, I hope so, or they're not really your mates. Um, okay, let's get into it. Dolphins. What? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What was that translating? Just dolphins? That was uh, just fins up, I think. Okay, loosely, okay. loosely, loosely, yeah. loosely translated. There's no word fins for up. word translation yeah. for that, but loosely that translates. <laughs> Uh, the Dolphins defeat the Eels. And I tell you what, what I love about this victory is that, look, <coughs> I get it. Sometimes when teams go into games and they've got a bunch of injuries, it is an excuse as to why they didn't win the game. But I do sometimes, and we're guilty of it too, we, we excuse teams for completely playing terribly um, when they have a couple of injuries. And what I like about this game is it shows you that that's just not the case. Like, you know, yes, key players are important, but we're forgetting that the 17 other blokes, they're all NRL players. Like, these are not players that are like, oh, yeah, just okay at footy. These are the best of the best in a top 30 squad. And the, uh, the Dolphins, um, ironically, they had a few players missing. The Eels had a couple players missing. One turned up to rip and tear, and the other didn't. And at the end of the day... Most of rugby league is about ripping and a tearing. That's it. That really is it. Ripping and a tearing. Uh, <laughs> and like, we tr- sometimes we try to overcomplicate things and we look for reasons why like, this didn't work or that didn't work and we look at stats and all that kind of st- At the end of the day, if you've got 17 blokes of, that have passed the, the test of being an NRL player, so they are good rugby league players, are willing to rip and tear for each other, that will usually beat a good side sorry, a side with good players in it that aren't committed to the cause. And we saw that with the Dolphins uh, on the weekend. Yeah, isn't it just a great mind of rugby league? Everyone's got two arms, two legs. If you want it more, you get it done. I mean, Plath, not a starting 13. They had the guy off the bench that was doing a debut, uh, Oren Keeley, which is one of the great names, Oren. Um, you know, you got Mark Nichols, who was, you know, a fringe kind of first grader coming off the bench for Wayne, but it was almost like the Wayne magic had made. He played outstanding. You got aging forwards in Jesse and Kenny Bromwich. Um, you got Kerr, who couldn't really get a start at the Dragons. You got Sean O'Sullivan, who you know, fringe heart. You know, like you're going through this roster. Then you got Tessie New, who's in and out of first grade. Jake Av- Avarillo got released from the Bulldogs. Trey Filler, Fuller, he's an older Queensland Cup. He's been killing the Queensland Cup. Jermaine Asako, not really wanted by the, You know what I mean? Like, we could, the list goes on. Mate, there's no one in this back line, probably outside of Jake Avrillo, that 18 months ago was a consistent first grader. And Jake Avrillo was let go by the Bulldogs. Yeah, and like, like it, it, even Cody Nicarima, like he was playing fullback for South, 5'8", bench, in and out of sides. Like, it's just, Isaiah Katar was in year 11. Yeah, yeah. It, it is an absolutely outstanding performance by the Dolphins. And what I love is, is they, they I think it was, they went into half time and were they down? Or at least it was a close match. In this one? 18-16? 8-4 down. 8-4 yeah. down. Yeah. Mate, from the 30th minute onwards, it was nine tries to one. Rando, Rando had a stat. Dolphins scored eight tries in 25 minutes. Their previous record tries in a game, obviously short history, is seven. So they beat it in 25 minutes. It's the seventh highest second half score in the NRL era. <clears throat> On top of that... Very unlike Jermaine Osako. He only kicked four from nine. Yeah. Imagine if he did his normal eight from nine. Mm. The, look, the most exciting for me thing for me, though, with this Dolphins and that performance, it's Katoa. It's Katoa. Like, if he go, keeps going like this, if he keeps playing like this, all of a sudden, when they get all their troops back, that team becomes a scary team because you don't just have, you know, 
like initially you had Sean O'Sullivan with Katoa. Katoa, obviously a rookie, you know, trying to learn his trade. Nick Karim has actually been quite good at six. Uh, I think he's been pretty good for the whole season for him uh, when he has played six. But if Isaiah Katoa can keep going on this trajectory, we're talking about a guy that's currently, you know, third or fourth in the Dali M's. That is this side with Katoa playing the way he's playing and everyone back in the side is a top eight footy side. You know, the most telling thing about Isaiah Katoa is when was the last, like he, he's what, a 19, 20 year old half back in the NRL. When was the last time you sat back and went, oh, fuck, he's overplaying his hand a little bit here? He's just pulling the right reins every <coughs> single time. It's it's insane. And once again, he wasn't picked in the round one side. Yeah, I, th- I think that was a 100% a good old fashioned Wayne play. Oh, yeah. joke from Wayne. Bloody oath it was. Yeah. But a heap of 19, 20 year olds would have fucking th- thrown the toys out of the cot. Mm. Oh, for sure. For sure. Uh, and just the. What I'm liking about his game is how well-rounded, like his kicking game, the like the length of his kicking game has improved immensely. He had 477 kick meters. He kicked 14 times. So I'm, I'm just loving the fact that he, he is fully taking control of this team. Like this is, at this stage, Katoa's team. And I'll be very surprised if by the end of the year, it isn't even more Katoa's team, which is like a scary prospect to think. Like right now, you know, you get this new half in, he's a rookie. He's learning his trade. Yeah, the boys who get behind him, they get around him for sure because you're a team and Wayne's telling you to. But you have to earn the right for some of these, you know, like Jesse Bromwich, she's playing he's the first ever bloke to play 300 games in the front row. You've got to earn the right to get those boys behind you. And if Katoa keeps playing like this, you know, Wayne's telling them to get around Katoa, but by the end of it, it won't be Wayne telling them to get around Katoa. It'll be the boys saying, no, no, he's our leader. We get behind him every day of the week. So what else is really exciting about the way he's going? Like, obviously, Wayne, this will be his last year as the coach of the Dolphins. Next year, Christian Wolf's going to be the coach. You're going to have Christian Wolf and Isaiah Katoa working together week on week. So good for Tongan Rugby League. Oh, massive. You're going to have the coach and the seven that are going to work together every single week. Going and what have we said about Tongan Rugby League for two decades and yep. probably the rest? They've had this incredible team, incredible forward park, great athlete, speed, they just haven't had the cool, calm head at halfback to get him around. They've got it. He's going to be a turning point of international <laughs> rugby league, I think. In five, six years, he's going to be scary with the with the especially with the young Tongans coming through saying, "No, nah, I want to play for Tongan Tonga rather than Australia." Um, another guy, Jeremy Marshall King. Mm. He was absolutely outstanding, and you know, not only was he outstanding in attack, he had thirty three tackles, zero misses, but. When he just selected a jump out of dummy half like that and just tear the game open, he was unbelievable. And again, like if you can get Jeremy Marshall King continuing to improve, Katoa continuing to improve. Initially, when the year started, I was like, I just don't know how they make the eight. With all these teams that have improved and signed, all that kind of stuff, now I'm looking there going with a red hot number seven that seems to be, you know, at the moment you say, what, at top five form seven in the comp? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it all of a sudden goes, okay, maybe they might play finals footy this year. There must be three or four coaches in this league that when they play the Dolphins, they must <laughs> there's only, there's only be a handful of guys that would look at Jeremy Marsh King and go, fuck, I should have signed him. Oh, yeah. Would he be the most improved player in the comp in the last two years? It was a halfback three years ago. Yeah. It's wild. Like, it'd be up there for sure. Yeah. Especially in a new position. Like, yeah. he'd be in the top five. Him alongside teammate Jermaine Sarko. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, bounce buck from here has been absolutely. Especially in a Wayne Bennett side, traditionally, he hasn't cared about Hawker. Mm. Yep. Mm. It's, actually, it's sad that Wayne's leaving next year, isn't it? Exciting that Christian Wolf's yeah, coming in. You want to see like, a few oh, more years with this roster, he's don't you? Building su- something it is, so special. It is going to be very interesting next year because, you know, history tells us that <coughs> teams post Wayne do struggle. Yeah. I, I hope it isn't the same up here and I hope that they've built something special enough. But next year, you're going to see them without Wayne. Jesse Bromwich gone. Uh, all the, the older guys that they signed are getting older. It's going to be an interesting few seasons. Uh, I want to give you a chat. Ewan Aiken, I thought he was outstanding. I really did. Just gets, you know, he had uh, 10 runs, 83 metres, 36 post contact, three tackle breaks, but 35 tackles, zero misses on the edge there. Uh, I think that um, I know at full strength, you've got Lemuelu, you've got uh, Kofusi, uh, you've got obviously Bromwich. But... Oh, there's something about you and Aiken's kind of mobile, robust ability that I really like on the edge with the speed of the game. Mm. I, I, I think he's locked that spot down. I, I don't think Lemuelu takes it back off him. Yeah, and you reckon uh, Kofusi on the other edge? 
I think so, yeah. I, I wouldn't be taking Aiken out of this side. Yeah, but like I think there's a lot of fans that would probably go, oh, well, will Lemuele go straight back in, Kofusi. Mm. But there's, there's a dynamic nature to Aiken's game in this fast-moving game that I just like. He just has – put it this way. I know <coughs> that he can take one-out hit-ups off the ruck, coming out of our own if he has to, and he can run like a centre or an outside back. But at the same time, I know as well in defence, he's going to be laterally as good as a centre was. Mm. There's just something about his dynam- dynamism that I really like. And when you, when you have a look at this, the side that they're that running works? with. <laughs> dynamism? Could you Google, Google that, please? Six again. Um, <laughs> on. When you have a look at the Read side. Read a book, you fucking losers. It's <laughs> <laughs> probably wrong. <laughs> when you have a look at the side they ran with on the weekend, like they had Sean O'Sullivan on the bench. When you've got guys like Plath and you and Aitken, and JMK can play multiple positions. I don't think you need to run with a, a utility. It's in perfect this side. for team dynamism, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> is it a word? It is. The quality of being characterized by vigorous activity and progress. Yeah. As I said, read a book, boys. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, speaking of dynamism, what about uh, Trey, <laughs> Trey Fuller? How yeah, cool was he? he? Just popped up out of nowhere. Another, Jeez. and that's why, like, sometimes when I see, you know, uh, you know, teams that are struggling in key positions. Like, Trey Fuller's been in the Q Cup, their player of the year for like three years, and you go, how come no one's gone and signed him and given him a, a preseason? Maybe they have, and I've just you missed can, it. You can see come in as 26? 27. 27. 27. 20, 27. Yeah. You yeah. can see the experience, couldn't you? Like, you mm. see most of the time it's a rookie coming in for a game like that, and their first, second NRL game, they're 19, 20 years old, and there's just errors across their game. Just... Firstly, just so much more physically ready. Like yep. he's quite short, but mm. some of his last man defensive efforts are outstanding. Oh, yeah. But just like he, his effort areas in behind the line for kicks was so good. He was brilliant. They yeah. had to get a special exemption for him to play on the weekend. Oh, as I well. did that. I'm was that sure. Did I hear that right on the? Someone had, that was for someone. They had a lot of guys obviously coming to fill in over the weekend. But he was elite. A line break, a line break, assist, a try, assist, seven tackle breaks, and a try. Not bad. Well, he he was my fullback of the week. After, mm. Before Reese Walsh come out and do what he did, and yeah. as you said, if that's true, they had to get an exemption for him. I mean, Isaka, Avrilo, and you are all guys that have played fullback in the NRL before that mm. Wayne could have gone with. Mate, I, I really like him because he just gets through a bunch of work as well. What I thought his debut last year against the Tigers was awesome. Remember yeah. he scored that hectic try off his second touch. Yeah, he was, yeah, he's two from two now. And like, like players like that, you know, have killed it in Q Cup for so long. Sometimes they just need an opportunity in first grade and playing a few games and. You know, we may not. We have only maybe scratched the surface of what he's capable of because he's probably playing within himself at the moment just to do his job in first grade. I tell you, if you, look, if you're desperate for a fullback at the moment, you look much worse than a bloke like him. And, like. and the the backing was there, obviously, from Wayne because the easy option was to go, all right, Cody did fullback. I saw no Sullivan into the halves. We went, no, nah, Trey full up, get him in. He's ready yeah. to go. He's outstanding, outstanding. Um, yeah. Great game from the Dolphins. Great game from the Dolphins. Um, uh, oh, yeah, s- special shout-out as well to Plath. How good was Max Plath? Yeah, he's an absolute gun. It was only two years ago he was playing halfback. In, is it called the Hastings Deer and oh, Deer and Cump, whatever it is up there? He, he was playing halfback and, like, kicked a field goal an extra time to win a grand final up there. Now to be playing lock. Um, yeah, we, we, we did that KO show a few weeks ago. and you know, it's Ray Stone doesn't give you much. When he was talking about Plath, he knew he was talking about one of his own. Yeah. Um, he definitely, as soon as you said Plath's name, he like lit up. Yeah, I thought he was like, going to kill me. It's terrifying. <laughs> um, but yeah, you could tell how excited he got about him. You, like, you just know that this Plath, they're going to pick him for origin in a couple of years' time, and I'm going to fucking hate him all over again because he's going to kill it 100%. He's a bloody good Plath that's for sure. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the psycho Plath, by the way, some of your best. Oh, thank I you. I was unappreciated earlier in the show, but just um. Yeah, look, a lot of the stuff I do, I feel is underappreciated, really mate. Really <laughs> Plethora of talent up there. Oh. Oh. <laughs> You're up, Timmy. <laughs> you Can't wait for his autobiography. I wasn't even listening, sorry, boys. <laughs> Can't wait for his autobiography. P is for psychoplath. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, so great win from the Dolphins. Great win from the Dolphins. Now it's time to talk about the Eels. Ooh. Ooh. Um. Yeah. Terrible performance. Um, to me, it looks like a side at the moment that is comfortable with kind of like where they're at. Uh, I think that even last year, it seemed outside looking in, I got no inside uh, kind of news, but it seemed like they were almost okay with missing the finals. Again, I'm, I'm sure they went and ripped and tear in the preseason. I'm sure Brad Arthur was filthy about it, but 
performance like that and, and just some of their performances this year, I don't feel like they're uncomfortable enough. I don't feel like they're on eggshells enough of like, like, I know you've got to create a good environment where everyone's happy, for sure. I get it. But at the same time, it, it does feel like there's players in the team that are, they're not concerned enough about having a bad performance. Because uh, on the weekend, that second half, like they just basically said, game's too fast, you know. Like some, some of the marker work, the game, I don't, I don't even, I think it was still in the balance. And like, there was no desperation to get back to marker. There was no like urgency to go, oh, I've, I've, you know, they've won the contact here. I better get around a marker. It was kind of like, eh, I won the contact. I did my job. I'm just going to lie on the ground or I'm going to take a little bit to get back to marker. There's so many occasions where I was just like, there doesn't seem like there's any desperation there. When I mean, you have a look at their forward pack, RCG, Junior, Sean Lyon, Bryce Carr, Jermaine Hall, good luck. Well, those guys walk into a starting spot in most NRL sides, I'd mm. say. Mm. And the, yeah. Because hey, you, uh, you have a look at their last three weeks, sorry, Kenby, but like, didn't fire a shot against the Raiders. Flat mm. as attack there. Played the Cowboys last week. Got up in that one. But I mean, you know, the Cowboys hindsight, played so bad. Exactly well. right. Yeah. Like, it's. <sighs> thank God they got that win last week. Because, like, yeah. you look at that forward pack, you got. RCG ran for 69 metres. Polo, I think he's the only bloke to run over 100 metres, 107. Lane, 73. Cartwright, 78. Hopgood, 86. Uh, Madison, 56. Offengau, 59. Like, oh man, with a full pack like that against a team. Like, this is, you know, no disrespect, but like, Bromwich, Nichols, Bromwich, Aiken, Plath, like, you should be not necessarily like blowing them off the park at all, but. Running more metres than they that. They should be winning the middle battle. Surely. Yeah. Surely. They're, uh, doing my head in the Eels because I really want to have a high opinion of them and like back you know, to make the eight because 117, they've got such a good roster. And even when you, you mention injuries, it's Mitch Moses. Like I don't think there's anything else there. Like Sevo's been dropped. I think uh, Kelmar to Alangi got dropped. There's They haven't won back-to-back -back this season and they, they annoy me because... They'll have a bad loss like this, and I reckon they respond this week against Manly. I think they'll be massive underdogs, and I think they're a big chance to cause an upset because uh, Arthur will give them a rev up, they'll fire up, they'll lift, and they'll put in a big performance. I really think they will, but it shouldn't take that. Like At NRL level, you shouldn't need a rev up and a bad performance to get going the next week. Maybe, and I think this is a weak excuse because the Dolphins contended with the same thing, but... You know, they started well, their first half was okay, and then they just put in a, a really terrible 25-minute effort where they lost the whole second half, conceded all those tries. But maybe the heat, the humidity up there in Darwin, obviously quite intense. You saw the players out there. there. From the get-go, they were just dripping. Maybe the heat just got to them, but again... But that's that's it, worse then. Yeah, Because oh, yeah, yeah. what you're saying is your Dolphins are mentally yeah. stronger. But, like, that's what it looked like. It looked like the heat got to them and they just hit an absolute wall. Yeah, but I mean... The heat get to him in Canberra two weeks ago? Well, it was the exact same <laughs> performance. Yeah, no, I'm not yeah. defending. I'm just yeah, saying yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. what it looked like. Yeah. I, I, I would love to ask a question to him. Honestly, like the heart of hearts. Do you really believe you're a premiership threat? Do you really want to win a premiership? It doesn't look like <laughs> it. Because like, watching them play this year, I don't know if in their heart of hearts they believe they're a premiership threat. Mm. Like I, I don't know if they do. Because I don't know if they put those performances in if they really felt that way. That's where I, I don't know. I'm getting this vibe where they kind of they, they look comfortable. They just look comfortable. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, that leads my you know, next point. Has Brad, Brad Arthur made them feel too comfortable? Uh, is are the Eels too comfortable with making a grand final a couple of years ago? Uh, I, th I think questions begin. Like I've been, mate. Anyone that listens to this podcast can attest to this. I think we all have. We've been pretty pro Brad Arthur, like enormously pro Brad. Enormously Arthur. pro Brad Arthur. Like any time anyone brought up any talk about should they go a separate way, a different way, whatever, we've shut that down immediately. I have to ask a question though: Is he the man to take him to a premiership, or at the very least, further? Because if they don't make the eight this year, now I'm not saying I don't think that he should be on the chopping block right now, but I am saying that if they have another year like last year, I do think that. Mm. questions as to whether he should be their coach next year absolutely should be raised yeah 100 percent. and you know sometimes sometimes coaches get sacked not because of actual performances but 
because maybe they're not the guy that can take that next step. Mm. Like you can be on the ninth step, but if you can't get him to the tenth, and you've got a guy that you think can, which once again could be a guy like Wayne Bennett, mm. then it might be the move to make. You have a look at the Cowboys when when they won their, won their comp years ago. Paul Green came in before that. Um, it was Neil Henry who was doing a great job. But the Cowboys made the decision. Okay. We think we need someone else to take us to that next level. They brought him in, same as you know Nathan Brown at the Dragons 15 years ago, doing a really good job, making finals, all that sort of stuff. They went, okay, Wayne Bennett's available. We think he can take us to that next step, and within two years he does. Oh, the thing, the thing, I'm like, if they were, you know, when they were finishing top four and playing in prelims, I c- I'll be like, no, no, like firing seems a bit hectic, a bit hectic. Um, now, look, obviously, if Wayne Bennett's on the market, you have to consider that. But, I mean, last year, they, they didn't make the finals. They're currently sitting 14th after seven rounds. They look like a shell of themselves. I, I just – they look like a team that got to the grand final and then just said, you know what, that was good. That was good. Yeah, and, you know, 100% Mitch Moses out. That really hurts. But, I mean, at the start of this season, if you would have said to me, hey, who would you rather have as your halfback, Dill Brown or Isaiah Katoa? I'm taking Dill Brown every day of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I think a good a good comparison is you know Broncos made the grand final last year, heartbreaking loss. They're missing Reynolds, Payne Haas, Pierre Cora, um, probably someone else, but we'll just say those three. And they're obviously missing players before. Does that look like a side that doesn't think that mm. they can win a premiership? Like they they look like even without those key players, they're like no no we're the best team in the, yeah. in the competition. Mm. So yeah. Mitchie Moses is looking better by the game that he misses. Like round one against the Dogs, smoked them 26-8. Doggies have been quite good since. Uh, narrow enough loss to the Panthers round two, then beat Manly round three. Uh, Moses injured after that, and they've lost three of four and been very ordinary. Yeah, oh, I just it's a, a pretty poor day for um, the Eels. I think that they'll, they'll bounce back, I think, this week. I mean, if they don't, then you really need yeah. to start asking some tough questions. Um but this team is better than that. Like, look at this forward. Like, this is the forward pack they had. Um, apologies. Junior Polo, who's still origin level. RCG, origin level. Sean Lane, gun back rower. Like, was in talks for origin a couple of years mm. ago. Uh, Bryce Cartwright, we know he's been playing some good footy lately. And then Jermaine Hopgood in the origin squad. Well, there's two origin forwards sitting on the bench. Joe O and Ryan Madison, two guys that have played origin. <laughs> Like, to me, that's just, man, that, yeah, anyway. You know what? Every single time that this conversation comes up about Brad Arthur and happens every two or three years, the players all seem to respond mm. during that period, which wouldn't shock me in the slightest if they do get up this weekend. They've got the Manly Seagulls, then they've got to buy two weeks to prepare for the Broncos. But have you got to make that decision soon? Like, how long do well, you... I think every time the conversation's come up, it's been unwarranted because they're playing prelims. So it's like... That they'd made, what have they made, like two or three prelims in a row? And that, those conversations were coming up. The conversations are coming up now because they're currently sitting 14th on the table, but also last year, they, what, they come ninth or something, 10th? That's where it's like, yeah. it is warranted. Yeah, I've, in all the years of, like, recent years saying he's been under pressure, I've never even thought he's been under any pressure or should Agreed. be under any pressure. Agreed. Now the people are saying that would just about, I'd imagine they'd be starting to say, oh, he should be gone. Mm. It's the first time I've ever gone, all right, like yourself, Kempi, there is a pr- bit of pressure building. Yeah, I, I, I'm not talking about right now, but I, it does seem to me like there's a, you know, from Brad Arthur down, and he, I'm not in there, I'm sure they worked hard in the off-season, but there seems to be in a comfortable environment. Like, mm. you know, no one is really, you, know, you don't want to be walking around on eggshells, but you do, you want to feel the pressure of premiership. You want to feel the pressure of, uh, and I, this is a good comparison because they made the grand final recently. But for example, when you watch, or when you see the Broncos come back into this year, did you, like they're not playing like a team that would be okay with not making a premiership run this year. <laughs> Whereas I feel like the Eels are kind of, playing a bit like if they don't make the grand final this year, uh, you know, that's what, that's the way they're playing. Now it's a long season. Things could change, but right now it was. They made the second week of finals threes in a row, then the grand final and then 10th last year. Yeah. So not the prelims, the so second week and then 10th last year. And then this year they're currently sitting 14th. Uh, 
a bad loss, obviously, for the Eels, but um, shout out to Brad Arthur, who uh, successfully broke his own record for most bottles of water consumed <laughs> whilst coaching an NRL match, uh, which he said at the same venue last year. So, little silver lining there. He's very well hydrated. He's hydrated. Saying. Yeah. He's the hydrated. Of, the th- face of Mount Franklin. Yeah. Gets through plenty. So, hopefully, we see a bounce back um, because they've got the team to do it. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Eels. I love when they're playing good footy, they are so bloody good to watch. Uh, hopefully, they can bounce back. And hopefully, by the end of the year, you know, they're in finals footy and we're looking back. At, you know, this was the turning point for them. Uh, the crazy thing is, though, we're getting close to like round 10. Like, it's, mm. not, it's not round four or five, you know, round seven. We're in round eight. Mm. Like, it's getting close to the, the kind of period of the year where you go, okay, we kind of get a feel for where each squad really is for the year. I know there's always an outlier like your roosters that end up coming up and killing it, but getting to the business, like not business end, sorry, but like you can no longer say it's the start of the season, put it yeah. that way. And this is where it, like it could get tough for Parramatta without Mitch Moses. Like I'm, I'm not sure the, how it lines up with when exactly he's meant to return, but he could return and then go straight into origin camp mm. and be gone for another yeah, six imagine. weeks. Yeah. That would suck. Let's not imagine. I reckon it's quite likely that that could occur. Mm. He'd be in my side, I think, if he's available. I'd have Hines at six. Interesting. <laughs> you take Moses in one game. I'd seriously, well, probably I mean, one I'd game, it, but uh, if, if he has a few, yeah. Because he's due back one game before. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's one game. If he has a few, yeah, if he mm. kills it, has a few, yeah. fucking oath. Like, absolutely, I'd consider him. But one game, heading into game one origin, ooh, that's a big mm. ask. Yeah, fair. yeah, due back round 12. Round 12, okay. But uh, even then, like, if we were to lose game one, would it really shock you if New South Wales brought him in for game two? Oh, absolutely two and not. Then, like, Honestly, I'd even consider him with one game. Mm, like, if he yeah. comes out in that game, one game, and abs- absolutely puts yeah. on a clinic, then you go, okay, let's let's look at it. Um, but anyway, we'll see. Hopefully they can bounce back. I, I hate, you know, just same with the Demetrio stuff and the Robbo stuff. Like, I hate talking about, you know, coaches being under pressure, but this is, we have to give our opinion on this stuff, unfortunately. Um, okay. Now, on to the next game. Don't forget, KO. All the games can be watched on KO. Uh, there is also plenty of other great content you can watch across so many different sports. Make sure you jump on KO to watch all your teams play. Plus, you can watch so many other different... Like, seriously, the amount of content on KO is unbelievable. It's the best ever. Um, Panthers defeat the Tigers 22-6. to six. Uh, Like, just a good... If there was ever a Panthers win, this was it. You know, the game is tight for most of it. They just grind and grind and grind and grind. And then eventually the points come. Eventually the points come. So much so that I think, so when you look at the try scored, so basically uh, they were winning what, it two tries to one until the 63rd minute. So A, it was a very Panthers-esque win. But B, I think the score does kind of make Tigers look worse than they play it. I thought the Tigers really hung in there. Um, yeah, okay, they, they, certain areas of the game they can prove, of course. But I, I thought they showed a lot of fight, the Tigers. I really did. I thought the Tigers looked good, and I thought, you know, there was obviously a controversial moment in this game um, that, geez, if that would have gone the other way, I reckon the Tigers are a red-hot sniff. Let's just get straight into that controversial moment. How did that not go the other way? What are we talking about here? Yeah. What are we – what? How is that not 10 in the bin? Yeah. Yep. And a potential penalty tries, not in front of him. Like, what planet are we on? I, I just don't get it. Like, I hate to be so harsh on the bunker, but it's like, what are you looking at that I'm not looking at? Am yeah. I, have you got, and they always like, they hear this, oh, there was another angle. Bro, I saw an angle and I saw his hand, hit his leg. Boom, 10 in the bin, professional foul. I don't get it. And that's where it's so frustrating. You know, if, if the referee live doesn't make that call, sure, that's but when fine. it went that's upstairs, fine. how do you look at that and come up with any other possible result? It's 10 in the bin since eternity. When has that not been 10 in the minute? Yeah. yeah. You tackle to go without the ball. That's what? essentially what happened. Yeah, in 30 years of watching footy, I thought like the the no try the other week when Edwards was blocked from behind the post. Uh, <laughs> oh. Joey Marty, I thought that was the worst Clyde I'd ever seen. Might have been eclipsed because, again, if it just went in play and they missed it, so be it. But when it went up to the video ref and it was not seen, I'm like, in what world is that not? Absolutely bizarre. Like, you can see the guy fall over. So it's not like the thing is, okay, if it was like happened on the edge of the screen or something and you just like weren't looking at that or something, I don't know. It's right there. What was the score at the time? Did, we, did anyone yeah, know? I think it was like two tries to one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was oh. like a close game. Yeah. Yeah, Panthers probably. It was in the balance. It like, was... put it, like, odds wise, Panthers probably go on to win. But 
Tigers were robbed of a fair opportunity to beat the Panthers. And at that point in the game, you said the Tigers were right in it, uh, playing great football against 12 men. Why couldn't they have capitalised? And if they score on that play, yeah. they're winning. Yeah. They're winning yeah, with, with a one-man advantage. Four ten to go. Yeah. Like, I just I don't get it. I don't understand. It's uh, like, look, some of these other calls where it's, you know, touch and go and you're like, oh, okay, maybe this was the right call. Like, you know, even the, the like, it was a terrible call, the giant, the, uh, the, um, the Manu, the Manu Edwards, so, sorry, Hargreaves Edwards. Yep. Where he went oh, through yeah, the line. Yeah, yeah Hargreaves yeah. Edwards. That one is okay. Okay. It's insane. Like you're being an insane person, but at least there's a backing. Okay. He went through the line. Was he obstructed yeah. from running his line? Yes. He, yes, he kind of was. Okay. That's why he gave it. Please give me your explanation. Like, what were you thinking yeah. when you saw his hand touch his leg? Are we saying it's okay to do that now? So next week, if someone, if there's yeah, a two on one, I, break, we just take one of them you out. You just have to ankle tap him, not that tackle him. That's fine. Tigers were up 6 0. <laughs> they were up 6 0 at the time. Oh. Yeah, and it was in the 11th minute, and oh. the Penrith Panthers scored in the 15th minute through oh. Taruva. They then scored in the 26th minute through Taruva again. So it was a big turning point. And like you're the Tigers, you're desperate for wins. Yeah. Like you're desperate for anything you can get. Exactly. When it's, when it's a team like us versus a team like that, everything's got to kind yeah. of go your way. If you get stitched up on a few, couple of them, you, you really no hope. So very disappointing. What I did like though is that that happened and I'm sure on the field you're going, are you kidding me? But they managed to get it together. They hung in there till the 63rd minute. And then obviously a few tries were scored. But, you know, I thought the Tigers were really um, – Gallant. What I liked as well. Uh, we'll talk about Tigers first, and we'll get into the um, get into the Panthers. Like Lockie Galvin against a, a Panthers side like this, this juggernaut, this kind of like Mike Tyson, scary kind of. Just when they get on the field, you must honestly. It must be like the the early two thousands or late nineties with the Broncos. It must be like you know two thousand seventeen with the Storm, where you're just going, "How do we do this? Like how do we do this?" There wasn't an ounce of fear in that bloke. Like he was like. I don't care. Yeah. I'm just going to rip and tear and hopefully I, you know, I can do something. Liam Martin coming out, either Terminator and so, no, he's sweet. Yeah, all good. 14 tackles, only one miss. And you telling me he wouldn't have been a spot all week for the Penrith Panthers going, let's run some traffic at this young fella, see what he's made of. Um, love that from Lockie Galvin. Uh, uh, in regards to other players, it's kind of a negative, but Dream Buller, obviously he had a lot of effort for sure. Um, Really, and it's actually been quite surprising because, you know, he's, in his rookie year, I thought his ball playing was okay, but he, I feel like he's regressed a little bit with his ball playing. I think he really needs to work on that, like, a lot. Yeah, threw one or two straight out when there was something on um, over the sideline. Yeah, um, and I've noticed as well for the whole year that his ball playing just hasn't been anywhere near probably what an NRL standard fullback Didn't you be. because the Tigers were so poor last year and when from the minute he came in, he just looked exceptional this year the Tigers put up some really brave performances looking a bit better in attack and certainly regressed mm. Mm. whether it's like you know you could say that it's a case of you know oppositions working him out a little bit in that but when you're a fullback you sort of get these opportunities where you don't really get worked out like if you get your three yeah. on twos or you get the offload and you get your support play the opportunity should still come but he without being it doesn't mean bad but no. not what we were sort of expecting to come on from you two yeah so who's really impressed me, mate? I reckon he might be one of the better bench forwards in the game. Samuel Afainu. He's been oh, yeah. And if I'm yeah. the Penrith Panthers looking to poach yeah. a front row forward from the Tigers, for the money that it sounds like you have to pay Stefano, I'd be looking at Finu. Look, let's get into that. Can we please <laughs> just refrain from saying Stefano's a million-dollar front row? A lot? Come on. We are the number one fans of Stefano. And look, if he can get that contract... The market demands what the market demands. I'm not sitting here. If he if he does sign that contract, then that's what he's worth for sure. But like, Stefano is still learning his game. He's still progressing as a forward. He's not. He's not worth. Obviously, he's worth whatever the market will pay him. But like, from a purely analytical perspective, he's not worth a million dollars. Like Stefano ran for 75 meters on the weekend. Like a million bucks. And I get it. His manager's got a job. But in the media, if you're throwing out this stuff, like. Sometimes you ask, like, do you, do you watch league? Like, are you watching them play? Stefano is a really talented young forward that's 23 years old or so that I have no doubts that maybe by the time he's 25, 26, he could be worth that. But right now, if you got him on the open market, you're probably looking at, like, what, six, 700K max, in my opinion. I wouldn't pay seven. Yeah, so yeah, I think six is... Yeah. Million's outrageous. Like, like absolutely outrageous. Yeah, 
six, six, seven. If you're a club that needs a big bopper in the yep. front and you're and you're willing to pay, if you're the doggies attention. and you're desperate for middle, maybe yep. seven. What do you reckon? Yeah, I reckon probably about that as well. I don't, I don't think a million bucks. He's definitely got a lot of good ingredients, and it can be really damaging. But just a few things at the moment. A lot of errors, like you know, kind of when, when we get a penalty and get down the end, probably two weeks in a row, there's been first hit up, bang. He's just kind of lost the ball. Got to be a little bit better in those sort of areas, I think. Yeah, to, well, you know. yeah, that, 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 that's the other moment in this game when they got that penalty. They kick for touch. He took a fantastic first hit up, broke the line, bent the line, and then just a loose carry. Mm. Drop ball like I, I at that point I thought the Tigers were actually going to get back into this game and that one just turned it. And I think like to be extremely clear here, you know, media people that say these headlines, you're not making Stefano's life any easier. Mm. You're actually making it way worse because mm. the problem is you say Stefano a million dollars, then fans associate with that and they say to him, "You're not worth a million dollars." Like how, how dare you? And Stefano's gone. I friggin' never said that. I'm just playing footy, doing my best. Someone else said that about me because I'm sure he's probably sitting there going, no, no, I'm still learning my game. Like, I'm still, you know, I'm 23. Like, yes, there are pain houses, there are Tino, but I'm a 23, 24-year-old front rower that is getting better each year because he is. He's definitely developing, but there's still parts of his game that he has to develop. So the people that come and say these outrageous things... All you're doing is making this young fella's heart life way harder, way harder. And what an unfair week to do it, to bring out whether he's a million dollar player or not conversation, the week he goes up against Fish and Liotta. Yeah, it's just unfair on the young fella. Like, give, like, it's all well and good. Like, if he's played really good footy, give him raps and, and we do that all the time. We give him raps and that. But like, to say something so absurd, all it does is make his life harder. And now there are going to be fans out there that are watching him. And if he doesn't play like a million dollars worth player, they put shit on him. Just what happened on the weekend, but no, like even Payne Haas in that grand final, he was incredible. But you went through and you read the stat sheet; it was still below what he normally does, simply because these two front rowers are so bloody good. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, I just had to get that in. He's still got a lot of good ingredients there, Stefan. I'm a big fan of him. Uh, good opportunity this week up against uh, your boys, Kempi. Absolutely. I got uh, no test. Like I am pretty confident Stefano will be one of the better front rowers in the game. Just give the young fella time. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean he can be play poorly. Mm. Um, I actually think he's had one of his better starts to the year. Obviously, a bit quiet this game. But, again, you're against friggin' Penrith Panthers. They do it to every good forward. Yeah, every good forward. But outside of that, like, last few weeks, he's been pretty bloody good. Yep. Yeah. I said it before, but just keep an eye on this Samuel Lafayne off the bench. He is absolutely killing it for the Tigers at the moment. Yeah. You're talking a million dollars, Fainu. <laughs> Big call, Guru. <laughs> Huge call. Huge call, Guru. <laughs> now, what I love about Fainu as well is that aggression. He comes on, he's all elbows, he's all gusto and he's in your face. And you spoke about it a few weeks ago, but there was a bit of a push and shove in the under-19s New South Wales-Queensland yeah. game. And there was one bloke at the front of it and it was Fainu. Uh, and that's what you need off the bench. You need impact, you need energy. Um, and he's delivering that in spades. But my biggest worry coming around from coming away from that 19s was, yeah, he's got aggression, but he doesn't know how to control himself. Mm. Benji seems to have just tapped it in the perfect spot at the moment. Yep. Absolutely. Also, he played bloody 59, nearly 60 mate, minutes. Mate, when he's available, he plays huge minutes coming off the bench. And imagine, like, in a few years as he bulks up, yep. how much more damaging he's going to be. Um, Another guy who's kind of rain, reined it in a little bit this week to, compared to a couple of the other weeks was uh, Johnny Bateman. I thought he was at a, a yeah, better game this week. a couple week. of errors, but again, he does what we know Bateman can do. It's just like gets involved yeah. and makes shit happen. Yeah. yeah, But they were errors trying to win the game yeah. of yeah. football. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's like, I'll cop that. Because at least something's happening around Johnny Bateman, mm -hmm. uh, and you're right, he did rein it in quite a bit in regards yep. to the, all the the. the, the, okay, so the Speaking of not reining it in, what about this Seafarth? He is a lunatic. Who are we talking about? Alex, Alex Seafarth. Oh, he's a Seafarth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I love it. He's yeah. a lunatic. Again, you need that. You yep. need that uh, aggression off the bench. Uh, so look, I don't think it was that bad of a performance from the Tigers. Um, you know. When you look at the Penrith juggernaut, you look at where the Tigers are in development, 22-6 with a really tough call against them, that's not that bad. Mm. It really isn't. Like, let's say we all agree that Penrith Panthers are premiership favourites right now, probably by a substantial margin. If you lose 22-6 after such a tough call, I think you'd probably be happy with that. Like, even without the tough call, you'd probably go, yeah, it's all right. I think it's a great result travelling out there. Keep in mind, they're also fresh off the bye. They're ready to rock. I think it's yep. a huge result. Uh, now, onto the Panthers. Um, yeah, look, obviously all the 
the same old stuff that we say every week about the Panthers. Yeah. Um, but I will say, I thought uh, to Oz just work out of his own end, like was absolutely outstanding. I know he does it every single week, but we still got to mention it because otherwise it's almost disrespectful to him. You know, yeah. like we talk about all these wingers and how well they're playing. To'o comes out and does it each week and we just go, oh yeah, that's To'o. But I have to mention it. 21 runs, 229 metres, 82 post contact, eight tackle breaks, four tackles, zero misses. Um, you know, I thought he was outstanding. Also, I want to give a shout out. Tungle's defence. Holy shit. 30 tackles, only two misses. Um, they're just such a well-balanced side. Like, even when they're not at their best, even when it's not as the scary Penrith that we know, they just stick to the game plan. They find ways to just like, it's almost like they probe at times. They're just probing like, where's your weakness at? Where's your weakness at? They identify it mid-game and they just go, boom, there it is. We'll find it and we'll nail it. When you look at the guys leading the competition for post-contact meters, tell me which one stands out. Tarpanay, Carrigan, Fanua Blake, Brian Tottle. <laughs> It's definitely Carrigan. It's definitely Carrigan. <laughs> it's Carrigan. <Yeah. laughs> it's incredible that he's there. I can't believe it. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Toto, like, yeah, he's one of the greatest swings ever. He's That's like a it. golfer off screen. He just plays with handicap every week. Every so, okay, week. He set the tone. Yeah, you want to hear something even more wild? He's the only one out of that guys that's played six games. The rest of them have played seven. <laughs> that is actually wild. That is actually wild. Um, let's talk about Isaiah Yo. Another guy. That plays so well, so consistently. He uh, has a try assist, 18 runs, 159 metres, 48 post contact, a tackle break, a line break assist, two offloads, 47 tackles, only one miss. I mean, the numbers this guy puts up every single week. And it's also, it's all high quality. You know, we're not talking about, he's not a stat patter. Like, you don't, you never watch an Isaiah Yo go on, man, what a stat patter. Like, he's just taking two hit ups a set just to pat his stats. Like, every time he runs, Usually, it's either the team needs a tough carry or he's got shape around him. He's looked. He said, okay, the shape's not on. Okay, I'm going to try and bend the line. And he bends the line. He is just – he's so well-rounded. He's so consistent. And I tell you what, if you had said to me when he first started in his first couple of years of NRL that this is a player he turned into, I would have said, you, are, you have got rocks in your head. You have got rocks in your head. Like, he's a good, solid NRL player that can fill in, do a job in multiple positions – to turn into the player he is now, like a key cog. Like if, you know, if Nathan Cleary is a 10 out of 10 importance to that side, he honestly might be a 9 out of 10. Like that's how important he is to that side. <laughs> it sounds stupid, but just like his understanding of the game and just how he just, he always pulls the right rein. Like you could play him at halfback. You genuinely could. Mm. Outside of the kicking game, just the way he... He he's never he's makes a bad decision. He has well. kicked it for a few <laughs> years. Oh, yeah. so. But like he would be so much higher up the halfback rankings than what he should be. Just because yeah. he's just so smart. It's actually crazy how good he is um, in regards to like he's not his pass selection, his run selection. Yeah. It's just mental. And like if you're, you know, you, we, we've seen a few over the last few years who have come in to replace um, Nathan Curry when he's got injured halfbacks and all these clubs scramble to sign him. Like if I was scrambling to sign one of these halfbacks, I want to see them play without Isaiah Yo before I sign them. He's only 29 as well. 229, 20, <coughs> sorry, 226 NRL games. So super durable. But the role he plays, he's got a few left in him. Mm. Jeez. He's, yeah, he's bloody outstanding. Um, to be critical, I actually thought my boy Mitch Kenny, a uh, bit messy mm. this game. Bit distracted after his Q&A on Instagram. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's Scotty Sorensen uh, Q&A. Yeah, um, a little bit messy this game. Quite a few errors. Um, and I just didn't think he was at his usual, you know, like he gets through the dog work each week so well you usually don't notice him. Um, but when you're noticing him for like errors or penalties or whatever, I didn't think it was his best game on the weekend. If, if I'm being hypercritical of the Panthers, he wasn't bad by any stretch, but... Yeah, but you could tell that he wasn't happy with himself either. Yeah, it definitely wasn't his best game. Definitely wasn't his best game. Um, outside of that, who stood out for you boys? Alamotti? Alamotti? Yeah, real handful. Um, got through the line a couple of times there. It was pretty good. 14 runs, 139 metres, 30 post cons. I thought, yeah, he really asked some questions there. Kind of um, got through Brent Naden a couple of times. Um, I thought he was good. Uh, not directly about this game, but just something that I thought was interesting. And it was I, I watched it, uh, I think, two weeks ago. T Taylor May put out like a, a vlog or something of what, what he was doing. Did, did you see it by any chance? No, I didn't watch all of it. I watched it like a little snippet. He took um, whoever was filming on the camera he took him down to a park in penrith that had like um all the bars and mm. everything 
and he was showing him the, the workout he was doing, he, you know, and he'd say, oh, you know, you do 25 of these. And the guy on the camera would go, 25? And he'd go, mate, Isaac Tungo does 40 of them. Then he got to dips and he said, 30 of these or whatever. And he goes, 30? He goes, mate, Tungo does 50 of them. Really? Just wow. everything he said was just Isaac Tungo does. And, and like, when, when you look at how strong this guy is. Oh, mate. I think the, 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 there was some quote in there about how Isaac Tungo in the process doesn't really touch weights. He just does all the bars and everything. Stuff, yeah. yeah. There is a lot of uh, science coming out now that, you know, may, like weights are usually for your like explosive stuff, but there's a bit of science coming out. You'd rather balance your body out and be strong. Like, for example, Greg Inglis, I think, is a perfect example. Of that. Obviously, Greg Inglis is a giant. Like, that's not. But every time that fen would come out, he would be perfectly balanced. And so there is a bit of, like, for example, um, Tom Brady, and I know he wasn't in a contact position, but Tom Brady, if you watch the documentary with the Patriots, they had real issues because his coach, who, you know, there are some dodgy things with his coach, but his coach, like, basically there were a lot of weight stuff that Tom Brady didn't do. It was all kind of body weight. Mm. And then, you know, Gronk, um, he stopped doing, like, deep squats and stuff like that. And, you know, the, the Patriots had an issue with that because he wasn't doing it. Anyway, so long story short, there is a bit of science out now coming out that you may not need to lift as heavy um, as we initially thought, or mm. not necessarily as heavy, but as, as higher reps as we would – like. Put it, the old thinking, or at least the traditional is, is like lift as heavy and as much as you can. That's the old school way of thinking. Just get in there and fucking get big and strong. Whereas there is a bit of um, science to suggest that may not be necessarily the best for rugby league because it is such an 80-minute game that you need to be. Yeah, and I, I, I think it was back in the day, like Desi Hasler and uh, Wayne Pierce swore by that. They were two of the fittest guys in rugby league for a long time. Yeah. Well, I, I've always been of the mind, like, you don't get me wrong, there's always a place for heavy lifting because you need that, that that extra strength in contact and stuff. But I was always of the mind that whatever the frame is kind of made for, don't go that much far past that. Yeah. Like if it's made for about your 85 kilos-ish and that seems to be the good sweet spot, don't try to add on an extra five kilos of muscle because it's just not going to work. Now, speaking of being an absolute unit, if you want to go back and watch a unit, go back to minute 9.30, Papali'i flies out of the line to hit Alamotti and just goes, just hits a brick wall. Alamotti finds his front, <laughs> plays the ball. Mate, he is a brick shit house, Alamotti. Mate, Al Alamotti coming through, I was talking about before. Like, he was an absolute juggernaut in the juniors. No mm. one could fucking touch him. Mm. Comes into Canterbury last year, and, you know, we, we spoke about, about it a lot last year. And if you just watch him there, you go, slow, sluggish. Mm. You know, like just he just he didn't really impress at any point at Canterbury. Not last year, didn't. Not know. last year, no. Nah. And like we had this conversation, and I, I like I remember having this with you, and I just kept saying, "Mate, you should have seen him in the juniors. He was, he was in unbelievable. Throws on a Penrith jersey in one week, and looks a million bucks. You yeah. knew it was going to happen. You knew it was going to happen. Yeah. Mm. But even when it happened, I still went, "Fuck, are you serious? Yeah, yeah. He yeah. could win Dalliem Centre of the Year this year at the Panthers. Sign with a new club, and I'd be like, "Oh, let's see how this goes." Yeah. Mm. He just is a perfect fit for him. He's yeah. a perfect fit for him. What a, I mean, shrewd signing. You get this guy that killed it through the younger grades. For some reason, just seems to be thrown to the, oh, yeah, not good enough. It's like, mate, he's like 19 years old. Mm. He's so much to learn. Goes to the Penny Panthers as his first game. Now, it's obviously he needs to play more, much more than this to see if he is NRL standard, but best game of his career, and it's the first game for the Panthers. And, you know, now you've got him as the next guy up. Like, the third guy up is Tyrone Peachy. That's it crazy. blew the comp away every time he came in last yeah. year. Yeah. Scary stuff. Two, um, two for me quickly, Kempi, before we move on. No, 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 we're going to go. I'll see you, I'll joke. I'll show myself out. Yeah. Uh, Dill Edwards, just three weeks without Nathan Cleary. He's lifted so much. in so, Like, not an entirely new role, but, you know, he always sits and plays that sweeping role on the right side, and that's his job there. But with Cleary out, he's taken it upon himself uh, to increase his role in attack. Three weeks without clear, he's had four try assists, three tries, a couple of contributions on top of that. He's kicked goals at a good nudge. He's just been terrific. And it just d does make me think, like, he's such a good role player at Penrith. I'd like to see him as the main attacking weapon in a spine at another club, mm. you know, where he starts playing a lot more down the left. He sweeps both sides because I, I do wonder how good he can be he at another club not saying he's going to go anywhere and i don't mm. think he will because he's perfect for the pen with panthers but he's just been unreal yeah he's been unreal and you know he's such a similar fullback for teddy to teddy i think like obviously teddy is has a way more, better career and achieved way more blah blah, blah. so i'm not saying he's on teddy's level but i do think that 
if you sat there and said, well, he plays similar to Teddy, so why does Teddy have to take a back seat and Dylan Edwards doesn't? But I think Dylan Edwards picks his – like he, it's very clear that Dylan Edwards, when he's told what to do or whatever, not to say that Teddy isn't, but Teddy's the captain. Whereas Dylan Edwards, I feel like he, he does all the heaps of runs and everything like that, but when the set gets to rolling, he goes exactly where – Cleary or whoever tells him to get yeah, to. Yeah, when they're attacking the 20. Yeah. And that's it. Like, like Teddy, his yardage coming out of his end, his kick returns, you know, he'll often take the second or third tackle, just coming out of the end and just getting through those metres. Mm. But you're right. When he gets the 20, he goes, all right, I am the sweeper, running off Nathan Cleary when he's there, on the right edge, doesn't spend a lot of time on the left. Mm. That's his job and he nails it perfectly. Yeah. He doesn't overplay at all. It, yeah, he doesn't overplay. And, and usually, like... Yeah, he just he just gets into the line and he's a cog in the wheel, um, and it's very clear that even on the weekend that he's you know taking on more responsibility. It's still extremely clear that Schneider is the one that's getting the boys around the park. That Luai is you know like the the pecking order is extremely clear in regards to that. And, with and, Edwards. and that's the other one there um, that we haven't sort of touched on. But Brad Schneider's just come in three weeks, struggled to get a game at the Raiders, but thirty four tackles on the weekend. It's not an one entirely. One. It's not an entirely. It's not an entirely difficult job, but he's just gone in there like everyone does. Next man up mentality at Penrith. He's kicked well enough, defended well enough, got him around the park. He's, he's been good last yeah, year. Yeah, and what I find so impressive is that he's kicked four hundred and sixteen meters. Luai kicked kicked for three ninety seven. Like their ability, just to carry the load of Cleary. Like Cleary obviously usually is the the dominant kicker, but their ability to go, okay, Cleary's not here. Now we can't expect Schneider to just be Cleary. So, Edwards, Luai, we need you to pick up that slack to a degree. Like, Edwards, we need you a bit more hands-on in attack. Luai, we need you to kick a little bit more. Like, just all those little things that go unnoticed. Like, they both kicked, had 12 kicks each. Like, yeah. that is unbelievably precise on picking up the slack of what... Like, clear is, like, number one attacking asset is arguably his kicking game. And they've gone, you know what, we're just going to split it down the middle. We're not going to put too much pressure on either guy and just get the job done. And they absolutely nail it. Uh, so, mate, uh, I agree with you. I think Dylan Edwards has been outstanding. I think right now, if you're not going to put Tommy Turbo at fullback, I think he's out and out the front runner. Um, right now, I'd almost be shocked if he wasn't selected at fullback for New South Wales if you aren't going to put Tommy mm. back there. Uh, thoughts on that, boys? Yeah, I don't hate it. Yeah, oh, look, I'd never been an advocate of Edwards for fullback, but Teddy's not playing at the level I sort of want. And we've got enough attack in that team that you know, so I said I'd have Turbo one. If he's playing centre, then. Probably Dylan Edwards, yeah. Probably. I mean, who else is playing anywhere near his it's level right drinky, now? It's not drinky because I think defensively he's there, a bit rocks and diamonds. Uh, like I know Maddie mentioned Gutho could do a job, probably a similar job to Edwards to be fair, but it's probably Dylan Edwards. Yeah, I just think Dylan Edwards, the fact that he plays with Cleary is a huge one because uh, yeah. Cleary was asked, and I think you said this last week, Rue, maybe Maddie Johnson, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, two peas in a pod. <laughs> but basically, Cleary was asked, "Who's the most important player for you? Like, who helps you the most?" He said, "Dylan Edwards." Mm -hmm. And then, and I think it was Maddie that was saying, "I was expecting Isaiah Yo as an answer," but it's Dylan Edwards. One of the great talkers. When so, like you know, we talk about Billy Slater's importance to Cameron Smith and the boys in the Queensland side. Maybe Edwards is that to, you know, to Cleary. Yeah. So we'll see, we'll see. Uh, and I'm, I'm agree with you. I was actually quite, <clears throat> last year, I was very much that, uh, Edwards is just very similar to Teddy. If you're going to play someone, you put Teddy in there. But I think he's gone to a whole new level this year. I think Edwards has been outstanding yep. this year. Um, and also, I think his ball playing is getting better. And I think he's, is. His, his pass selection is getting better. His lines are all getting better. I think he's, yeah, he's just improving. Feels like a match guy, Edwards. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, he is origin made. Like, that's the kind of guy that's, Suits Origin. If he, he played comes the in and plays, the he's a dollar one to run for over 250 metres in that game. Guaranteed. Like, he played a grand final with a broken foot and they won. So, um, yeah, definitely can see him uh, playing Origin if you aren't going to go with Tommy. Hasn't Tommy just been killing it? But we just go, yeah, that's Tom Dravojevic these days. Right. Where does, um, and if you want to move on, by all means, but where do you think Jerome Lewis sits as far as Origin this year? Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because he's been playing all right footy and he... Yeah. Because, I mean, if we're all of a sudden going Edwards at fullback, <coughs> which I'm okay with, you're going clear at seven, 5'8 jerseys up for debate. If you go Isaiah Yo at 13 as well, like... Yeah. 
Oh, I see what you're saying, like the logic. And I'm it. not saying I agree with it. I just, I just, it's just an interesting talking point. I, I don't know. For some reason, I just feel like in Origin, it just – even though he had a great debut series, he really did. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm, for some reason, I'm just not picturing it. Mm. But at the same time, that's almost like, well, hang on a sec. We're talking about a guy that plays a lot with Cleary, has had a pretty good start to the year. But then I think of either Hines or Moses in that six years, and I go, oh, maybe they could offer just a little bit more in Origin – I don't know. I don't know. It's a fair point. Which, like, at the end of the day, realistically, like, I think Jerome Luai has delivered on much bigger stages than the other two. What do you reckon, Tim? I don't hate the Luai call, but I just – I think he's been okay this year. Mm. I've actually thought their left edge at the Panthers has been quite stunted in attack and quite clunky. Like, they're scoring 18% of their tries down the left. They're going 59% on the right. I don't think the outside backs there are seeing a lot of quality ball. Um like, if they do go with all those Penrith combinations, and let's say Edward Tolls the fullback, all right, there's an obvious case for it. We have this convo every year, don't we? Yeah. But I prefer Hines or Moses. And also, I think, you know, Luai, who's been pretty solid for me personally this year, like pretty solid. Um, Hines, I think, has been great this year. Mm. Uh, and Moses was outstanding when he was playing. Mm. Um, but it's a, it's a fair shout. If you want to go, you know, fully down the route of, okay, we are going to play Penrith footy, clearly get the job done. You know, it wouldn't be too crazy. I think he, he is the forgotten name. He really is. Like, why isn't he eligible? Like, why isn't he being talked about having that six jersey with, you know, Moses being injured, Cody Walker not playing that as well as he could? Um, so, fair shout. Fair shout. All righty, before we get into the next game, don't forget May 6, 2024, bloke jersey is dropping. That is right. May 6, 2024, bloke jersey will be dropping. Set aside your shekels. You do not want to miss it. Plus, we've got other stop, other stuff that I'm not going to announce yet. Stuff that I'm not going to announce yet. But it is a big, big drop, guys. You do not want to miss it. We've got a limited supply as always. And as you know, once those jerseys are gone, they are gone. They are absolutely gone. So make sure to be there at 6 p.m. on the 6th, May 6th, for the bloke jersey drop. It's our biggest drop of the year, so you don't want to miss out. Also, store shout-outs for Bloke Beer, Bombardieri Supercellers, Nova Discount Liquor, who have a ripper special on at the moment for Bloke Beer, and Harrigan's in Cameron Park with their footy and a fade on during Thursday night game, $30, and you'll get a schooner bloke and a haircut. Manly defeat the Titans, 34-30. to 30. Um, Definitely a, a mixed bag. Not even a mixed bag. It's almost a disappointing win for Manly uh, because... Attack, we know how good they are in attack. They dominate in attack. It is, you know, been like that since round one. Defence, though, definitely need to clean that up. But I will say, I just want to walk you through their first try because I thought it was outstanding attack. Um, so they take the tap. Lodge gets it to the middle of the field on play one. The dummy half throws a cutout ball. He cuts out Jake Trevojevic. He hits Brooks. Waddell hits a short line with Paseca out the back. So Paseca is out the back on the edge of the field and Paseca lands on Boyd. Boyd gets bumped. He gets steamrolled. The center is forced to come in to tackle Paseca. Paseca gets a quick play of the ball. The Titans then panic and put four players on a short side that they shouldn't have put on the short side, plus the two markers. So you're looking at six players in essentially a space of about 15 meters. Uh, and then... This forces the left edge to compress. So Khan is like 25 metres, Kampere is 25 metres in field. They end up scoring on that edge because uh, the left side has to also panic because they don't have the right numbers uh, and they score. And I just think that like that is, if you, you know, some people may not realise, but you have sets that are specific off taps and there's certain calls, it might be called a red call or a DCE call. And DCE might say, let's do, let's do cherry, let's do cherry set that you're witnessing a set where every single play the ball is exactly where they wanted to land and they got a result from it. That is a well-oiled machine, a very well-oiled machine that every single player is getting to exactly where they need on the park and then they score the points on the end of it. Yeah, and it's a really good point you raise that, you know, you have set of sixes that are built off taps and it's quite often why you see guys when they kick for touch, they only kick for five metres because mm. that's where they want to start their set of six. Yeah. Get messages all the time. People, why don't they kick at 40 metres and get 10 metres? No. Nah. It's all part of a plan. Yeah, it, and like so, people think, oh, you know, we'll, we'll kick it to the, um, we'll kick it out, and then we'll just have two hit ups, and then we'll get our shape. It's like no, like genuinely, sets are the, every single play, they run them constantly all throughout the week, all year long, about landing at certain parts on the field. And the key to that set is obviously you're landing per on the three in. At the very best, 
you break that tackle and you score a try, you know, you break the line. At worst, you get a quick play the ball and the defence panics. So, for example, Brimo went to the short side because they thought they were going to raid down that short side again. Um, it's just brilliant, brilliant play by Manly. And it shows you why they got some of the best attack in the competition, that everyone's doing their job. Yeah, and once you once you know you've got a team like that, they're all on the same page. God, it's good to watch. That's what I love about the New Zealand Warriors. Mm, yeah. Every set, they know exactly where everyone's meant to be, and quite often it ends up that it's getting AFB in the right spot. Yeah, Tim, what do you think of uh, Manly and Titans? Yeah, you summed it up, Kemp. It's almost weird to say, but like almost like a a disappointing win for the Seagulls because we know they've got points in them. Mm. Like I, I've got them yeah. as thereabouts title contenders mm. uh, based on their attack and what we've seen it's small glimpses in defense but like they've got the fifth worst defense in the competition in terms of points conceded per game 22.3 third worst for missed tackles in the game in the comp with 35.3 misses mm. they go up to the gold coast too look we know they can put a few points in on their day but concede 30 points out there against them there was a little bit of rain around as well just I'd love to have seen them go out and win at 18-6 or something. Yeah. Um, because we know they can attack. Mm. The concern with Manly, you know, obviously we gave them raps for how good their attack is, but the concern is if they keep defending like this, at some point in the, in the season, their season's going to derail and it's just going to mm. pile on, pile on, pile on, and before they know it, they're going to turn around and go, oh, we, we, everyone's getting better. Meanwhile, we can't attack our way out of these problems. And so they have to sort their defence out very, very quickly. Because if they don't, as I said, it'll be, you know, round 15, a few things, they'll get a couple injuries that will completely hinder their attack. And all of a sudden they've lost three games and they're going, oh my God, we're spiraling out of control. I mean, look at the Cowboys, for example. It's just happened way sooner. They came out of the guns blazing with this incredible attack. They can't saw their defense out. And now their season is essentially spiraling. Your attack can be good enough to, you know, get you to a top four and get you that second chance come finals time. But you can't rely come finals time against opposition who are as good as you are in a do or die game. You can't rely on your attack to get you out of trouble. Your defense has to be, you know, that's the concrete there. That's mm. what we'll get. That's what's going to win you a title. We know that. Well, a perfect example, um, and it doesn't get spoken about enough, but Broncos defense allows them to play like that. Mm. If Broncos didn't have the second best defense in the comp last year, they wouldn't have the platform to throw the ball around like they do. And it's a similar to Manly. Like Manly's attack is unbelievable. It's so good. But their defence at the moment is making them like really inconsistent as to the level that they play. We're game of football, isn't it? Like I came away from this game so unhappy with both sides. Even late in the game, like I, I want to see the Titans win the game desperately. But if they would have scored late and won this 36-34, the last thing I wanted to do was come in here today and compliment the Titans for conceding 34 points. Mm. This is what we're trying to get away from yeah. as the Gold Coast Titans. This is what I thought Desi Hasler would change. And then for the Seagulls, you're just going, Fuck, like you can't concede 30 points in a game of football. Bizarre game, though. Like, from the 55th minute, there was no points. It was, a, like, 11 tries <laughs> yeah. before that. Very strange game. Very strange game. Um, one key stat for me in regards to the Manly Seagulls that I think is a real concern is they had – the Titans had four ineffective tackles compared to the Manly Seagulls, 14 ineffective tackles. Like that, if you're, if you're a premiership threat, that is crazy that the Titans had – Four and you had 14. Like that is almost unacceptable. Almost unacceptable. Now, they got the win and we said it week on week with Manly. The positive is you know exactly what the problem is. It's right there for everyone to see your, your attack. It's premiership winning worthy attack. Your defence though is absolutely not premiership worthy winning defence. Yeah, and, and I suppose, yeah, I don't want to make excuses for them because we've seen this in the past with Manly not being the best defensive outfit, but, you know, Luke Brooks comes in, you got a new six there, so your edge combination changes. Ruben Garrick's gone from wing to centre, changes a fair bit there as well. You know, Saab's been in and out injured, so Tommy Talia's come in this year. Jackson Bolo had been there this year. So there has been, you know, there has been changes on the edges. <coughs> mm. So maybe it's just taking a little bit of time to get them together defensively, get mm. those reads, get the talking. Um, but, you know, I'm, maybe I'm looking after them a little bit. I will say for a guy, I was actually quite bullish on Garrick to centre. I didn't mind it. But defensively, like, he has really struggled. He has really struggled. A little reminder of how much of a difficult position it is. Mm. How different Garrett. it is to how wing How different too. it is, yeah. So different. Um, and, yeah, I, mate, I, I've always uh, – it always surprised me they moved him. I thought he was one of the best wingers in the comp. Don't fix what ain't broken. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
And he's had really good games there. And I think that some of his early games were games that Manly won by 60 and he scored two and three tries and everyone got really excited. But defensively, there's always been problems there with Garrick. I, I don't understand why he's not playing Isn't on the Isn't that what we just said about Manly in a nutshell? Ruben Garrick will do good shit in attack at centre, but it's defence. It's yeah. like, is that the best spot for him? Because we, that's what they need to work on. Because I always thought he was a he was a good winger defensively. Great winger. And yeah. he'd run for like onwards of 200 metres every game. He's quick. His positioning's <laughs> fantastic. His read on the wing was really good. Yeah. Why? And like him and him and Turbo in an attack, they were never out of sync either. Yeah. Like I, I just didn't see the need to change it. Yeah, I think if that defence isn't sorted out soon, he'll probably find himself on the way. He definitely got to be in the side. Like he had a had a great start to the year, I think. It's just the last couple of weeks, just defensively, hasn't been that good. Yeah, they obviously had reasons for it, and I am uh, his number one fan. But just moving Brad Parker to the back row, I love Brad Parker. It's just a just a job doing centre, a good defender, well. runs a. He's perfect for manly shape. We talk about often with these like really good um, back lines and just having that hard running, no yeah. frill centre to tie him in because manly are all about creating that ounce of space on the edge for their lightning quick wingers. Go bang, Tommy puts them away. They don't really have that at the moment. I it's it's like the Opacek problem at the Eels. Exactly like the Opacek. You know, and I think that let's say he was down at the Storm. He's a guy the Storm would go, we love you. You just you make your tackles and you do the tough stuff. Missed now, a few the last couple of weeks, but Rocco Berry on the right edge at the Warriors. Same thing. Yeah, like I just – with Parker, look, at Manly fans, let me know. Maybe I'm missing things, but I always felt like he was just a good defensive centre and that was his job. Now, maybe he wasn't as good defensive as I'm remembering, but I, I was always surprised at the kind of, I guess – the war, the milk, like warm. Oh, sorry, like the lukewarm. Sorry, reception he would get from fans. I felt like he was a great battler. And, and him not being there and making the move to the back row and obviously playing New Wales Cup. I mean, I gather he's probably on the outer. Obviously a depth player there now, but that has forced Ruben Garrick, a really good proven winger, to go to centre where he's battling defensively. Tommy Talia, who's been you know very mixed bag uh, year in year out. Tommy, so moving Brad Parker and getting rid of him or dropping him. It's, it's led to a lot of changes in this team that I don't think are working out, at least defensively. I think as well, too. Like, they've moved, they played him at right centre, which, you know, when you defend outside DC, it can be really difficult. Kohler was there playing um and defending yeah. incredibly well to move him to the left to get Garrick into the right instead of just shifting Garrick one in. Mm. Uh, yeah, the whole thing never really made sense to me. Yeah. See, I, I was a fan of Garrick to centre because I'd. You know, I've seen him play there, really good in attack. I think he started the year really well, but um, yeah, just defensively, he just he struggled, especially on the weekend. So, Parker he signed September last year for two more years. So yeah. he's not, I wouldn't say he's on the outer. I, I, I think in particular, you know, because the vast majority of guys and the vast majority of these teams probably take out the Warriors, they attack better right to left. Defending at right centre is bloody difficult. Mm. That's where you tend to get mm. most guys pass better right to left. That's where they tend to go. So, yeah, I, I couldn't really understand why they moved Collar out of that spot, one of the better defensive centres in this competition. Him and Chairs were great together, hey? Yeah. Mm. Um, I will say as well, th I thought their front row and attack were really good, but I felt like their middle just got rolled. Like, I was genuinely shocked at how easily, um, you know, the Titans were able to make metres. Um, Titans actually made more metres overall uh, than the uh, the Manly Seagulls did. Um, you know, I... Again, I'm saying this from a perspective of a lot of people have Manly as a premiership threat. So they should be going up to the Gold Coast Titans and just you know, putting them away, to be honest. Now, maybe the Titans are much better than they were a couple of weeks ago. Maybe they're finally buying into Desi football, football I'm not sure. But yeah, I thought through the middle there they were a bit loose at times. Um, look, it's not, it's, not, it's not like critical and we're not sitting here going, you know, they're falling off a cliff. But... It is becoming very alarming that this defence issue is it's, – it's gone from, okay, we've started the season, maybe it's just a few tinkering here and there, or maybe we just had some games where we leaked some points, to it's a genuine problem. Like their defence is not top tier. I will – this is making an excuse for them, but travelled over to, over to New Zealand last week, a really tough extra time clash there. They played the Panthers in Brookie the week before, lifting for that one. Two big weeks for them. So maybe it was just that, you know, maybe they're a little gas, a little bit of a downer defensively. Look, if, you, if we're looking at them from a perspective of making the eight, you go, look, 
Everything's all good. Yep. Yes, their defense is their is their Achilles heel. Their defense needs to be sorted, but everything's all good. But if you look at them from a premiership, like you go, okay, this is a premiership threat. That that defense is like lifetime away from premiership threat. Just running through the numbers, I think they've conceded the six most points in the competition this Were year. Were they fourth? you say fourth? Fourth last? I had uh, fifth points conceded. That's on average because of the good tie in the buys. Sure. Yeah, fifth still. Yeah. Bottom six. Yeah. Um, and so that's where it's just, again, it's not red alert critical right now, but at the same time, it is it is turning into a real Achilles heel for them. Whereas, like, let's say they hadn't cons- – let's say they were mid-table for points. You'd go, okay, their, their defense is nowhere near as good as attack, but not too bad. These things will come together. At the moment, it's kind of looking like if there is one thing to stop them from being a premiership threat, it might be their defense. Yep. Um, but – I wouldn't rule them out. Um, I don't have them a premiership threat yet, but I wouldn't rule them out of growing into one. Right now, for me, they are they're, okay. You've got your top tier of premiership threat teams, and then they're just they're probably at the top of that second tier for me right now. Where would you have them at the moment? Yeah, I'd have them about the same. I I definitely don't have them in that top tier. No mm. way. Yep. The top, the, the top tier of the second tier, same yeah. you. Sixth in the market, 15 bucks to win the comp. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's about right. That's yeah. about right. But Which, I do feel like there is a bit of a gap between those two tiers for yeah. me. Yeah. They it's, string together four, six weeks, six weeks of good defensive performances. It'll just change everything. Mate, if they, if they string together six weeks and they win three from six, but their defence is outstanding, mm. that's when I go 100% a premiership threat because that attack is phenomenal. Like, genuinely, what you'd say... Attacking wise, you've got the Warriors are really good in attack. Obviously, you know Bronco. You'd probably have Broncos up top in regards to just their ability to throw mm. the ball around. Manly wouldn't be far off no, in the way they've not. played. Like the way they, when they get on a roll and they start hitting Tommy out the back or Brooks starts running the ball. DC obviously, like they are as good as any attacking side in the competition. And just their ability to to score from anywhere on the field. Like even you look at Penrith and the Warriors. Smash through the middle. They win field possession. They mm. get there, and then their their shape uh, and their their you know right left hand movements are second to none. But they don't necessarily hit you from their own half. Mainly in the Broncos because their big ball movement, quick anywhere. ball movement, I should say, they can get you from anywhere. Literally anywhere. Yep. I wasn't here last week, and I'm sure you spoke about it. But Christ, it makes the ladder interesting now that you got the Seagulls and the Warriors. They're four and against. Doesn't matter anymore. Mm. Off the back of that tie. Yeah, it's a good point. Mm. It's a good point. Um, I want to give Paseca a shout out. I think he's been this has easily been his best year of his career so far. Origin Smokey, who's had it in a couple of weeks. Not sure. He's in the conversation. Yep. Smoke, yeah, Smokey, I'd say Smokey. Yep. Um just defensively, I just would you know, it, I know he's not the only reason uh, you know, they're struggling defensively, but uh, just the fact that um, that pack as a whole is and he's the main guy, I just I want to see a little bit more out of him, but I would have him in smoky chat. Yeah. Yeah. I'd probably have, there's a couple of smoky front row forwards I'd probably have ahead of him. Yep. But he's in that conversation. Like when they're going to the selection table, I think you'd be mental not to have him on there mm. because he does offer a very unique, yeah. big, big body. Enormous. Um, I don't put it this way. Definitely not a starting front row. If yep. I was to select him, it would be impact. Yep. 20 minutes max, max 20 minutes. And I'll be saying for a second, I just need you to go absolutely crazy out there. Um, but he's, I think he's easily having the best year of his career. Um, in, like, in attack, like he, he's been as good as nearly any front rower rolling down the field. Like He's been nearly unstoppable. And he, and he was incredible last season as well. Then he got injured and I sort of thought, oh, geez, I don't know if he's going to be out. Big body like him coming back from injury yeah. he's going to be able to recapture that, but he has to his credit. Ola Kawatu, um, he's been, if his first few games were a 10 out of 10, he's been at about 8.5 out of 10 for me, but still putting in good shifts and doing what you want him to do, which is when they need a big play or a big moment, he makes it happen. Yeah. So for me right now, he's on the edge for me. Martin's on the other edge right, right now for me for, for the Blues. Okay, where's Cam Murray? In the middle. And I then Yo off the bench. Yeah, okay. I just think the Yo thing has been tried for a couple of years now, and it just hasn't seemed to work. I wonder if you're not picking Yo at 13 if you have him in the side, though. I like him off the bench. I think you can cover front row, back row, edge back rower. You even said yourself... Diamond six if you had to. Mm. I like him off the bench. What do, yeah. what do you reckon, Timmy? Yeah, it's tough. I, I understand your argument of like, mm. if he's not starting at lock, playing big minutes, do you need him as impact off the bench? Are there better players? 
Oh, you've rattled me under pressure. Because I, 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 I want big minutes out of Cam Murray. I'm like, does he solve an edge issue? I love the idea of Ola coming off the bench in two short stints of like 20 minutes and just being... I don't know if I want Ola out there for 80 minutes in origin. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. You bring him on, another 30-minute player, 30-40-minute yeah, player. I, I, give me a week to think about it. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know yeah. if I want Murray or Yo. I think I want Yo starting at 13. I think I want him playing big minutes there. Haven't you learnt this lesson, though? Like, yeah, you know, know, you brought Murray in the middle there last year and it was just... The momentum was just completely different. Well, they're going to throw Edwards in there as well. <laughs> That's the other thing. The if they pick Edwards at fullback, all of a sudden you go... Oh, why well, he's bringing up origin selection, guys? We've got plenty <laughs> to talk about. Um, no, it's a great conversation. Don't, hey, don't worry, guys. We will do a full-on preview show with origin, so no stress. What would you go just quickly, Maddie? Oh, he's an Isaiah Yoga. Oh, Murray, all day. You saw it game three last year. It's so New South Wales is to just change that. Mm. Okay. Uh, so, look, Manly... From a perspective of making the top eight, great start to the season. Great start to the season. Now, if they want to be a premiership threat, just got to sort the D out. So it's really that simple. So, you know, good solid start. Uh, like some of these games you're going to have if you're a top eight side. If you're building into being a top eight side, you're going to have a game where you're supposed to tower someone up and you don't. But the difference between maybe Manly now and Manly when they were struggling towards the end of the year last year or like mid-year they dropped this game. They dropped this game. So exactly right. that's a positive. If it was one try less and they got done, everything's different. It didn't pan out that way. They won. Move on. Yeah, just move forward. Uh, okay, now onto the Titans. Disappointing win for the Manly Seagulls, but like... A brave loss. A brave loss for the, yeah. for the Titans. Like, yes, okay, did they leak 34 points? Yes, they did. Manly are one of the better attacking sides. In a perfect world, you don't want them leaking those points. But from where they were in the depths of hell <laughs> to where they are now... It's like, you know what? I'm taking that. I'm taking that. Yes, the game was there potentially for there to be a win, but there's improvement. They fought. Manly are at the t you know, top end of the table right now. I'm taking that as a Titans fan. Is that, is that what we're calling Canberra now, the depths of hell? <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. Yes, we are. Second week in a row, they've showed a bit of ticker, though. Yeah, you know? absolutely. The, the Raiders to extra time. Only just lost this one. Tough ass this week, and they got to play the Warriors in New Zealand on Anzac Day. So that'll be uh, coming off that Warriors loss. Different kettle of fish, but um, they did look a lot better. Um, bit of a scrappy game. Again, Brimo, we said it last week. Who would have thought getting his hands on the ball a little bit more would uh, prove to be a good thing? Um, Might be a fullback, that kid. <laughs> yeah. Um, left him a little bit thin in the centres, but that's okay. Uh, I'm sure they can cover that. But um, yeah, certainly, uh, certainly improving the Titans from where they were a few weeks ago. Two I have really liked for the Titans over the last few weeks is this Jermaine Joliff. He never gets spoken about up there, but he's he's such a handy front row forward. Mm, he's Gosh, been outstanding. He's been great. He's, he's probably been player. their best forward this year. Yeah, uh, as a whole, I'd say so, yeah. And, you know, they've got Mofo, they've got uh, Tino up there that, you know, they always overshadow him, but I really like him. He's a good footballer. Mm. 110 kilos, according to the site. He's a big boy. Had 64 minutes on the weekend. Yeah, mate, he's got a huge motor on him. He's, he's just never utilised. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, mate. I think he's been outstanding for him. And like outside of Fafita coming back, I think he's been their best forward this year. I really do. And the value for money you're getting out of that bloke, and, and also Desi, the ability to Desi to go, oi, boys, you're a bunch of Origin players. Yep. You've got Joel off the Butler here, mm. probably on minimum, ripping and a tearing. We need to follow him. Almost definitely on minimum. Um, I think he's been great. I, I want to give a shout out. Tanner had a really poor start to the year. I thought he was good on the weekend. I really did. I Kicked well. Yeah. I feel really sorry for Tanner Boyd because, you know, there's a lot of Titans fans <coughs> jumping all over him at the moment. I mean, the kid came through as a halfback. The Titans then tried to turn him into a lock. They tried to turn him into a hooker. And now it's sort of like he's the scapegoat. Like, Hey, Titans fans, um, do you remember the last few years, scapegoat in your seven, <laughs> how that works out for you? Yeah. Like, let's just take a step back. Like, yes, Tanner hasn't been great, but there are far more senior players on more money that should be doing more than Tanner is. Also, scoring points the last, you know, last season and a few uh, lesser games earlier this year, but they put on 30 points on the weekend. Attack hasn't been your problem. It's been defence. And it's not your halfback's fault that you're conceding the second worst defence in the competition. Yeah. Like, as I said, no one's going <laughs> to sit up here and say Tanner had a good start of the year. He didn't. He, no. he, he wasn't great. But just the vitriol after his, after him at a, as a youngish seven, you know, what's his second year as a seven for the Titans? It's like, boys, got to be and girls, got to be patient with with your sevens, especially knowing the history of, of the Titans. Now, we all sat here years ago and said it is insane that they got rid of Fogarty. Um, so we're not 
we're not pretending like we were like pushing Tanner or whatever. We were saying, you know, get Fogarty in there. Tanner can learn from him. But at the same time, like there are so many more problems than Tanner yeah, Boyd in the time. Uh, Toby Sexton out of town as well. <laughs> <laughs> Put him out of town. Yeah. The poor bloke getting booed everywhere now. Yeah. That Titans fan base, I'll tell you what, it's not the biggest, but it's pretty aggressive. Very aggressive. <laughs> what about the uh, self-control of a Jedi from Des Hasler? Oh. When uh, after nine minutes, they're down 10 nil. Manly walked over for two tries. If I was him, I would have gone fucking red button panic, put Fafita on. Mm. Waited another 15 minutes to put him back on once the Titans got back into the game. Yeah. Mental. I mean, if there's one thing, he has been extremely calm in this whole start of the season. Well, the oath he has been. Because, like, it's been a disaster. Let's be let's be real clear. It's been a disaster. It's Yeah, nothing has gone right. Nothing whatsoever. Um, yeah, Brimo, I thought was outstanding. I thought uh, Brian Kelly had some good moments yep. uh, this game. Um, defensively, is, that's been his issue for a while, but... We know that Kelly has this in him. Like, if you get Kelly, Kelly on his best day, he genuinely can go toe to toe with any center in the competition. Ryan Kelly is the Gold Coast Titans. <laughs> like, he, he just personifies the franchise the last few years. Mm. I mean that with all due respect because I think he's an absolute gun. I've, we said it the other day. Sometimes you sit there and watch him and go, could he play Origin? Like, when he's at his best, oh, you know, he, he can he, handle yeah, him. Sure. Stuff. Some of the stuff he does is crazy. Um, so, yeah, I thought he was good. Uh, Kieran Foran, three try assists. That's what you need from the big fella. That the left edge at the Titans was so good to see. Like, mm. four and missing a few games early this season due to injury. Fafida missed the start of the season. Cam Pereira got dropped. But last year, their left edge attack, even the defence was quite good, but the left edge attack was unreal. You saw the band back together properly on the weekend. Cam Pereira has scored doubles two weeks in a row. Fafida, just his classic rampaging try from dummy at half, barge over. But the left edge attack looks so, so much better with all those boys back. Yeah, so hopefully they can uh, notch a win up soon. Well, just on that, we've got a market at sports, but uh, Gold Coast Titans' first win of the season. We've thrown one up. Um, the best backed is uh, round 11 at Magic Round against Newcastle, which you get your $4.50. Um, Surely they turn it around at some stage, but if you think they go winless, twenty-one bucks you're getting this year. Jeez, oh, they're getting yeah. closer though. Tell you, what, you're a mean-spirited person if you're putting on winless. They've shown a bit of ticket last couple Something. of weeks. I don't think it's far away. Uh, so yeah, hopefully they can bounce just back. Just on him, uh, just the one I want to touch on, Kempi. I thought Fotoaka was going to be the one to step up or, or needed to be when uh, when Tino went down earlier in the year, and even just looking at his his meters run this season. So in three of the f past four years, he's run for 143 metres plus per game. His worst in the last four years was 123 metres in 2022. Uh, in the four games since Tina got injured, he's averaging 105 metres per game. He's still playing his big minutes. Uh, he had a terrible miss for the old Kawadu try. He's, he's disappointed me. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I thought Fodder Waker, didn't he win their player of the year last year? Well, it was this time... Last year, we were sitting going, he has to be in the Marins. Yep. Mm. Yeah. He had, so, 53 minutes on the weekend, had 11 runs for 88 metres. It's like... I thought Against a team that's defensively not yeah. that great as yeah. well. Um, so, hopefully, he can step up as well. Um, okay, don't forget, watch all eight games on KO Sport. Also, give us a follow on Sports Bet Feed. You can copy my bets. You can see exclusive little write-ups as to why I decided to punt on that. Um... And also, we're going to release a bloke in a bar multi each week that you should follow. Don't forget, guys, May 6th, new bloke jerseys, 2024 jerseys. And they will be revealed closer to the date, most likely the Sunday night at 6 p.m. before the drop. They will be revealed. But trust me, you will not be disappointed. So set aside your little shekels for the jersey, $99, $99. Um, they will be ready to go May 6th, 6 p.m. Monday uh, and you don't want to miss out. We have very limited number this year, so you don't want to miss out. Uh, let's get into it, shall we? Uh, Broncos defeat the Raiders 34 to 10. Um, so the game opens and you're going, oh no, it's a disaster. Broncos are going to get absolutely pumped here. They haven't switched on. They're at a 40% completion rate. Then they just go, oh, you know what? We might score a few tries. So they're leading eight, 10 minutes later. So you're 15 minutes in. 10 minutes later, they're leading 18 nil, and they only had 44% possession of the ball. And matter of fact, according to Fox's stats, in the first half where they were 20 nil, 24 nil up or whatever it was, they only had 44% possession of the ball. They are the most bizarre team to watch. I'm sure their most bizarre team to play and most frustrating team to play. 
their ability just to go, oh, you know what, we need to just turn it on here and just turn it on is seriously, I can't remember the last time I've seen a team play the way the Broncos do. Um, what a great performance with the players out. Like, yeah, okay, they probably should have won by more. Yes, they missed opportunities in the second half. But at the same time, like, you're missing Reynolds, you're missing Haas, Pierre Cora. To win a game like that against the Raiders that have been pretty red hot for the year, it's a bloody good win from the Broncos. It's such a frustrating team to talk about because, you know, I walk away from form so they can go, well, you can't beat the top teams like that. <laughs> well, they, they do pretty consistently. Mm. Uh, and, you know, you you know you also go, oh, but they were missing this guy, this guy, this guy. But when this guy, this guy, <laughs> this guy are here, they do the same fucking thing anyway. Mm. Yeah. They're, they're, just, uh, they're just such a volatile side, but they're comfortable doing that. Yeah, they just don't mind it. What do, what do you think of the game, Timmy? Yeah, well, as the old saying goes, you're only as good as your last half of football and <laughs> the Raiders won the second half 10-6. <laughs> uh, tough one to watch as a Raiders fan. Um, you're right, like it's hard to, whether win, lose or draw, it's hard to be critical of the Broncos because chanting their arm, throwing the ball around, throwing shit offloads, completing 65%, that is the way they play. They use the footy, they chance the arm and they're not going to complete. We say it every week, they're not going to complete at 85 90%. If they do... They'll never be defeated in a game of football. And yeah. we literally saw them in a grand final blow one of the best teams we've ever seen, if not ever, in the Panthers off the park for a quite a lengthy period. They can do it. So it's like when they do make mistakes, you sit there and go, how do you critique it? Yeah, it's super hard. Because I could sit here and be like, they need to complete higher. Imagine if they did. You know, we've seen what they can do when they... But at the same time, it's like, well, they, they're killing it. Like, they've got key players out. They managed to win the game convincingly before the game was even at half time. The game was essentially over. So it's just, you, you put it this way if we say that, we're going to be here every single week saying that because this it, is what they play like. And you've already said it, Kempi, in the last game when we were talking about Manly. They can chance their arm because their defence is good enough to do it and mm. it backs it up. Yep. They've got insurance for when they drop the ball. Yeah. So they give themselves the foundation to just go. And, and so, like, my head wants to say, Reese, like with Reese Walsh, Mate, the first few runs, like, what are you doing offloading, throwing hospital mm. balls for knock-ons? and But then literally two minutes later, he'll score a 60-metre try. And you go, well, I'm the dickhead. If I'm sitting there critiquing Reese, then I'm being the dickhead. So it's, you just, you've just got to cop it, I guess. Like, and I'll never forget being in the, the, um, the coach's box watching them play the Eels last year. And he had this, he was out the back play and, like, pretty much all of us were murmuring, like, don't pass the ball, Reese, And he just went... Bang, 20 metre cut out mm. and we score. And we're all just like, well, <laughs> I guess, sweet, sweet. It's actually mental. But at the same time, you know, like I, you know, I sit here and watch the rest of this competition. It feels like to me the vast majority of other teams are just trying to copy Penrith. I love that Brisbane are just Brisbane. Yeah, I, I do. Like, I love the courage they have to go, no, no, we mm. are just going to play footy the way and trust that we are tough enough in defence to keep ourselves in the game. I mean, even the grand final, when they had. I think their completion rate was like 40% as well, but they just defended their ass off for the first three. Now, did it cost them in the end? Yeah, it did. But we have to remember, we're talking about the greatest ever team put together mm. pretty much. Um, yeah, really, really good. And look, the most exciting thing for me out of all, all of the, the, um, the pizzazz and the, the flariness, but it's the forward pack. Going up against the Raiders forward pack and going, honestly, saying there's levels to this, really. And that's coming, like I know, like Tarpane and Papali'i, you know, they're top tier for sure. And they've had big games and they've dominated Broncos before. But in this specific game, that pack got completely dominated. Like, it, And it wasn't even close. I didn't go into the game expecting the Raiders to win. Like, I, I was tipped the Broncos. But I thought, you know, with a bit of rain around, a bit of wet weather, I thought with, you know, Payne Huss in particular out and a few other forwards out, with the Raiders pack, I thought at the very worst it'd be tight because we'd turn it into a grind. Our forward pack, hopefully get the upper edge on the Broncos, and we did not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's what I, I actually – I punted on um, Raiders with the Lions, seven-and-a-half start, and any time – Trevi Stewart, any time try scorer. I was genuinely shocked at the fact that I, I thought your, your forward pack just – I thought they were going to go into that game – and take it upon their shoulders to go, this Broncos pack, everyone talks about how great they are. You know, everyone loves them. They're the high flyers. Let's go and, like, shock the NRL and show them, no, no, we're the big dogs. Because you have the big dogs to do that. Yeah. Tarpane, Papali'i, Hudson Young. Um, yeah, unfortunately, 
it, it definitely was an off night for that forward pack because I can't remember the last time the Raiders forward pack just got completely outplayed by uh, a forward pack who, A, has lost a couple of people this year, but also was missing two starters in it, which is quite surprising. I mean, outside of Joe Tarbonet, like none of the numbers read good for any of them as well. And I, I also thought it was interesting. I think Morgan Smithy's only played forty-five minutes in this one. Like, I don't know how you boys read it, but I like because you got out to such a big league. I must reckon Ricky Short went fuck. Maybe I'll take this opportunity to give him a little bit of a spell. I think definitely. Oh, yeah. for sure. If it's tight, he keeps playing. Yeah, the yeah. There's no why keep a bloke on that you know you're going to need at the end of the year to get bashed for no reason. Um, I love that from Ricky that he sees that because a lot of coaches don't. They send him back. They're down by twenty six or whatever, and they'll send him back out there. Like why? Yeah, give well, him a rest. Leaving well, Tarpenay fifty five minutes and Josh Papali'i forty six minutes. Mm. When the game's over, that's when you send your bench on and go, yeah. boys, get a hit out. Yeah. Like let's see what you're made of. Um, which they you know did to a degree. Uh, um, Sasangi obviously ended up playing eighty minutes. Um, yeah. Trey Moody, 33 minutes, so probably longer. And then Solo, um, also 31 minutes. So probably longer than they would have usually if the game was tight. I doubt they would have probably got 60 minutes together. Mm. Um, but let's talk about the Broncos. Uh, there's one play that I absolutely loved, absolutely loved, and it's the big hit from Hetherington. So last week, Chevy Stewart running it hard and straight, and we love that. Like as fans, we love that. It's so brave. But at least when I was coming through the Broncos – our forwards at the Broncos then would almost find that disrespectful, but as if to say, how dare you think you can run straight at us? Because why do you think Carmichael Hunt became such a dog at running the ball back straight? Because at training, if he ran like that at training, and our, the forwards that I was playing with at that time, if he ran like that, they'd be like, mate, we're going to put you on your ass every single time because if you're going to run like that at training, you better be ready for full contact. And what I loved about that is Hetherington and Ricky have clearly identified that and said, like, almost, how dare you run it straight back at us? Because the forwards, as an outside back, you almost shouldn't be running straight at them. You should be, you know, stepping or whatever. And so for Heathering to line him up and go, nah, that's not happening on my watch, that's what your forwards, that's what you want them to do. You want your forwards to deter outside backs from thinking that they can just run directly at you. Because basically what the outside back's saying is that I don't think you're going to shot me. I don't think you're going to you know, line me up and basically put everything into this shot. And that's what reminded me. The game was, I think at this stage, you know, Broncos are you know, quite a ways ahead. And he said, no, no, not here on our watch, not this forward pack. We're not going to allow an outside back to run it straight and hard into us and not have to answer for it. And as I said, it's a part of a big reason why Carmichael was so tough in running that ball back because he, you know, when we were at training, he would never be allowed to just get away with that. Like the, he, he toughened himself up to be able to do that. Um, also, obviously, he, he did that in himself. And that's why he – is there anyone that ever ran the ball back as hard as Carmichael Hunt? Nope. I don't think so. Like seriously, crazy stuff. So much so that Wayne Bennett had to tell him to, mate, you need to chill because you're not going to have a long career if you keep doing this. But that all comes, I said, all comes back to guys like Brad Thorne, Webke, Petro, Tony Carroll, Dane Carlaw, Corey Parker. Like they would never – not that would never allow, but if they see an outside back running straight and hard, they're going to take their opportunity to absolutely whack that bloke. And that's what I loved about that shot from Cody Harrington and uh, from Ricky. I can just see within the next few years, there's going to come a time where Billy Slater, where the Maroons have a few injuries or whatnot, and he's got to pick a jersey 17. He'll be looking at Hetherington and Plath mm. going, who do I go with here? Yeah. It, I mean, Neither will let you down. Heathering is an absolute battler. I thought outside of that one drop ball um, from that drop off from Paddy Carrigan, I thought he was really, really good on the weekend. Yeah, he's, he's had a big year. I, I think it's often forgotten because of how that grand final played out. But that tackle he made on the Otter in the grand final last year, that could have gone down on, as one of the greats if it played. It was out. outstanding tackle. Yeah. And, and that's what he brings to the, you know, he's he's hard and straight and he you know can make some metres. But at the end of the day, like his best asset is his defence. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I absolutely. Um, I love that from Hetherington. I really did. I, I, I did remind me of the old school forwards that would just never allow that. Never allow that. I mean, I've told the story a million times, but Webke, we had to do a tackle pad drill in a 10 metre radius, literally told me, how don't you dare step, as if to say, like, <laughs> I just got to run it straight at Webke. Um, and, that is, and that was set up by Wayne to see whether I would, you know, be a cat or not. Um, so I just got GM for 10 minutes, which was great. It's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I love that from, uh, from Hetherington. On the flip side, I love the fact from Stewart 
that he kept going. Yeah. He kept going. Very easy after that shot to just go complete to water. And it wasn't a the, – the special thing about that shot, sometimes when you get hits like that, they actually don't hurt because you just go with the momentum of the tackle. You get put on your back. It doesn't hurt. You could tell that was a bone wrap because he was – Stuart was compl- like fully committed to that. And so what I loved is he kept turning up. He kept having a go. Um, but, yeah, from the Broncos' perspective, I love that from Hetherington. So, so good. Uh Outside of that, in regards to good good uh, games from the Broncos players, who stood out for you boys? Corey Jensen for me, mate. We spoke about him pre-show. God, he got through a lot of work. Yeah, outstanding. And and showed why he was such an unsung hero of the Broncos run last year. Mm. You know, he, mate, he just doesn't get talked about enough. But he does his job every single week. Every single week he's putting in good, high-quality footy. And very rarely he makes mistakes. Very rarely. Uh, what about yourself? Yeah, just another underdog in, in Jock Madden who's come in and he's done a really good job for yeah. the Broncos with Adam Reynolds. His out. kicking game was great. The, mm. Typified by his kicking game. Like yeah. that was it was outstanding. The bomb he put up for the man try poor old Chevy underneath that one. Like he's doing what Adam Reynolds does and like I mentioned it with Schneider before, you come in as a half back, an organising half back into a gun team. It's not that hard a job. Kick well, defend well, get your team around the park. But also easier said than done. And, and mm. Madden's done it really well and hasn't looked out of place at all. So it must be very reassuring for you as a Bronco to go, all right, if Reynolds does go down, we still can go deep into this competition. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I thought Ezra Mann was also outstanding. Um, Selwyn Cobbo continues to impress at centre. Um, another bloke, I thought Fletcher Baker was much better this week. Um, bit of a negative. I thought Jaden Hunt was uh, unfortunately not great on the weekend and... Look, it's. I wouldn't say it's unfair to be too critical of Hunt, but at the same, like, I'm sh- I'm sure at the, when the season started, he wasn't sitting there going by round three or four, I'm going to have to be playing, you know, starting on the edge for the Broncos. So it's quite early in his development. You know, you you can forgive an error here or there, but I I do think that when you get these opportunities, especially if you're a battler back rower that's just getting through work, you can't afford to have those misses in in defence. Like when that. I'm not sure who it was that just slid through. So Sungy just slid through. Like, that was a really poor miss. I know he kind of tripped over, but it still is a miss. And then that drop ball um, with the line open uh, from maybe Mm. Reese Walsh. So just little things like that. Now, again, he's a developing player. He isn't, you know, when we have our starting 17 and everyone good to go, he's not in our starting 17. Uh, So it's been really good development for him. But I think if there's one area that he needs to work on in his game, it's just that little bit of lack of concentration in big moments, which is understandable because he's at the start of his NRL career. From uh, the footy that I watched, Jaden Hunt play at the Dragons, who I, I always really liked him. I, I mentioned him quite, quite a bit last year. I, I just don't think he's an edge. Mm. He's all, every time I've seen him, he's been a middle forward who gets through an absolute stack of work. I And ma- ma- maybe he, he is the best option out of the rest of their squad. You, you'd know better than me, but I, I just don't think he's an edge forward. Yeah, whether he's an edge or he's not an edge, some of the errors he's made, like those errors are not where you play. I, for sure, but I'm, I'm just pointing out, I'd, like he's never been an edge. I, I find it bizarre that they've, they've got no him one else. There. They've literally got no one else. How did, I wonder how that happens. Like, I don't, like you, you look at the Capewell situation, you go, how did you get rid of Capewell? You've got, you've got that mm, many middles mm. and you've got, you know, <laughs> Piakur or Ricky go down and you've got a potentially middle going to the edge. Is your next man up? Mm. In saying that, I take it back. I'd rather them put him there than Pat Harrigan. So, yeah. yeah. So, so I just think it's yeah. a, and also he did trial there. He did trial there. So maybe from the it'd be very rare that you would train a guy in the middle and then just randomly put him in the mm. on the edge. But they out of necessity probably because they're like we don't have any other edge back rowers. It's probably to be honest, it's probably the only way he got into the squad. Mm. When you think about it, because they don't need front yeah. rowers. We've um, played four four games this year on the trot. 66 minutes plus in all of them, 80 minutes on the weekend. On the weekend around 47 metres. You're on 47, 33, 48, 60 metres in big minutes on the edge. Like, So he's there to do a job, like, as yeah. I said. And that's what I mean. Like, if you're a battler, you just got to cut the errors out. But, uh, you know, he's early in his career. He's developing. You know, he's served his purpose. He's got in there. He's done a job. Pierre Cora will most likely be back soon. Um, and it's great learning curve for him. Great learning curve for him. There literally isn't another second row forward in your squad. That's why we, we're yes, getting G- Gawasaki, yeah. uh, what, um, Gusevsky. Gusevsky from the Cowboys we're trying to get at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Which is, mm. when you think about it, like letting go of Katewell, like, shit, we could use Katewell. Um, anyway, here's what it is. Uh, let's get on to the Raiders. Um, look, unfortunately, 
devastating night, and not just a loss. Fogarty looks like he's ruptured his bicep. You know, unfortunately, it's it's almost season done. Like I just, I don't see anyone that's ready to go to step up into that seven role with that side. Mm. Um, now I, I would love to be wrong, totally wrong about that, and I would love Strange to just kill it, and maybe he can. But Fogarty has been outstanding for you guys. Um, I just don't know how you replace him. I really don't know how you replace him. Uh, but injuries aside, uh, really disappointing night for the Raiders. I am um, very, very surprised that they just got blown off the park um, when they had started the season so, so well. So disappointing because we were doing so well. And I'm with you now, Kempi. I'm like, we, we don't have another game manager to come into this team. Mm. And it's like... Hopefully Ricky can find a way, you know, with KO Weeks coming in, but with Fogarty gone. But again, it comes back to relatively poor roster management in that you shouldn't be having one injury and going, oh, we're screwed. You should have someone like, mention Adam Reynolds went down, Jot Madden comes in, does a good job in the same role. We don't have someone that can play the Jamal Fogarty role. You've got KO Weeks, who's a fullback turned 5'8", who's been very unconvincing at NRL level so far. You've got Ethan Strange, who's terrific, but we literally had the conversation last week. I said I think he's a centre more than he's a 5'8". We've got two out-and-out ball-running halves. It's going to be really hard to replace with Adam Cook, who's the played seven in New Wales Cup and going all right. He's more of a manager, but also not so much. We're just really going to have to simplify our game plan, aren't we? Mm. We've got the forward pack. <clears throat> Don't use the... At least early on for the first month while these two are getting their combination together. None of these big expensive ball movements. Let's just belt down the front door, go through the middle, get a bit of second phase play, get mm. Chevy sniffing in around the ruck, get Weeks, get Ethan Strange pushing up for offloads in support. Uh, I just think it's going to have to be a simple game plan. Mm. In four, six, eight weeks, hopefully they're gelling as a combination, start using the ball a bit more, but it's tough. What's your brother up to? Um... Getting ready to put the green back on, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, look, I understand it's hard to recruit for, for Canberra, but, I mean, surely there's a New South Wales or Qu Queensland Cup game managing seven out oh, there. No. That could be a part of the squad. Toby Sexton, get him down there. Get him down there. You know, it's funny. Would I'm, you loan? Would yeah, you be yeah, looking yeah, to loan? You know, it's interesting. Bef before this injury happened, I was looking at the doggy squad and looking at the Raiders squad. Like the Raid Raiders have too many forwards to know what to do with. They've got all these guns playing as well as Cup. And then you look at the doggies who are desperate for middles and have Toby Sexton who can't get a start there. Give us Toby Sexton for the rest of the season. You can have one of our thousand middle forwards. Mm. Well, they have traded before. Corey Horsburgh yeah, played for him for a little bit. COVID. Yeah. Um, get it done. I mean, if I'm, if I'm the Raiders, because that's going to be my next point, if I'm the Raiders, I'm absolutely looking to loan a seven from someone. Yeah. Like, Absolutely no questions asked. I'd be knocking on as many doors as possible saying, is there any seven that you would like NRL game time with? Bit of chat about uh, Croft getting back over to the NRL. Mate, whoever. Well, the, the other thing is, with how good Connor Chase has gone, went at fullback on the weekend, and the way Blake Taff came on on the weekend, like, I wouldn't be stunned to see Blake Taff, should the opportunity present, get a start in the halves at the Dogs. Mm. Played a lot more in the halves. So I'm like, all right, if all of a sudden... I'm not saying this is the case, but if Taff has become the next half up to Hutchison, if Sexton has dropped down one more, why not? I'd be absolutely... Like, Sexton would be a great get for the Raiders right now. What do you got? I was just going to say, like, there's been a lot of rumours for a long time that uh, Ethan Sanders, who's the Parramatta Eels, mm -hmm. New South Wales Cup yeah. halfback, I watched him play yesterday, went good. Um, I've heard rumours that he has already signed. It's not going. I've heard everything. I don't know if you've heard anything, but... Well, he's signed. He's just... We're trying to get the early release for... We're going to get him now. Mm. He has signed? Yeah, as far as I know. Okay. Did you check that, Matty, please? I I, it's I mission impossible. To f good luck. Yeah, it's yeah. mixed reports had. everywhere about that. I thought he had definitely signed. Yeah, they were same. just trying to um, wrangle for... Because I think it hasn't even... Ricky Stewart mentioned like mentioned him and talked about him. Mm. Anyway, uh, it's actually quite similar to um, the Eel situation, which I can't believe. Like, So they've got Saunders there. And he's clearly, I guess, not ready for first grade. And so to have a top 30 squad without a New South Wales or Q Cup level managing seven as backup, like that's bad roster management in my opinion. He's not allowed to officially sign to around six. It's now around seven. So he has, I don't think he's officially signed yet. Oh, because it's the clause that if he's like a junior or something yes. like that, then yes. he, they have a till round six to re-sign him or so, like get, offer him or something like Correct. that. Correct, yeah. 
Um, yeah, and what's it's similar to the ill situation. Like Dylan Brown is clearly not ready, or clearly not a seven. He's a six at the moment. Maybe eventually he could be a seven. And same with the Raiders. Like, how do you not have a just a good battler seven look ready at, to go? And you look at um, look at a kicking game. So Danny Levi, oh, not much of a kicker, not going to offer mm. too too much from dummy half. Ethan Strange, across six games this season, had a grand total of eighty six kicking meters. Kyle Weeks in four games in New South Wales Cup had 280 metres, not a noted kicker of the ball. That is the huge concern. I, I think it is also worth noting in defence of Canberra, like they did have a second half back there, but unfortunately, you know, what, what happened with um, Troy Dargan in the preseason? Like he would have been the guy to step up here. Yeah, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Just heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's a fair point. Um, now, some positives. Uh, I thought Timoko, you know, a couple errors, but he worked his ass off. Um, and I just love to see Tarpin air. Like, even though everything was against him, the forwards are getting dominated, he still ripped and teared. Like, that's what makes Tarpin air. Doesn't matter whether he's, you know, a lead, got a lead on a team, whether he's dominating a team with his forward pack, or whether he's on the back foot, he steps up to the challenge every single time, literally every single time. Um, but outside of that, if, I, if I'm the Raiders, I'm almost just trying to, like, put that aside, don't look at it, and just go back to what we were doing really good, which is high completion, tough footy. I know it's going to be hard without Fogarty, but just just try to keep the energy and the like the morale up in camp. Yeah, I'm not saying by any means the Raiders are on the Warriors level, but, you know, we were up pointy end of the table with the Warriors, and I mentioned with them, it's like... You can't get up every week. Yeah. And the Raiders has a bunch of battlers out there. We do have to get up most weeks for our wins. Wins don't come overly easy for us. I haven't in yeah. the past. They had a damn week. The Brisbane Broncos at Suncorp Stadium. It's bloody tough going even with a few players out. So not overly concerned as a one-off performance, but the Fogarty injury does add a lot of insult to it. Uh, put it this way. The Fogarty injury is the biggest concern yeah. coming out of that game yeah. for me with the Raiders. Like Even three of the first four tries for the Broncos came off kicks. I'm like, I can live with that. Yeah, and also the Broncos are a team where things can just fall their way mm. and just all of a sudden you're down by 20 points. Mm. Like, so it just, yeah, it sucks. Definitely not good enough. But there are, I think there are ways to look at it of going, okay, let's just put that aside and got refocused on what we're doing really well. One more guy just to give a wrap to, mate. Uh, Matty Timoko, this is the third game this season that he's run for 200 plus metres without a line break. Fuck, it's so good. You know, when you look at... Sifatalakai last year playing centre, we're, we're blown away every week that he was averaging 180 metres at centre. He's averaging 175. Yeah, jeez. So good. So good. Um, okay, and don't forget to follow us on Sportsbet Feed. Takes two seconds. Go to more, type in, uh, click feed, type in Denon, give us a follow. You can copy me bets. Bulldogs defeat the Knights uh, in an, an incredible performance by the Bulldogs. Um, and I tell you what, I'm starting to get excited. I'm starting to get excited. Are they close to um, premierships? You know, maybe even top eight is a bit too far to ask, but you are seeing the skeletons of something being built that's great, in my opinion. You know, at the start of the year, when we talked about Stephen Crichton being the captain, a lot of people scoffed at us. Very quiet now. Very quiet now. It hasn't been mentioned, hasn't been talked about, but nearly everyone in the NRL has talked about the guts and the grit and the, the tight-knit group that the Bulldogs seem to be. And even when they lose, they put it all on the line. Guess who their captain is? It's Critter. It's Critter. I think he's been an outstanding leader. Um, I think that uh, with the Bulldogs, as I said, the fact that they're still missing players, the fact that they're going out and doing this, like, and this is no disrespect, but their front rows is Hughes, and uh, Pilotu, I think he... Patolo. 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 Went off with an injury. Max King. Like, we're talking about, you know, Hughes is relatively new to first grade. Um, and they're going up against a front row with Cy Fiti, Leo Thompson. You know, this is a decent forward pack with the Knights and they get the job done. But I'll tell you what typifies where the Bulldogs are at right now. Uh, play of the game for me. They're 30 to 6 up. There's 11 minutes to go. And Hughes and kick out, make a try-saving tackle. This represents the new Bulldogs. They then defend repeat sets. They finish with a try-saver from Fox. They roll down the field in one set and score a try. That set sums up the whole game from both perspectives. First of all, the fact that they are 36 up and they defend the try. They don't need to. They've already won the game. It's game over. But then... On the opposite side with the Newcastle Knights, 
you nearly score two tries and then you allow the Bulldogs to roll the whole field to score a try shows you where the Knights are at right now and it shows you where the Bulldogs are at right now in regards to boys buying in and ripping and tearing. That set, that try saver from two big men in Hughes and Kickout who would be absolutely gassed is sums up where the Bulldogs are at and why they're soon becoming everyone's favourite underdog. I really love what's happening to the Bulldogs. Completely agree. I think you summed that up really well. Um, and you know, the thing that I love is that <clears throat> they're not just getting home on grit. They're playing fucking good footy. Mm. They scored 30, footy. 36 points. Yeah, and I, I, I'd say like the one that you know we, we've spoken about a lot on this panel and I think playing Connor Tracy at fullback is an absolute must moving forward. Oh, for sure, for sure. Like, Taff was getting better definitely week in, like, as the weeks were going on. Still wasn't fully convinced he was a fullback, but we've been quite strong from round one yeah. that if it's not going to be Critter, it has to be Tracy. And to Taff's credit, I think his last month has been really, really good, mm. like, above where I thought he could play. But when you put the class of Connor Tracy in there, it's day and night to me. And Connor Tracy's never been given the opportunity to play fullback. I mean, he played so well at fullback for the Sharkies. You know, we were even questioning, do you bring Kennedy back in for the final series? Yeah. And so if you give him time to play there, all of a sudden it solves your critter problem where you're no longer ever tempted to put critter back there and you can keep him in his best position, which he's the best centre in the world at. Um, yeah, Tracy at the back was outstanding. Mm. In a side that we already know or we thought uh, were lacking like quality in their middle forwards, off the top of the head, like... This season, they've had Chris Patolo twice in the last three weeks, who's been injured five, ten minutes into the games and left him a middle short. They had Poisso Farmer Silly earlier in the year, yeah. who lasted a minute into a game and got a concussion, lost a middle forward. They're in that Roosters game that they, they got up for and won, they like Kurt Mann had a broken hand, uh, Max King had a broken hand, or whatever it was. So injuries everywhere, and they still got up for it. And Guru touched on it, but. We've seen in over the past five, six, seven years, the dogs at different times when they lacked quality in their roster, they'd get up and have a bit of defensive grit and show plenty of heart at times, despite not getting wins. But they're looking so well drilled in attack. Like yeah. the points are coming, their shape's terrific. There's been like team selections this year, including the weekend, uh, where I've been like, Sorrelda, like, what are you doing? That don't make sense. But they're coming off. The results been terrific, so can't help but sit back and admire what the doggies are doing at the moment. And said so they're not just it's not just ticker, they're doing it in stylish fashion. Yeah, and also this isn't a win out of nowhere. They've been building towards mm. this. They've been building towards this. They they beat the Roosters. Obviously, that second half you know wasn't the best, but they had all those injuries. They go down to Melbourne, you know, so close to getting a victory, and then they go out and dust the Knights up. Like the last month of footy. They've set a standard. This isn't a one-off game where you've gone, oh, wow, the Bulldogs have just come out of nowhere and, and upset someone. This has been building and building and building. From round one all the way to round, round seven, they've progressively essentially gotten better each week. And as you pointed out earlier, mate, like you, you look at that squad and you go, where the fuck are the front row forwards? <clears throat> they lose one in the opening three or four minutes and they just make it work. It, like every single game, they make it work. Yeah. Like imagine this side when they go into the market and are able to either bring through a young fella or sign a you know a big front rower. And to be fair though, Hughes, I think Hughes has been outstanding this year. He's been great. He's been so good for Real, him. They've been so patient with him in his minutes and bring him into the starting team. He keeps getting named there and drops back often uh, come kickoff, but he hasn't missed a beat. And like <coughs> he doesn't seem like the biggest body. Now you never know until you see them in person, but – he just he just gets through his work. He fights all game. Every, any, every minute he's on, he's fighting for every metre. He's fighting in defence. Then you've got Max King, um, who's also you know getting through his work. 100 to 1, big Sam Hughes, first try on the weekend as well. Well done yeah. to those who got on. Mate, they've got, a, they've got a front row forward who's playing SG Ball on the weekend. I had uh, um, the short ball on my podcast the other day. Really good follow on Instagram for your, for your juniors and whatnot. Uh, and he mentioned this uh, Seve, this front row forward for Canterbury, who took on the Roosters in the SG Ball. And the Roosters were red hot favourites to win this comp, and he got the better of them on the weekend. Yeah, wow. So one to watch there. Okay, there you go. There you go. Max King, 48 minutes. 15 runs, 130 metres, 50 post contact, tackle break, 23 tackles, only one miss, no errors. They, they had said Bailey Hayward, who's... I really like Bailey Hayward. Yeah, like being what? He's been a halfback coming through, Rude? I thought he was a hooker. Yeah, halfback hooker. Halfback hooker yeah. coming through and Blake Taff. 
a fullback halfback, and I saw that, and I'm like, questionable bench selection. Then they lose uh, Patolo in the first few minutes of the game. The last middle forward on their bench was Curtis Moore, and I'm like, oh my god, he's like, barely a full, barely yeah, a middle. Yeah, forward. I'm like, how the hell are you going to recover from this? And they came at one thirty six twelve and dominated their middles. Mm. I have been so much more judgmental than I'm willing to admit of his team list. Mm. Like uh, when we get to kick off, especially, and he's making changes all over mm. the place, I just sit there and go, what the fuck is Serraldo doing? But the times when I've been the most ju- judgmental, they've put it on their best performances. Yeah. yeah. Results Look, are results. The thing is this, is that, you know, yes, it's only seven rounds, but Serraldo is starting to show why there were such big raps on him. Now, yeah. it's a long season, could all go to shit, but he was extremely, um, you know, last year with all the, the dramas and everything going on, what I admire about Seraldo is that he was very strong in the direction he wanted to head. He didn't hedge his bets. He didn't cave to the kind of outside noise of going, okay, this isn't working. He didn't even cave into the results. You know, they played shockingly last year. He has gone in there and said, we're doing it my way, this direction. You're either on board or you're not. And I'm willing to almost live and die by the sword. And right now, at the moment, it's working. It's working. And it takes a lot of – imagine being a rookie coach, how many people in that first year that they had will be telling him to change this, change that. For example, his defensive system. They would have been going, mate, you need to change – it clearly doesn't work. Um, You know, you need to change it for the squad you've got. And he said, no, I'm actually going to change my whole squad and bring in a squad that I think can actually suit this defensive system. And he's nailed it. Now, round seven, long year, but so far it looks like the current group that he's got are unbelievably on board. Like they are so on board. There's an argument he made they're as committed as any of the top tier sides. Now, are they going to deliver the results, top tier sides? No. But there's an argument made that when it comes to commitment to the cause and to each other and, you know, Seraldo's coaching methods, it seems like they're just as committed as any of the top tier squads. And when you talk about (laughs) commitment to the cause, like – as I said before, the amount of HIAs they've had to middles and stuff, Josh Curran every week must just go, oh boy, here, here I go. go again. Yep. I'm going to have to play 70 <laughs> through the middle again. And he's doing it week in, week out. Grand yep. Theft Auto meme for Josh Curran. <laughs> here we go again. <laughs> um, you know another guy I want to shout out? Bailey Haywood. There's something, he is slick. He is yep. slick. I really like what he's, um, you know, he, He's not necessarily setting the world alight or whatever, but even just little things like he's connecting players through the middle when he almost plays as that 13 with Reed um, and obviously the halves. Like, I think he is, um, he's one to watch for sure. Got a very good understanding of the game. Just his timing and just everything he does is very, like, like and I've only seen him play a handful of times, but I remember watching him in that trial at the start of the year. Like, watching him in that trial, you would have thought he was a five or six-year half. He was, he was outstanding in the trial. Outstanding. Can they, ca- can they carry him and Taff on the bench, do you think? I mean, it's working at the moment, but... Yeah. I still don't like I it. I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> but worked on the weekend, so... Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't, I don't like... Um, yeah, too... I mean, especially with Morin. Like, if you had another big front rower, then maybe. But the fact that they've got such a small bench... Mate, look, it's hard to argue against it when it works. Yeah. Yep. Hard to argue against it when it works. Um, all right, now on to the Knights. Caelan Ponga looking to be out for two months um, minimum. But uh, outside of that, that's obviously devastating news. But, mate, this side is uh, – it's not looking good for the Knights. It is not looking good. I don't know about you guys, but the change in the halves, that that Sh- shocked me. Surprising. I couldn't believe it when I, when I saw that. Like, I think we're into round seven now, and that's their third halves pairing. Listen to this, this, when Koga got dropped, since being recalled to this as the starting halfback, lost to the Roosters by two, sweet. They smashed the Dragons, who have been really good the last month or so. They had that really tight loss to the Warriors over in NZ. They beat the Storm, and then they chop him. Like, really? Yeah, wild. I couldn't make any sense of that situation. Um I don't know. Like, there's just like it's they're, they're a team that are, is struggling for continuity, and that's so evident. And they just keep chopping and changing the key positions. Like I don't know. It, I, I I'm just struggling to make sense of it. Even to the point where when Cogger was in, he started on the left, and they moved him to the right when Jackson came back in. Like it, it's it's just making life so hard just, for them. It just looks like 
They were chalk and cheese, the attitudes of these two teams on the weekend, weren't they? Mm. What the Doggies did there and how badly they wanted that and had a statement to make, as they have all year. The Knights just went out there and just kind of looked like... It looked like they were resting on the laurels and what happened in that glorious run at the back end of last year where everything just came so easy to them. And the difference is... To me, it looks like a team who they use the ball early. They're not willing to get in the contest in the middle. They're not willing to win the middle and earn that right to use the ball because they're using the ball and they don't look like going through or around teams. The difference is last year, they did earn that right. Mm. They had one of the best defensive records in the competition. Their middles were firing. And even like the signs leading into that nine in a row were really good. And then the floodgates opened and they were playing full of confidence. This year, they haven't earned that right to just throw it around and hit Greggy Margie on the wing, expect that the space will be there. Mm. Attitude looks an issue. Yeah, I, I think the environment right now, like, how does Hastings... So Hastings gets dropped initially, gets back into the side, then Cogger gets dropped. It's like, how does it change that much? We're in round seven. Mm. Yep. Like, round seven. And meanwhile, you look at the other side, Drew Hutchinson has been... Pretty average since coming in. And Serraldo's just gone, nah, I'm backing in. I'm backing in. And it seems like there's an environment of the players going, hell yeah, like, you know, you've backed him in. He's been, you know, pretty average. But at the same time, like, they're getting results. Yeah. They're getting results. I just look at the Knights and you go, How's it, how would it feel being a half right now at the Knights going, I could literally get dropped. If I have once, two, because like Cogger, for example, last game, He's been average. He hasn't been bad. Like yeah, that's, that's the thing that none of them have actually been so bad. You're like, oh, they've got to drop yeah. someone, but they just keep doing it. Yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah. Like, I, I, I just the environment looks. It looks like it's not a good environment at the moment. On top of that, their line speed compared to the Bulldogs is like, it's honestly night and day. The Knights, sorry, sorry, the Bulldogs, and granted they had more um, line breaks, but that comes from running hard. Average nearly ten more meters a set than them. So they average 37.5 metres compared to 28.5 metres of the Knights. If that isn't ripping and tearing, I don't know what, like... <laughs> Doggies completed 66%, Knights 73%, and they lost by 24 points. That's just what I mean. Like that, yeah, that to me says all those stats. no line speed. It says when we do get the ball, we're not ripping into their line. Nearly 10, 9 metres a set, a set, average less. Crazy, crazy start. <laughs> and, I mean, is it only Max King from Canterbury that would start in Newcastle's front row rotation? Well, he'd be on the bench for sure. He wouldn't start. Yeah. He's like, the only one that would even have a sniff of it. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, he probably play, yeah, probably plays off the bench. And, and, and honestly, he'd be fighting on that bench. Mm. He'd be fighting for that spot each week. Um, we'll talk about quickly the incident uh, in the tunnel. Like, we've been giving Heatherington praises for, like, keeping a lid on it. And then just, oh. it's all been building up. Um, look, apparently he's going to get a one-match ban. Just silly. You know what You know also it's silly from? What are the Newcastle staff doing letting him stand there? Whilst for him. Marnie, wait for him whilst Marnie's walking down the, get him in the, like. Put him in a cage. You know what he's <laughs> like. You know what he's like. Yeah. And you allowed him. And look, I'm not taking, I'm not absolving Heatherington of responsibility. I'm 100% silly. Silly brain explosion from Hetherington. He's been so good for so long, but this has held him back, you know, throughout his career. But like, what are you doing allowing him to walk up to Marnie, shape up, and throw a push punch to his chest? Like, surely go, mate, mate, come on, like, let's go. They did it, and also they did it after he did it. So it's like it's not like they couldn't do it. Bizarre, bizarre. And like, even in the moment, you could tell the ref read the situation. He sent him yeah. off. He brought time, brought time, brought time, yeah. then sent Reed. Like, he did him all the favours he could. Like, insane to me. Like, what do you – just get him in the dressing room. And as soon as you see him waiting, it doesn't take Einstein to go, I wonder what Hetherington's waiting for. Yeah. Also, what a great look. There's – the game's done, essentially, what they were binned in the 76th minute. You're getting absolutely towed up by – you went into the game as narrow favourites, I think it was – you're down by 24 points and you sit there and wait and shape up to a bloke half your size. It's like... That's just a brain explosion. Yeah. Just a brain explosion. Um, and, Greg, you know... 
I was just going to say, great, great chat from the ref. Um, sending Marnie off. You're being silly. Off you go. Yeah. <laughs> silly Billy. That's a silly School Billy. Teacher stuff. Man. Yeah. Love that. Um, <laughs> and like people are going, oh, read Marnie. He's not so lippy without his team. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> They're playing rugby league. It's <laughs> his job to be a pest. Like, yes, back in the day, he wouldn't have been able to be a pest because he would have got knocked out. But he is playing, like, well, he's playing right now. It's his job to roll up the big fella to do something silly. Like, what, what are we talking about here? No shit he wasn't yapping to his face. It's like, <laughs> like the Reed Marnie on the field is not the same Reed Marnie off the field. If Reed Marnie was off the field and carried himself like that, then yes, 100%, you should, you should back your chat up. He's on the field. He's trying to niggle and get under his skin. You know, it's the same blokes talking about old school this, old school that. What happened to what happens on the field stays in the field? What happened to that old school adage? Um, like to expect Reed Marty to go, yeah, let's square up. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> like, what are we talking about here? Like he, he riled him up intentionally, knowing he'd get a brain explosion, he got it. And then when he got pushed, he was like, well, I'm not gonna throw a punch back because I'll get knocked out. And also I don't pr like purport to be a tough guy. Like when has Reed Marnie ever tried to be a tough guy? Like, no, he's, ni he's niggle, he's about getting brain explosion. Never understand that. So um, I will say though, Three and a half minutes to go, what I love from Critter, he was angry that they had gotten caught up in the niggle and he was blowing up at his players going like, get back one more set. You know, you know for all the, the brain explosion chat about Hetherington, I do say from Reed, from the Bulldogs perspective, Reed, there's a time and a place, bro. You're up by 30 or whatever. There's no need. There's no need for any of this stuff. If you want to niggle him early in the game to get him in the bin, I understand that. But at the end of the game, when you've already won, just, you're just putting yourself under pressure that you don't need to. So just silly from Reed as well. And you've had a blinder too. You've killed it. Just walk away. You just just yeah. let it go. You're in the team of the week, for God's sake. For God's sake. <laughs> Chill out. Um, and so that's the one little thing where I just silly. To be honest, brain explosion from both players. It really yep. was. Um, so, yeah, Knights, I'm, I'm a very concerned, especially with Kalen Ponga out. They do seem like a volatile team that I don't know how they handle that. What do you do at fullback? Do you bring in Price? Do you play Gagai there? Probably bring in Armstrong, Price. Armstrong, Fletcher Sharp. I'd probably bring Price in. Price. Just give him a crack, see how it goes. They need points because mm. they've lost the bloke that they go to every set, four points. Mm. And look, I'll be honest, I don't know enough about David Armstrong, Fletcher Sharp. Did Sharp debut last year or Armstrong? Played a game or two? Fletch hasn't debuted Fletch. yet. No. Um, but we know there's points in mm. Will Price. Whether or not he's ready for the NRL starting weekend, I, I don't know. But there's points in the kid. Yeah. yeah. So and I think that that's what you take away from Michelle Bowles Cup this year. He's got points in him. Defensively, he's struggling. You put him at fullback. If he's getting to the, the look, if he's getting to fullback and he's missing tackles, you can attack, like you can look mm. at that then. And that's where in New yeah. South Wales Cup he's playing five eight. Yeah, so yeah. 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 So if he's if he's getting like five eight, like night and day compared to fullback defensively, if if that's a problem when he comes into first grade, you can address it then. But I think to not pick him when the other players are rookies that haven't are they exploding in New South Wales Cup right now? The the other players? they got done fifty two six on the weekend. It's not not quite big. exploding. You know, if, for example, if they had a young fullback that was just, like, killing it in New South Wales Cup, then obviously you'd go him first. Mm. But I think Price has been playing really well in attacking. David kicker. Armstrong the week before against the Roosters. They won 30-26, scored one, had three line breaks and 12 tackle breaks. Okay. That's good going. He ran okay. for... Ran he for, was the right ran winger two, in the trial? Ran, right ran, ran for 282 metres, so that's good going. Okay, well, well that with that then, yeah. then you probably put Armstrong in there. Yeah. Because he's been playing fullback. And maybe you consider putting Will Price back to fullback and seeing how he goes. Mm. Armstrong the week before scored a double in a 30 to 24 win over the Dragons. Uh, that was on the wing. Fletcher Sharp was fullback that week. <laughs> oh, shit. It's all over the show. Well, I don't friggin' know. <laughs> Just play someone there. Jeez Louise. <laughs> um, and anyway, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite concerned about the Knights uh, at the moment. I don't know how they're going to go. Even with KP, they were not great. Yeah. Now without KP, oh, not looking good. Uh, don't forget, you can watch all eight games on KO Sport. Now let's get into the last game of the round. Sharks defeat the Cowboys 42-6. to six. Man, what a performance by the Sharkies. We've been having questions about, okay, this year they need to show that they're ruthless. They need to show that, you know, when a team is down, you know, put them out. Uh, on the weekend, they were absolutely ruthless. They played some of the best footy I've seen them play. And 
there is not much more they can do this year outside of the loss they had maybe the Tigers. But in saying that, I think the Tigers are better than a lot of people give them credit for this year. But outside of the loss to the Tigers, there's not much more this Sharky side can do this year to let us know that there is someone to be noticed. Yeah, for sure. And I think week on week, you know, we spoke about it a lot in the preseason, but I think week on week that halves combination is – Getting better, better and better. And better. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I was saying I was really concerned about the start of the season. I thought it would take time, and uh, I, I think they're going to have it sort of a lot quicker than I thought they would. Um, mate, it all ran for 200 metres without a without a line break or anything. Every run, he wins a contact. Yep. Every single run. Yeah. Uh, before I do like my – have a look at the weekend punts leading to the round, and I sort of straight away go to teams with weaknesses. Where's a weak edge? Where's a weak this, that? And, you know, put them around that. Look at the Sharks at the moment, and particularly the way they're playing. I don't really see a weakness in their 1-17. to 17. Mm. Like, last year, the left edge defensively with sort of Wilton and Moylan, they were struggling a bit. That's been rectified this year. They can score from anywhere. Their halves are really starting to gel. They have awesome impact off the bench. Now, this isn't saying they're the perfect team and they don't have any issues, but I just don't see any standout weaknesses like... Do they have the explosiveness in the forward pack to compete with the best and win a comp? Maybe, maybe not, but really hard to, to be critical of what they're dishing up at the moment. Yeah, I, I agree. And so, you know, they might be a seven and a half out of 10. Like, they're, for example, their lowest concern, like the biggest concern in their team might be seven and a half, 10. So you might look at their forward pack and go, probably compared to other forward packs, it's about a seven mm. and a half or an eight. Then you could go to Heinz and you go, Heinz is top tier, their back line, close to top tier. Um, and so even though they don't have weaknesses, doesn't necessarily mean, as you said, that they're going to be winning comps. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a great foundation to build off. And it's also a great foundation to bring a guy like Adam Fennell Blake in. You put AFB in that side, then all of a sudden it goes, okay, that forward pack goes from, yeah, 7.58 out of 10 to maybe a 9 out of 10. Um, I just love the balance of their side. Um there's an argument to be had who replaces Hines if he gets injured. They do have the young – oh, man, I can't believe I'm getting his name. Puru. Puru, they've got him. So, at the very least, he's a New South Wales Cup half. Goes all right. Mm. You're okay, Dykes, as well. Like yep. You can play Trindle at seven, Dykes at six. Yep. So, so depth-wise, they're okay there. At nine, they've got good depth. Um, at fullback, Mulatalo could play back there. Dykes could play back there. Uh, spot. Great squad management. You know what I mean? So it's a really good um, depth management in regards to different positions. Even front row, like seeing Uele play his first game. It was his first game this year, I'm pretty mm. sure. Yeah. Like you didn't even really talk about it that much, but they're missing one of their main front rowers. Luke and Enroy aren't coming back from injury still like that. Yeah. So oh. I, I really like – the Sharks could not have done much more than what they've – outside of like going out and toweling everyone up. They couldn't have done much more than what they've done to start the season. Yeah, and that's where, you know, if they can keep up this form and they can get to finals, you know, it would be great if they won a comp, obviously. But, you know, if they can just go deeper into finals and then all of a sudden you head into next season with all these guys, another successful year under their belt with finals and you add AFB to this side, they're going to be a fucking handful. Of oh, mate. AFB in this side, it, it oh. begins to get a bit scary. Like it's almost just like a luxury buy. Like you probably don't need it, but having him is just going to take you to another level. Yeah. Um, Talakai was the form centre of the first month of the NRL. He's a middle forward for them now. Well, what I love about that, though, is, is it <coughs> gives them some explosiveness through the middle that they may have lacked a little bit. You know, with Iroh playing so well, um, and you can bring Talakai on for 20, 30 minutes. Now, don't get me wrong, like, it's still – the jury's still out in regards to, you know, he was outstanding at centre. But at the same time, what a luxury to have where you go, okay – Talakai, we're going to bring you on around the 20-minute mark or 30-minute mark, whatever minute mark it is, and we just want you to go hard for, you know, 20, 30 minutes. That's a massive luxury to have. Well, my thoughts when I saw Iro 14 runs at half time, just immediately went to, all right, if he's trying to press his case for keeping that centre spot over Talakai, like what is C for bringing that Iro doesn't bring? And that big thing is the yardage, the metres, the work rate from centre. And Iro's gone out and done that, mm. possibly in then some. Like 14 runs at half time with, what did, how many metres did he end up with? 212. 212. It's like, all right. 24 Tal carries. Talakai does the same. So, yeah. But he's quicker. Mm. He's more agile, all that. And also, from a team balance perspective, you get Talakai off the bench. So not only do you get that meters that Talakai was delivering, now you could make the argument, Ido hasn't had the same triasis that you know, Talakai had, in saying that's been a couple of games. 
So maybe squad balance wise, it is better have because Ido's probably not going to be able to do what Talakai can do in the forwards. Because I've always been critical of just Fitzy picking the four forward bench, but I think with Seifer off the bench who covers the outside backs, it allows him that luxury of having four forward bench. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. Oh, Atkinson's another guy in the halves that they've got for depth, mm. yep. even fullback. Um, I thought Will Kennedy was outstanding on the weekend. Uh, a try, a try assist, 148 metres, 27 post contact, eight tackle breaks. Um, I thought he was really, really good. Yeah, I think he was the uh, Paul Green medalist out of this one. So very good performance from Kennedy. I thought Stone Street was good too, mate, making his debut. Scoring in the corner there. Scored a try. And that was awesome. But also so like there was carnage a, on that hill there. Oh, mate. <laughs> oh, yeah. There was a few times where like he, he went up to take high balls and everything that were really contested and yeah, he did well. How was his first take over the top of Val? Oh, first yeah. touch in the NRL. So that good. That was a joke. Yeah, so good. Um, who stood out for you, Hammy? Uh, well, Hines, obviously, um, just the amount of defence that he had to do as well. 31 tackles he made, just missed two of them. He made the fourth most tackles of any um, Sharks players and he had the best tackle efficiency out of those four as well. So oh, wow. really aimed up there, something he's been looking to work on and um, really rounding out his game well. You mentioned if someone goes down, if they need another six for New South Wales, maybe he's the guy to go to. Um, well, he had 130 run metres. Yeah. Isn't it just so good to see with Hines, though? Like, you know, he came out of last season with, you know, some poor defensive plays in, in origin that everyone highlighted. He then went to that Kangaroos game, played off the bench there and came up with a poor missed tackle. He's obviously gone away in the offseason. And, you know, he's won a Dally M. He's come second or third in the Dally M the year after. Like, he could have quite easily gone away and gone, give me a break. I'm the best yeah. attacking player in this competition. Yeah, like two Instead, tiny moments out of position. Yeah, like. but, it, but he's taken it on board and he's knuckled down this offseason. His, his defense has improved out of sight. Yeah. Been outstanding defensively, and I'll, I'll just that Warriors game. I'll just never forget that round one Warriors game. He was phenomenal, yeah, phenomenal yeah. defensively. The other one for me is uh, Tommy Hazelton. Only played the twenty-four minutes, but how about that try? Oh. Two big <laughs> right foot steps. Remind me of Benji Marshall at Shark Park in 05. <laughs> bang, bang, and straight over. Um, this bloke we've spoken about him as a cult hero a few times now. From Goulburn, got the big roll on deodorant head. I just love this bloke, and um, yeah, get around him. Yeah, get Hazelton. Mate, and uh, he's another one. You know, if he can develop further and further each year, it just rounds this forward pack out even better. Um, Wasn't that a wild afternoon, that Arvo at Shark Park, when yeah. Benji did that? It was almost like a fuck, no, look, the game's changed all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah if rugby league has changed forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mulatalo. Oh, yeah. Mate, he must be the most loved man in Cronulla this year. He's been outstanding, outstanding. And just his ability... I say it all the time, but he's so deceptively strong and fast. Mm. Like every part of his game, whether it's strength, speed, reading, I just feel like he's uh, deceptive. Like you just, you almost don't expect it. And then he'll just do something absolutely crazy. And you go, mate, you do that nearly every game. He's playing outstanding. <laughs> there was a moment in this game where I think it was Kyle Felt tucking him down their corner. And he sort of twisted his leg or dragged it a little bit. Mulatalo stood up and he was spraying Kyle Feld as he played the ball. And I thought, oh, poor Kyle Feld. He's never going to hear the end of this. They went two to the right, then came back to the left. And Mulatalo came back on screaming. He was still yelling at him. <laughs> it's like a 30 second spray. He's the best. Oh, it's so good. Ramian, I thought was outstanding as well. Like he, he, Jesse Ramian doesn't get the raps he deserves, in my opinion. Mm. He's consistently been yeah. great for the Sharkies. And very rarely goes underneath a 7 out of 10 for a game. One of the best defensive centres in the yep. NRL and has been for a long time. Yep. And then you add in his attack, 21 runs, 152 metres, 52 post contact, four tackle breaks. Um, Three offloads as well. It's the other thing that Raymond does. He just gets into contact and he gets his arm free and they generate so much momentum off the back of him. I tell you what, for what he's getting paid, like bang for buck wise, I don't think Fitzy would want another centre. Mm. Matter of fact, you go across that back line, like, I don't think you'd want to change that much, Fitzy, in regards to where you put your money and how much they're all getting paid. Because, like, none of those outside backs would be on a, like, gigantic wicket. And yet, if they get good, you know, get Adam Fennell Blake or maybe just one more star player, they're premiership contenders. They have absolute Like, they're, they're potentially premiership contenders this year. Next year with AFB, they're 100% premiership contenders. Yeah. Isn't um, Jesse Raymond, like, at the end of his career, you're going to look back and just completely forget <laughs> that year at Newcastle? Yeah, I, I must yeah. forget about it now. Mm. I do as well. I, I forget about it. Did we last year? Were we heaps critical of Cronulla's completion rate? Is that a thing, or I'm making it up? Oh, are you making it up? I do think they had issues for a bit about their completion mm. rate, but then they turned it around. Anyway, they're at seventy nine percent this year, and seventy nine percent completion this year, and like ninety odd percent on the weekend. 
Yeah. Good signs. Uh, Blake Braley, that try assist that he had, outstanding. Outstanding. Um, yeah, so just an all-round great performance. Kofusi flying under the radar, getting the job done, though. Um, yeah, just Teague Wilton. How good was he? Oh, oh, already I love Teague line. Wilton. He <laughs> runs a bloody good line. Yeah. Sharks He's most been... errors last year. Yeah. yeah there like, go. on average, per game. Average. Yeah, Wilton's been a big improver this year. He's... He, he, he got injured during last year, and then Wade way Graham took his spot. And I, I, I sort of thought at the time, geez, I, I reckon that Wilson injury may, maybe saved him from a tough conversation. But he's come back this year and hasn't put a foot wrong. Well, how much – this is how much the Sharkies have improved. Have we mentioned their left side defence once this year? No. Like, that is a really good sign. And that, and that was the other thing. Like Once that, that left edge changed, I thought, geez, Hines is going to get some traffic. He's, he's going to get shown up this year. But his defence has improved out of sight. And that's, that's what you expect from a Craig Fitzgibbon side. Yeah. And that's where his comments around, you know, we're you know, not like people are underestimating us and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's paraphrasing what he said, but it is true to a degree. Like he's he's in his second, third year of um, as a as a coach, he's taken on this squad and built it up. This is about the time this year or next year is about the time where you would expect a premiership mm -hmm. run to run to happen. You wouldn't expect usually a team that finished eighth anywhere from eighth to eleventh. Unless there's a huge roster clean out and they just get some superstar that just changes everything. You wouldn't expect them in their first or second year just go, yep, premiership. You, usually you've got to build the roster, especially if you're being smart about it. You know, like if, you're, if you want to th throw your salary cap out of whack and get guys that are in their peak year, but then the two or three years after that, they'll peter off. You can do that. But if you're building smart for the future and for the next few years, it's going to take you a few years to get to that peak point. If, uh, if Dale Finucane's available this week, do you think he comes straight back into this side? Uh, I think he gets a bench spot. Yeah? At the very least, a bench spot, I'd say. But, I mean, it's a good problem to have. It's a great it's problem to have, yeah, because all the guys on the bench are, are going good. Who do you drop? It, oh, you'd probably have to say Jack Williams. He's been so Jack, good. Jack Williams won't get dropped. No. Well, then, well, that's my question then. Who do you drop? Yeah, I, I, Rudolph? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not totally convinced he comes straight back in. I know that sounds outrageous, but yeah, that's just and to think this is a four. They're essentially running. A, they are a four middle forward bench because Seif is coming on through the middle, and he still can't get onto it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm with you. I don't know if he will come. It's straight great. It's him. a great problem to have. Really, really good problem to have. Uh, now onto the Cowboys. Um, disaster, disaster. Uh, look, the silver lining is we know the Cowboys have the team to turn it around. We know that they have the team on paper uh, to be able to go on a run, even though they're not at that point yet where they need to go on a run. But it's not like you're looking at their roster going, you know, there's no way back from here. They're still sitting eighth, so that's a positive. But I have to say, with the roster they've got, they should be absolutely <laughs> at the top of the table, near the top of the table. I think that if they don't make the finals again this year, I do think there's going to have to be questions asked around coaching. Mm. Um, this, this squad is honestly way too good on paper to be losing games like this. I'm, I'm starting to reconsider wh whether it is, and that's because of the fall pack. I'm just, I'm not, I think a month ago I was saying that now winning, like they, they look 100% like flat track bullies at the moment. I'm just so concerned at, like they've got some soft weeks coming up after Penrith this week, but I don't know how this pack is going to get up against the best packs in the competition. Like maybe they're a top eight side, but like McLean getting on a bit. Tam Lolo's knees look quite shot. They're lucky to get decent minutes out of him. Finny Fuiaki on the edge going okay, but doesn't offer a lot of output. He's explosive, sure. Gajewski, Cotter can only do so much. I, I don't know if they... I'm so unconvinced by the four pack at the moment. See, I... I agree. Like, for example, I do think McLean and Tamalolo. The T Tamalolo one's interesting because I'm unsure, is it the injury or is it the fact that it just hasn't seemed to work mm. with Peyton? McLean does seem like he's getting a bit, he's aging a bit. So why not Griffin Neem? He's a gun. Why not Griffin Neem? Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. Like, why not play in bigger minutes? Stan McIntyre has been quite solid for him. McKayley, how's he going? So I agree with you in regards to maybe McLean is a bit behind, you know, compared to the other top tier ones. But even with that, this, the rest of this roster, Nanai, Cotter, Finny Fuaki, I know he's, like, he's still got it in him to be gun. And they, they've got like, 
considering they've got some ageing middles and question marks around their middle forwards, Ruben Cotter being the exception to that, between Finifuaki, Gajewski, who started on the weekend, and I, they've got really low work rate edges. So it's not, I don't feel like it's a very well-rounded pack at the moment. You know the one that I think they're missing so much from last year is Luciano Le Lua, mm. who could could transition between edge and middle so easily for them based on what they needed because they're also missing Helam Lukey, who is a big work rate edge back row and runs for his 150, 180 metres a game. So he can't come back quick enough for them, but they are missing Luciano big time. And I think compounding missing Luch is Cohen Hess not being available. Yeah. That's hurt them as well mm. big time. I, I still I still have to question though, like, although I agree with you when you look at you know, where Tamalolo is and, you know, we spoke about it actually before the show how we both felt, you know, that front row, can it go with some of the top tier front rows? Is it getting a bit older? I still think that they should be playing better than they're playing. Well, they're about to get Penrith this week and they're going to get Leota and Fisher-Harris. Let's see what you're made of, boys, because after that performance, you need to get up. You're at home in front of your fans and you've got the best two front rollers in the game, essentially, certainly on results. What do you got? Tamalolo had... Five runs for 43 metres. What is going on there? So we mentioned it before, that term, flat track bully. I mean, they play the Panthers this week, and I'm the same as Tim. I want to see them stand up in that game because after that, they go Dolphins at home, Titans, Rabbitohs, Tigers, Roosters. Outside of the Dolphins, none of those teams are informed. Nothing's going to shit me more than if they set the world alight across those four weeks and they get the Warriors in round 14 and they're disappointing again. Yeah, it's just if they can just sort out their front row, they should like they should be one of a top tier side. If McLean and um, Tamalolo can get through, like I don't know, just be more explosive. And, and like nothing I I've seen yet this year from their middles says that there's an answer there and that mm. there is a solution. I don't know if there is. Well, like like but last year they would go on these runs and play mad, and then all of a sudden they'd you know be inconsistent. I just. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like this roster should not be this up and down. Should not be this up and down. This will sound out- outrageous in a 42 points to six loss, but there was a moment early in that game where Drinkwater was going over the sideline. He threw an offload and yeah. Cronulla picked it up and scored. he thought he was going over, yeah. I, I get why offload, but like, fuck, there's such a volatile side, the Cowboys, that I wonder, like, if that play went differently and the Sharks didn't score so early like that, I wonder if it could have been a different game. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Because they are a bit like that. Like, as soon, as soon as you start to get momentum against them, uh, as soon as they have momentum against them, they sort of fall into a heap. But when they start to score, they can get on a real run all of a sudden. Mm. And, and you, look at, you look at attitude in them. Molly Talo scores late in the game. I don't know if, I can't remember if it was his 54th minute trial or the 73rd. He got the last two. And he just goes to put it down and goes, oh, no. Nah. Just strolls around under the post. There's not a player there going in front. I know the game's dead and buried, but that's not the point. Like, well, that, yeah. But that's... That's my point in regards to like, okay, we can nitpick the forward pack and you know look for reasons as to maybe they aren't as strong on paper, but situations like that, like that is unacceptable. Like, un- like just allowing a guy to rot, no matter what the score is. And it's surprising because like Dearden and Cotter, that's the opposite of who they are. And they're the captains. Oh, yeah. You know, um, you know, four errors from Drinky, you know, obviously not good. Um, two errors from McLean, which is like, Obviously, can't have that as a fronty. Nanai had a couple of errors. Yeah, I don't know. Like, super underachieving. As I said, I feel like we can nitpick their front row, and I agree with you. Like, mm. when it comes to like the big games, can that front row go with Payne Haas, Carrigan, you know, all that kind of stuff, Fisher Harris, Leota? But at the end of the day, this roster, look what, okay, look what Jesse Bromwich, he's older. Jesse Bromwich and Jesse, um, McLean, like they're almost similar body shapes. Mm. And yet, look what he's doing, mm. leading that pack around, the Dolphins. And so I just think that, so, so Dolphins come out, and I know it's a different week, I know it's a different week. Dolphins come out and absolutely slap the Eels, smash them the week before, Cowboys lose to them. So that says to me, like, if we want to criticise, you know, let's go, okay, let's look at their forward pack. Then we have to go, well, look at some of these other teams, like the Dolphins. Or, okay, sorry, look at the Bulldogs forward pack. What, who would you take over that, like? Yeah, 100%. Like yeah. the Bulldogs yeah. four-pack compared to this four-pack, you would say that is like not even close yeah. on paper. 
If you, uh, yeah, did, did any of you listen to uh, Toddy Payton's press conference after? No. He, he sounds like a guy that's going to make changes this week to me. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what he does. There. I think he has to. Yeah. I think he absolutely has and to. Kaylee will come in. Has to. Yeah. Surely. No, no, I got Neem dropped to the bench this week. N- uh, Neem start, you think? Yeah, I, I reckon McCully comes in, probably Neem starts. and Heal and yeah. Lukey's next week or two. Can't wait for him to come back. Mm. Not as much as Payton, but. What do you do with Tamalolo? Spot. Very, Very tough, tough spot. spot. Um but yeah, they gotta turn this around. As I said, like look, if you want to, if we want to have the argument of premiership tier, I think that's a fair argument to have because they're not mm. delivering what we thought of. But dishing out that when you've got other teams with half the forward pack, I just think that's just crazy. Yeah. Craziness. Um so Cowboys, another another team, hopefully they can turn around because by God, when they're on, it is the best rugby league ever to watch. Seriously. And it's a bit similar to the Manly situation where obviously Manly are doing better at the moment. But if you don't sort that defence out, eventually it will bite you in the ass. It really will. You won't attack, attack your way out of every single game. Um, and I think we saw that in the weekend. Yeah, like they could make the eight this year with the worst defensive record in the competition and get mm. belt to beat one of finals. And I'd be like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that is the Cowboys done and doosted. Uh, now on to tips brought to you by Sportsbet. Oh. All right, let's do it. Round of eight. Uh, triple header on Thursday. How good's that? Uh, for the diggers on Anzac Day. Uh, New Zealand Warriors, dollar twenty one when they host the Titans, four dollars forty five. The line is twelve and a half points in this one. What are we thinking? Warriors, Warriors cover. Yep. Warriors thirteen plus. Yeah, I think Warriors will win. I think they absolutely spank them. I'll go Warriors twenty plus. Jeez. Oh, holy shit. I yeah. Really crush them. Yeah, Warriors 13 plus. Or well, if, minus the line. Warriors, Warriors are covering. Yeah, Warriors, Warriors are covering. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, same thing. Man, yep. that Warriors right edge against that Titans left edge is worrying. <laughs> yeah, well, I think everyone's just gone Warriors to, to uh, annihilate them. But the, the Titans have shown a bit of heart the yeah, last couple a, of weeks. Yeah, I agree, mate. Oh, I agree. Warriors win, but Titans with the, with the start, plus 12 and a half. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, so George, two dollars fifty-eight, bit of value potentially against the Roosters, a dollar fifty-one. The line is five and a half points for this game at Allianz. This is so hard because, like, what dragons rock up? Yeah. Is it the dragons we saw last week? Yep. Or is it the dragons we saw a few weeks before that? Um, <coughs> Roosters and Roosters to cover. I think Robbo is feeling the pinch. I think he's going to be revving the boys up massively because if they lose this one, then it's like holy shit. Dragons, dragons. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, Roosters win, Dragons cover. Sammy Walker with a field goal to win it for him. An Anzac Day classic. Jeez. <laughs> Could you be a bit Very more specific, specific this week, too? <laughs> uh, yeah, Roosters, Roosters to cover. Uh, I'm going Dragons head to head. I think they knock them off. I like what I see at the moment. Then we've got the uh, Maddie's going down for this game. Uh, the Storm, $1.21. Souths, 445 Another 12 and a half line here. Um, the troll's not back yet, is he? No. The toll is out long term as well. <sighs> Cook's coming back, but what's the line again? Twelve and a half. <laughs> big in, big in cut was he last week? Yeah, had a good week in reserve, great. Uh, did you say twelve and a half? I did. <clears throat> Jesus. Um, storm, storm to cover. Mm-hmm. Storm, storm. Yeah, storm, storm. Nah, Rabbitohs win. This is this is the game to break it. <laughs> And obviously the start. <laughs> Bunnies win the, the Mick Crocker Cup, according to, to Matty. I'm going Storm Storm as well. I think, I think they're going to be too good. One game on Friday, Manly $1.32 uh, when they host the Eels three forty one in the Gutho Cup. Uh, eight and a half points is the line. See, this is a game where I feel like the Eels are just, they could bounce back mm. and just, <laughs> oh. What's the line again? Eight and a half. Mainly do we Eels to cover. Two and a half, Gutho's sweet. Is he... I think he's all good. Yeah, I'll go Manly, power to cover. Manly win, power to cover. Yeah, me too. Manly win, Manly cover for me. Uh, then we've got uh, the Goodman Kemp Cup out of Campbelltown. <laughs> uh, Tigers, $4.60. The Broncos, $1.20. The line, 13 and a half. Broncos, Tigers to cover. What's the start? Thirteen and a half. That's 
a lot of point, isn't it's it? So many fucking points. <laughs> and with the Broncos, you just they could get that. Like they'll probably get out thirteen plus, mm. but then they'll do something silly and let you like. Yeah, um, yeah. Broncos, Tigers to cover. Uh, the Dragons almost thirteen plus to meet Campbelltown last week, didn't they? When you were there. Yeah. Yeah, I go Bronx, Bronx. Yeah, Broncos, Broncos for me. Broncos, Tigers. Actually, fuck. Is all the Broncos <laughs> boys back? <clears throat> Huss is a strong chance. Reynolds is a strong chance. But Reynolds and Huss are both round eight, nine. I reckon surely they give Reynolds another week. They don't need to rush him back. Huss has every chance, but I'll just, he could no, next no, week no. or two. I'll stick with my bet. <clears throat> all right, we've got the Matty Singh Cup. Cowboys, Panthers. Uh, Cowboys, 370. Panthers, dollar twenty nine, nine and a half. Is the line in this one up at uh, North Ooh, Queensland? This is tough. Cowboys yeah. beat them last year at the, up, up north. It was during the origin period, wasn't it? With everyone out? Yeah, but I mean. Oh, Cleary might be back as well. I think Cleary will be back. Oh, okay. <laughs> Panthers. Panthers. Uh, what's the line? Nine and a half. You know what? Just Panthers, Panthers. Yeah. Panthers, Panthers. Panthers, Panthers. Panthers, Panthers. Panthers 13 plus for me. Uh, then we've got the Raystone Cup. Uh, Dolphins, Knights. Dolphins, dollar forty three. Knights, 286. Six and a half the line. Dolphins, Dolphins. Yep. Yeah, Dolphins, Dolphins. I will go Dolphins, Dolphins. Yep. Dolphins 13 plus. Ooh. Yeah, don't mind that. Dolphins 13 plus for me as well. Uh, and then to bring us home, um, the Raiders, $3.21 when they host the Sharkies, $1.35. Lines, eight and a half points in this one. Sharkies, Raiders to cover, though. I think they'll make it just gritty as any. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Sharks, Raiders to cover. Yeah, I'd have gone Raids with Fog, but they just yeah. not to be. Uh, so Sharks, Raiders to cover. Sharks, Raiders for me too. Sharks, Raiders to cover <coughs> for me as well. There you go. Tips brought to you by Sportsbet. And as usual, we'll go and fuck ourselves. Thank you. Imagine what you could be buying instead. For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.